Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, welcome back again, um, this time hopefully for more than a single day. The Senate meets today in accordance with a request made by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Cormann, with the agreement of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, under the order of the Senate of April 8. I notified Senators at the time and date of the meeting on 28 April, and I table the correspondence. On this occasion, there are more senators in attendance than our previous two single-day sittings, so as well as reminding all of minor procedural adjustments, some further changes have been made reflecting social distancing requirements and other health advice. I urge all senators to familiarise themselves with the statement from the Speaker and myself circulated yesterday regarding the operations and facilities of the building. As is obvious from looking around the chamber, seating arrangements have been changed to facilitate the greater numbers of senators attending. Seating plans will change during the course of the week in accordance with requests of the WHIPs. Senators will continue to be able to speak from any seat to ensure distancing requirements are maintained. I ask senators to be flexible about their seating arrangements to facilitate others needing the call. Those senators seated in the non-traditional seats against the walls of the chamber will also be able to speak from either of, from either of the lecterns placed behind the government and opposition WHIPs. If a senator in one of those seats wishes to seek the attention of the chair for the call or to raise a point of order, I ask them to simply rise in their place and seek the attention of the chair who will call them to a microphone to speak. I also ask senators and chairs to allow for a little extra time in calling senators to speak to allow broadcasting to facilitate these flexible arrangements. Again, in lieu of calling a division, senators can request that their votes or the votes of their parties be recorded. If a division is required, senators may be counted if they are standing behind the bank of seats on the relevant side of the chamber, but I ask them to ensure whips have a clear view of those seated in the non-traditional seats as well. Divisions will be counted with the doors unlocked, with the usual rule that senators may not move from the seats they have taken or the place they are standing once tellers are appointed. If the Senate is required to resolve into a committee of the whole, the committee will be chaired from the President's chair. The doors to the set chamber will remain open throughout proceedings. With the concurrence of the Senate, it is so ordered that this is to apply for all sittings of the Senate until otherwise advised. It is so ordered. Thank you. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr. President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call Senator Cormann. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion uh, relating to the days of uh, meeting for the Senate for this week. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. I, I thank the Senate. I move that the Senate meet on Wednesday, 13 May and Thursday, 14 May 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Corbyn, ministerial statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I table a ministerial statement relating to the economy and seek a leave to make a statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Corbyn. I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr. President, Australia finds itself at war against a faceless and flagless enemy. The coronavirus has created a one in a hundred year event, a health and economic shock the likes of which the world has never seen. So many of our fellow Australians, through no fault of their own, are struggling and doing it tough. Be they battling the virus, separated from friends and family, or worried about their job security and economic future. Tragically, 97 Australians have lost their lives, with many more people, including in this parliament, directly affected. 
Our thoughts are with the member for Butman in the other chamber and all the other families across the country who have lost loved ones. Many of the things we take for granted, visiting grandparents, taking the kids to weekend sport or having a beer at the pub, have been disrupted. The Australian way of life has been put on hold. But once again, Australia and its people are showing remarkable resilience and character. Having withstood flood, fire and drought, there's a unity and purpose that should make us all proud. Through strong and decisive action led by the Prime Minister, together with state premiers and chief ministers, Australia has avoided the fight of many other nations. Globally, more than 4 million people have contracted the virus. More than 280,000 have died, and much of the world has gone into lockdown. In the United States, 80,000 have died. In the United Kingdom, over 31,000, with Italy, Spain and France not far behind. In contrast, Australia's mortality rate is one of the lowest in the OECD. Early border restrictions, comprehensive and coordinated action by the National Cabinet and the world-class health system have contributed to this result. The pandemic is not just an enormous health challenge, but an economic one as well. The IMF is forecasting the world economy to contract by 3% this year. In contrast, during the GFC, the global economy shrank by just 0.1% in 2009. China's GDP fell in the March quarter by 9.8%, their first quarterly fall on record. Italy, France and Spain all experienced their largest quarterly falls on record. In the United States, 33 million jobless claims have been made in the last seven weeks, with the unemployment rate rising to 14.7%. In Australia, Treasury is forecasting GDP to fall by over 10% in the June quarter, which would represent our biggest fall on record. At $50 billion, at $50 billion this is a loss equivalent to the total combined quarterly production of South Australia, Tasmania, the Northern Territory and the ICT. Treasury is forecasting the unemployment rate to reach around 10% or 1.4 million unemployed in the June quarter. This five percentage point increase in the unemployment rate is expected to occur over three months compared to the three years it took the unemployment rate to rise by the same amount in that devastating period of the early 1990s. Household consumption and business and dwelling investment are all forecast by Treasury to fall sharply in the June quarter. The combination of social distancing, lower incomes and increased uncertainty are weighing heavily on aggregate demand and flowing through to uh, reduced cash flow. Household consumption is expected to be around 16% lower. Business investment is expected to be around 18% lower, with falls concentrated in the non-mining sector. Dwelling investment is also expected to be around 18% lower. Over the same period, household savings are expected to increase as a result of the restrictions that have been imposed and, on, and an understandably cautious approach by households to discretionary spending. Overall, the economic data has been sobering. In March, business and consumer confidence saw the largest declines on record. The ISX 200 lost more than a third of its value in just over four weeks. In April, Surveys showed that job ads halved and activity in the construction, manufacturing and the services sector had their largest ever monthly falls. New motor vehicle sales fell by 48% through the year, their largest ever fall. House sales fell by 40%. Domestic and international air travel is down by more than 97%, with nearly 40,000 passengers moving through Brisbane Airport on Easter Sunday last year, compared to just 31 passengers this year. Against this backdrop, between the 14th of March and the 18th of April, the number of jobs decreased by 7.5% and the wages bill paid by businesses decreased by 8.2%. During this period, accommodation and food services saw the largest fall in jobs at 33.4%, followed by the arts and recreation sector at 27%. The scale of the economic shock is hitting the budget bottom line. 
The monthly financial statements for March provide the most recent report on the budget position. To the end of March, the underlying cash deficit was $22.4 billion, $9.9 billion higher than forecast in my EFO. Tax receipts were $11.3 billion lower than forecast in my EFO, while payments to the end of March were still $1.4 billion lower than in the my EFO profile. This will change from the next statement onwards as the measures we have implemented continue to ramp up. Since my EFO, the total face value of Australian government securities on, issues, on issue has increased by more than $50 billion, from $560 billion to $618 billion as of 8 May 2020. An updated economic and fiscal outlook will be provided in June, following the release of the March quarter national accounts, with the budget to be delivered in October. In accordance with the requirements of the Charter of Budget Honesty, uh, I'm tabling this ministerial statement to set out the reason for the increase in borrowings. The unprecedented speed and scale of the government's economic response has driven a rapid increase in borrowings. While there will be a significant increase in government debt, which will take many years to repay, our measures have been designed in a way that pro protect the structural integrity of the budget. Australians know there is no money tree. What we borrow today, we must re repay in the future. Temporary and targeted, the new spending measures were not designed to go forever, but to build a bridge to the recovery phase. A standard and pause stated less than four weeks ago, while the government's fiscal measures will weigh heavily on public finances in the immediate future, they won't structurally weaken Australia's fiscal position. With $320 billion, or 16.4 per cent of GDP, in financial support, our focus is getting the country through the, through the crisis and positioning the economy to recover on the other side. This has only been possible because of the position of strength from which we entered the crisis. Growth had risen from 1.8 per cent to 2.2 per cent in the December quarter, and the IMF was forecasting the Australian economy to grow faster than the United States the United Kingdom, Japan, France and Germany in both 2020 and 2021. The unemployment rate fell in February to 5.1 per cent, with the participation rate at near record highs against the backdrop of 1.5 million new jobs being created over the last six years. After inheriting a budget deficit of $48.5 billion, the budget was back in balance for the first time in 11 years. And despite the adverse economic impacts from the global trade tensions, fires, floods and drought, we were on track for the first surplus in 12 years. Our ability to handle this crisis has once again reminded Australians of the importance of a strong and stable financial position, which must always be a primary responsibility of government. The proven path for paying back debt is not through higher taxes, which curtails aspiration and investment, but by growing the economy through productivity-enhancing reforms. Our focus will be on practical solutions to the most significant challenges which will be front and centre in the post-crisis world. Reskilling and upskilling the workforce, maintaining our $100 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline, cutting red tape to reduce the cost burden on businesses and the economy, and tax and industrial relations reform as a means of increasing our competitiveness. The values and principles that have guided coalition reforms in the past must guide us again in the future. Encouraging personal responsibility, maximising personal choice, rewarding effort and risk-taking, whilst ensuring a safety net which is underpinned by a sense of decency and fairness. Unleashing the power of dynamic, innovative and open markets must be central to the recovery, with the private sector leading job creation, not government. We know that a strong economy is the foundation for everything else, and only with a strong economy can you provide the health, education and essential services that Australians rely on. Conscious of the extraordinary health and economic shock created by the coronavirus, the government was determined to act quickly and decisively. We were in a race against time to replenish our personal protective equipment stocks, increase the capacity of our intensive care units, and secure a sufficient number of ventilators to deal with the expected surge in demand. We provided additional funding to our scientists and medical researchers who are participating in a global mission to find a vaccine. 
We entered into an equal cost-sharing arrangement with the states and territories to meet the extra burden on public hospitals. Non-urgent elective surgeries were suspended and we guaranteed the viability of private and not-for-profit hospitals to ensure over 30,000 beds and 105,000 healthcare professionals were available. We allocated more than $850 million to the aged care sector to provide additional support and services at this difficult time. On the economic front, in less than a three-week period, we announced three separate support packages, each complementary and building on the other. Combined, they represent the largest fiscal response in Australia's history. Over $25 billion of support has already flowed to households and businesses in recent weeks, with more than $30 billion to flow in the next month. This is the largest and fastest injection of economic support our country has ever seen. Our economic measures fall into three categories, support for households, support for business and employment, and support for the financial system. For households, our actions are designed to cushion the blow from the income shock and, support consumption and to support consumption across the economy. Given the level of uncertainty, our economic measures provide more than financial relief. They provide a psychological boost as well. There are so many stories from across our nation about how our measures have provided an economic lifeline to people in the hour of need. Like Luke, the owner of a local restaurant and bar in Chapel Hill in Brisbane, who said JobKeeper saved our bacon. And Adrian, owner of an auto business in uh, Moonab, Hobart, who said JobKeeper has turned out to be a saviour. We effectively doubled unemployment benefits with the introduction of a temporary $550 coronavirus supplement for job seekers. We waived the waiting period, adjusted mutual obligation requirements and expanded the partner income test to ensure it reached those in need. With over 1.4 million Australians now receiving the payment, <clears throat> it is providing critical support. We announced two $750 cash payments. The first payment, totaling $5.2 billion, went out from 31 March to more than 7 million income support recipients, including pensioners, carers, veterans, those receiving family tax benefits, and Commonwealth senior, Seniors Health Card holders. We provided tax-free early access to superannuation of up to $10,000 this financial year and up to $10,000 next financial year. To date, 1.29 million early release of super applications have been released by the ITO equating to about $10.6 billion, with an average withdrawal of $8,000. We reduced the pension deeming rights, both the lower and upper levels, to 0.25% and 2.25% at a cost of $876 million. We reduced the superannuation minimum drawdown rights by 50% for 2019, 20 and 2020-21 to give those in retirement more control over their savings. We worked with the banks and the prudential regulator to ensure households could get much-needed temporary relief from loan repayments. With repayments on $200 billion of loans deferred, the majority of which are residential mortgages, the financial pressure on many households has been lowered. An early childhood and education relief package of over $1.6 billion will see over 1 million families receiving free childcare. This has allowed our childcare sector to remain open to support working families and vulnerable children through the pandemic period. The second set of economic measures has been directed at business and employment. The motivation has been to encourage investment, boost cash flow, maintain the connection between employer and employee, and provide a regulatory shield and more workplace flexibility while preserving as much capacity across the economy as we build a bridge to the recovery phase. At $130 billion, the JobKeeper program provides for a fortnightly $1,500 payment to part-time and full-time employees, long-term casuals, sole traders, and those working in the not-for-profit sector. The payment is equivalent to 70% of the median wage and is close to a replacement wage for many working in those sectors most affected, like hospitality and retail. Payments began last week for the period beginning the 30th of March, which was the date the program was announced. There are now more than 835,000 businesses employing more than 5.5 million workers who are formally enrolled in the program. 
This is in addition to temporary cash flow support to help small and medium-sized businesses keep operating, pay their bills and retain staff. Over 450,000 small and medium-sized businesses have now received over $8 billion under our cash flow boost program. Linked to the size of the payroll, this program will provide between $20,000 and $100,000 to SMEs to help them retain staff and meet their fixed costs. This measure uses the existing <clears throat> payroll systems so that no new forms need to be filled in, businesses do not need to apply, and payments are made automatically in the most efficient way possible. We also introduced a separate 50% wage subsidy for 117,000 apprentices, helping to keep the local apprentice, biker and hairdresser in work. In addition to the financial support, we have provided business with amended we amended the bankruptcy and solvency laws to provide temporary protections uh, for distressed businesses during this period. In the first package, we announced two measures to support business investment. An extended instant asset write-off of up to $150,000, which can be used any number of times for any eligible asset, and a 50% accelerated depreciation allowance for businesses up to $500 million in turnover. Other measures, including a $500 million loan facility to support exporters recapturing market share and a $1 billion relief and recovery fund with over $500 million has already been committed. This fund is supporting regional airlines and airports, air freight for essential agriculture, levy relief for Commonwealth fisheries, supporting tourism businesses in Commonwealth national parks, a funding boost for Australia's zoos and aquariums, and support for indigenous and regional arts programs. To assist commercial tenants with rent relief during this difficult period, we worked with the states and territories on a mandatory code of conduct to govern their relationship with landlords. In total, there have been more than 80 regulatory changes that the federal government has made to provide greater flexibility and support to those affected by this crisis. This includes significant temporary industrial relations changes to allow employees and employers to vary work arrangements in order to keep people employed. A great strength of the Australian economy during this crisis has been the resilience of our financial system, which has benefited from many reforms under this government, commencing with the financial systems inquiry, which led to our banks being required to hold more capital so as to be unquestionably strong. Global and domestic markets have experienced significant stress during this period, and the government moved quickly to inject liquidity into the system. The Reserve Bank of Australia and the Australian Office of Financial Management have made $105 billion available to support lending to businesses from both bank and non-bank lenders. Government has also partnered with the banks in a $40 billion SME loan guarantee scheme, which to date has already seen over $1 billion in loans approved to more than 11,000 businesses. Regulatory relief has included the clarification of responsible lending laws to help credit flow faster to SMEs, as well as changes made to facilitate the rapid recapitalization of ISX-listed companies. In recognition of the unprecedented and volatile market environment, the government has also temporarily reduced the FERB assessment thresholds to zero to safeguard the national interest and to ensure confidence in the foreign investment framework is maintained. It has been encouraging that through the combination of our economic measures and flattening the curve, we have seen gradual signs of improvement in sentiment. Consumer confidence has risen for six consecutive weeks, and key sectors like mining, agriculture and manufacturing have continued to be resilient and contributed to a record trade surplus of $10.6 billion in the month of March. Significant product innovation, market diversification strategies and the accelerated uptake of digital transformation opportunities have also been pursued by many businesses in their effort to adapt to the difficult circumstances they are in. This innovation will assist these businesses on the other side. Uh, last week, the Prime Minister summarised the government's five-point plan in response to this crisis. First, we made real progress in fighting the virus, buying time to increase our health capacity. Second, we put in place our economic response to cushion the blow and build a bridge to recovery. Third, we have begun lifting restrictions with a clear plan and framework mapping out the road ahead. Fourth, with restrictions starting to lift, it will be paramount to build confidence and momentum to consolidate these gains. Fifth, 
that will continue to grow the economy, create more jobs, guarantee the essential services Australians rely on and keep Australians safe. Last Friday was a significant point on our pathway back, with National Cabinet agreeing to a three-step framework to achieve a COVID-safe Australia and the lifting of restrictions by July. Treasury estimates that with the restrictions lifted under the three separate stages, 850,000 people will be back at work. More than half of those workers will come from three sectors, with 338,000 jobs in accommodation and food services, 76,000 jobs in arts and recreation, and 71,000 jobs in transport, postal and warehousing. Construction with 45,000 jobs and manufacturing with 20,000 jobs will also be significant contributors. Treasury estimates that as a result of easing the restrictions in line with stages one, two and three, GDP will increase by $9.4 billion each month. The lifting of restrictions will see Australians move around more freely. Of the $9.4 billion, increasing demand, including in retail, will contribute $2.9 billion. The opening of cafes, pubs, clubs, entertainment venues, health and fitness gymnasiums will contribute $2.4 billion. While the opening of schools will contribute nearly $2.2 billion and other industry sectors like local government museums and parks a further $1.2 billion. The relaxation of travel restrictions is expected to contribute around $700 million. The speed at which restrictions are lifted may differ in each state. So too the impact on jobs and GDP from the implementation of each stage. Treasury estimates that the benefits of just stage one being lifted will lead to more than 250,000 people going back to work and more than $3 billion in additional GDP. This includes 83,000 jobs and $1 billion a month in New South Wales, 64,000 jobs and over $715 million in Victoria, 51,000 jobs and $610 million in Queensland, 25,000 jobs and $435 million in Western Australia, 17,000 jobs and $178 million in South Australia, 5,000 jobs and $50 million in Tasmania, 4,000 jobs and $60 million in the ICT, and 3,000 jobs and $40 million in the Northern Territory. However, these improvements in the economy depend on us continuing to follow the health advice. Filing to do so could see restrictions reimposed at a loss of $4 billion per week to the economy. If our largest state, New South Wales, had to reimpose restrictions equivalent to those in place before, 8 May, before the 8 May National Cabinet meeting, it would cost its economy around $1.4 billion per week. For Victoria, the cost would be around $1 billion. In Queensland, $800 million. In Western Australia, $500 million. In South Australia, $200 million. In Tasmania, $100 million. In the ICT, $100 million. And in the Northern Territory, $40 million per week. This is the economic cost we will all bear if we fail to act. Uh, before concluding, um, I want to thank uh, my colleagues, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, my good friend and colleague, the Treasurer, and the Health Minister for their leadership throughout this period, and also the many agencies of government who have worked so tirelessly behind the scenes. Australians know that as a consequence of the actions we have taken, we are better placed than most, but there is still a long way to go. There will be more coronavirus cases, and it is vital we remain vigilant. The economic benefits from lifting the restrictions will only be realised if Australians continue to follow the health advice and download the COVID Safe app. On the economic front, we have put in place a comprehensive range of measures designed to keep people in jobs and to build a bridge to recovery. Our measures are working, protecting lives and livelihoods. We can be confident about our future. This virus will not defeat us. We must stay strong. We must stay together. We must maintain our resolve. The fighting Australian spirit will see us come through stronger than ever. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to respond to the Finance Minister's leave ministerial granted. statement on the economy. Thank you. We sit today, the second Tuesday in May, a day in a pre-COVID world, which would be budget day, but it seems nothing is as it was anymore. 
Labor recognises that, first and foremost, COVID-19 is a health crisis, a worldwide pandemic which has caused the death of more than 280,000 people, including 97 here in Australia. This health crisis has resulted in the imposition of significant social restrictions on our community, which have, in turn, had massive economic implications. For hundreds of thousands of Australian workers, that has meant losing their jobs. For others, it's less work available. For others, home has morphed into office and schoolroom. For our essential workers, work has never been busier or more dangerous. And yet, despite this enormous upheaval, Australians have done what was asked of them by cooperating with the advice that social distancing would save lives, that staying home was the best way to keep everyone safe, particularly those who may be more vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19 virus. As a community, we stood together, albeit socially isolated, and flattened the infection curve. In the space of just a few months, and despite the restrictions put in place, thousands of Australians were infected, hundreds of people became critically ill, and tragically, 97 people have died. But as a country, we have fortunately avoided the heartbreaking scenes of other countries, such as the United Kingdom, the USA, and parts of Europe. From the very beginning of this crisis, Labor has taken a constructive and supportive approach to the health and economic responses to COVID-19. This includes the positions we've taken in this chamber and in the other place during the two urgent sittings of parliament. To facilitate and expedite the extra support needed by the Australian community and the economy during this time. We've not played politics. When we have disagreed with elements of the government's response, we have raised our concerns in a constructive manner. Where we think the response could have been improved, we made suggestions. Where we think improvements could have been made, we suggested changes, some of which the government ultimately took up, including our call for a wage subsidy, better income testing for families, support for students and telehealth measures, just a few. When the Prime Minister and his ministers spoke of an economic snapback, we were surprised at the approach, considering the severity of the economic shock playing out in front of our eyes. But when the final vote came on the COVID-19 related legislation, we voted in the national interest for the millions of families, millions of people, workers, vulnerable Australians, businesses large and small who needed us to make that call. But our job as the opposition also requires us to hold this government to account. The statement just given by the finance minister outlines just a fraction of the information that we would have expected to have been delivered today had it been budget day. And most of this information isn't new. Nonetheless, the numbers paint a confronting picture and really uh, paint the importance of getting the recovery right. In the June quarter, household consumption down 16 per cent, business investment concentrated in the non-mining sector down 18 per cent, dwelling investment down 18 per cent, new motor vehicle sales down 48 per cent, this year, the largest fall ever, house sales down 40 per cent, air travel down 97 per cent. And whilst today's statement is welcome, it doesn't replace the need for a full set of numbers to be released as soon as possible. It's not enough to drop a few select numbers out, as this government has been doing. Unemployment to rise to 10 per cent, we're told, but it could have been 15 if it wasn't for JobKeeper, we're told. But there's no Treasury modelling to back this in. Last weekend, the government dropped to the paper the costs of the economy not reopening. Again, apparently Treasury figures, but no detail released. It's essential that Treasury's detailed forecasts are made available for scrutiny. If the IMF, the RBA, private economists can undertake and publish detailed forecasts, with appropriate caveats in place, there is no reason why the Treasury isn't in a position to do so also. Now more than ever, Australians deserve to be given up-to-date information to understand what is happening in the economy in real time, what is happening in the labour market and whether the economic response packages are doing what they were intended to do. After all, it's the Australian taxpayers who are funding these massive economic response packages and it's the Australian taxpayers who are going to have to pay off the substantial debt bill that follows. Whilst Labor accepts that the impact on the economy from COVID-19 is severe, it's also important to acknowledge that the last set of economic figures we got from the government in mid-December last year through the MyEFO already pointed to significant weaknesses across the economy. 
Seven years in, three treasurers down, and the government's complacent approach to managing the economy was there for all to see. Economic growth was below trend, un underemployment was rising, business investment had fallen to its lowest level since the 1990s, wages were stagnant, productivity was in decline, and government debt had more than doubled on this government's watch. Australian households were already struggling to make ends meet with declining household incomes, making it more difficult to get by week to week. Monetary policy had been doing the heavy lifting for some time as the government, wearing its ideological blinkers, had refused to respond to the weaknesses with any serious fiscal or policy response. And despite the government's spin, the, economic, the economy entered the COVID-19 crisis in a weaker shape than needed to be the case. And we saw this as the COVID-19 virus started to wreak havoc across the world from December last year. It wasn't until mid-February, mid some six weeks after the alarm bells went off around a global pandemic with serious health and economic consequences, that the government finally accepted the need for economic stimulus. Treasury told the COVID-19 Select Committee that work on the first package started at the beginning of March. When the first package was announced, Labor was positive, despite our concern that it was unlikely these measures would be big enough or implemented quickly enough to prevent job losses, business failures or a more serious downturn. We said at the time that the government must be prepared to take additional steps if it became clear the response was insufficient. In just 10 days, that insufficiency test Labor had warned about was met, with the government announcing the second package, more than tripling the value of the first. And just eight days after that, following massive job losses in that middle week in March, the government finally tapped the mat on a wage subsidy and announced the JobKeeper payment. Three economic packages announced in the space of three weeks, the 12th, the 22nd and the 30th of March, does beg the question on whether Treasury would have designed the package differently with the knowledge of where they ended up by the end of March. Treasury officials have described the cash flow boost as a wage subsidy scheme. Why then design two different wage subsidy schemes, particularly one which doesn't require employers to keep staff on, and announce them just a week apart? Did the government act fast enough, go big enough and with enough urgency from the beginning to stabilise the economy and keep as many people in jobs as possible? From the outset of this crisis, we have raised concerns about urgency and about get, getting money out the door fast. The government haven't really been able to explain why it's taking almost two months from the restrictions being put in place for some of these job-saving payments to get out the door and into businesses. Seven weeks since the shutdown started, why is it that private savings of Australian, some $10 billion of people's superannuation savings, is the single, single biggest injection of funds into the economy? And yet, even that program, implemented with a no strings attached, without a verification process, had to be suspended last Friday with a police investigation underway into allegations of fraud for at least 150 account holders that the government was warned about. And there are other issues about the design, timing and implementation of the economic response. Why did the government announce a program that incentivised sacking people on the 22nd of March? only to announce a program that targeted keeping people in jobs on the 30th of March, just eight days later. The, um, if JobKeeper had begun earlier, covered more workers and been announced prior to the boost to JobSeeker, would that have saved more jobs? Would it have prevented the confronting scenes of Australians lining up outside Centrelink, thousands of Australians who overnight had their lives turned upside down? And why did the government value some workers over the others when they designed JobKeeper? Why are some workers on JobKeeper getting a windfall gain, sometimes up to three times what they would normally earn, and yet others, by fluke of service time, miss out entirely on having their job saved and their income protected? Mm -hmm. We know that 1.1 million casuals have missed out on JobKeeper because the government refuses to provide support to casuals employed for less than 12 months forcing them onto the job seeker payment instead. There's the 5,500 workers who work for Donata that have been excluded from JobKeeper. Australian workers working in Australia, Australian jobs, families to feed and jobs they want to get back to, excluded. Hundreds of workers at hotel chains under a similar exclusion being notified they're now not eligible after originally being accepted by the ATO for the JobKeeper payment. 
What about the pub staff in Cairns who can't work but because their workplace is linked to a bottle shop, which has continued to operate, they don't qualify for JobKeeper either? Last week, the ABS data showed that in five weeks to the 18th of April, total jobs decreased by 7.5 per cent, with one third of accommodation and food services jobs and one quarter of all arts and recreation services jobs being lost. And yet it's these industries, hardest hit by COVID-19 restrictions, that are the, large one, the ones with large short-term casual workforces who are missing out on the support from JobKeeper. Hospitality, arts, entertainment, tourism, construction, all industries which rely on short-term casuals to keep their sectors ticking over. Last week, the government was claiming the undersubscribed JobKeeper program as some sort of success. But we know from the letters to our office, eligibility criteria, communication issues, rule changes are making this program confusing and at times hard to access. The government tells us that Treasury has forecast an unemployment rate of 10 per cent, even with JobKeeper in place. 10 per cent unemployment, a doubling of the unemployment rate from pre-COVID times. This apparent acceptance of 700,000 additional unemployed people as the price of restrictions by the government is deeply concerning. Did Treasury advise the government on what would be required to bring that rate down and protect more jobs? Looking forward, there are big decisions to be made, choices that will become before this government. After seven years without an economic plan, it's probably time to get one in place. A plan for jobs. We're going to need more than a hope to get the hundreds of thousands of extra people off the unemployment lines. A massive effort also needs to be paid to the issue of underemployment, particularly for the new generation of workers, the young people who have just entered the labour market who, or who were about to, and who will bear a disproportionate impact of economic slowdown for years to come. The government talks of hibernation, of snapback, of getting out from under the doona. Rather than glib marketing slogans, Labor looks to a future where we don't aspire to snap back or go back to an economy that clearly only worked for some of us. We don't support a snap back to insecure work. We don't support a snap back to poverty and living on $40 a day. And we don't want a snap back for families who are just scraping by week to week. As our leader, Mr Albanese, said yesterday, we are not just an economy, we are a society. We need an economy that works for people, not the other way around, and we need to recover stronger together. We don't believe that a snapback to higher unemployment, insecure work and to poverty for those who are unemployed is what we should settle for. Mr President, there will clearly be significant and severe impacts on the Commonwealth budget from responding to COVID-19. As I have said today, Labor has supported the fiscal response to date, even though we would have designed and implemented some of the measures differently had we been in government. Perhaps now more than ever, Australians can see that the budget is more than just a set of numbers which gets trotted out a few times a year and where a surplus is considered good and a deficit bad. This is the simplistic lens that the government likes to have the budget viewed through. But as demonstrated by this government in their response to COVID-19 and as Labor did when responding to the GFC, despite attacks from the then opposition at the time, the budget is an important stabiliser for when a crisis hits the economy. Labor believes that a responsible fiscal strategy which ensures a strong and stable budget position is essential for any government. But a budget can and should also be used to quickly inject investment into the economy in times of economic shock or when private investment is withdrawn. It's to help support people, to support jobs, to support business. As we've seen so clearly from witnessing the queues outside Centrelink in that third week of March or from the letters and emails received into our offices about lives lost, jobs lost and businesses wound up over the past two months. The budget doesn't just exist for its own intangible purpose. It exists for all of us, for the society we create and for the society we want to be. Now, the government has had to borrow extra money to help pay for the economic response and to keep the wheels of government turning. The Treasurer has said previously that this de debt burden would be shouldered by generations to come. After more than doubling the debt over the past seven years, that debt burden existed well before the COVID-19 virus hit the budget. 
We will wait for the delivery of the economic statement next month to see exactly how the government will approach the plan to deal with this debt and with the large deficits that will be a feature of the budget for some time. The government will have to make choices about how they approach the recovery task. We already see the ideologues on the back bench pushing the PM's snapback agenda, already briefing out about how JobKeeper needs to be wound back, even before some of the business have even got their first instalment. Well, let's talk about getting ahead of the curve. No doubt the October budget will give us a glimpse of these choices, including whether the government's natural predisposition to snap back to classic conservative with cuts to essential services or the harsh measures included in the infamous 2014 budget and attempted many times since. Labor wants the government to put aside their internals and make recovery decisions in the national interest. That means everyone's interest, not just the interests of a select few. Labor urges the government to think carefully about the choices ahead and where, about when and how they withdraw support from the economy. Consult widely across the country, in the regions, in the cities, across industries and sectors. Look at the needs of different demographics, young people, women, people on income support, and approach these decisions with compassion and with an eye on the long term rather than an electoral term. Over the past two months, there has been a noticeable appreciation of the value of public services and public institutions. Obviously, our universal public health system, with Medicare at its core, has been at the centre of that appreciation, but it is broader than that. Across the country, public servants are on the front line, right from the beginning, with officials being sent into Wuhan to assist Australian citizens in the Chinese epicentre back in January to return to Australia to those delivering the health response, to the delivering the support measures in Services Australia and the ATO, to protecting the borders, the first responders, the scientists, the researchers working on a cure at the CSIRO. I'm sure the irony of the government's injection of $230 million to allow CSIRO to continue to undertake important research and upgrade the CSIRO's facility in, in Geelong isn't lost on those CSIRO workers who've been campaigning against these government's cuts to exactly the same organisation. The redeployment of nearly 6,000 public servants shows the flexibility of the APS and the commitment of public servants to our country at its finest. And the, people, and the Australian people's success at flattening the health curve has been supported every step of the way by Australian public servants across every jurisdiction. Mr President, the challenges that come from COVID-19 are real, and they will be with us for some time. Getting the economic recovery as good as it can be has to have the urgent focus of this government while the health experts continue to lead the health response. Earlier this month, the Prime Minister said that success will be measured by reducing unemployment, getting businesses open and getting Australians back to work. Labor would say to the government, yes, you need to do all that, but you must do much more. You need a plan for jobs. You need to deal with underemployment, with insecure work, with the dire poverty of people relying on social security, with the needs of young workers, of women workers. You need to get the private sector investing again. You need to get wages moving. You need to get household incomes increasing. And you need to be much more than a marketing operation. You are responsible to make sure that the economy that emerges from this pandemic is one that works for all of us, not just some of us. And the immediate future of millions of Australians rely heavily on you as the government of the day getting these decisions right. Thank you. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I seek leave to respond to the statement by the Minister for Finance. Leave is granted. Thank you, President. I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens and I thank the Minister for Finance for the economic update on what would have been Budget Day were we not all in this global health crisis. The spread of the global COVID-19 pandemic has turned our lives upside down and has driven us into an economic crisis. Thankfully, our governments have largely listened to the scientists and medical experts, and so far we've avoided a health disaster like that in the US, the UK and many other countries, with the support of the absolute heroes on the front line of our health system. But our economy has been shattered, and for many people, things haven't been easy for a long time. The inequality crisis, fuelled by the neoliberal policies of, sadly, both the Liberal and Labor parties, has been supercharged by the current health and economic disaster. And while we're rightly focused on responding to the COVID-19 crisis, the climate crisis that drove the devastating bushfires earlier in the year has not gone away. What we do next 
matters. Right now, we have a chance to map our, our way out of the jobs and economic crisis and to set up a fairer and more sustainable future. We're facing the worst youth unemployment in history. Unless we put a recovery plan in place now that addresses the challenges faced by young people specifically, the effects will linger for a decade and impact young people for a lifetime. Right up until the very moment that the coronavirus pandemic hit, the government had convinced many people that any increase in funding for public services was impossible or unaffordable or only the market could deliver. But now everything has changed. Governments around the world have taken drastic and very necessary action to respond to the COVID-19 threat by focusing on saving lives and bolstering our public health systems, but also unlocking funding and directing money to where it matters services for the public, directly to households and people. The big corporations and government are desperate to go back to business as usual, with more cuts and attacks on public services, which will just leave us more exposed to the next looming crisis and place an even bigger burden on next generations. But we can't cut our way out of this crisis. We have to invest for the future. Instead of going back to normal, we can build a better normal, we can tackle this economic crisis as well as the jobs, inequality and climate crises so that everyone can live a good life. If we can remake our society to protect us from a virus, then we can remake it to look after people and our environment and our climate. A plan to do this isn't just possible, it is necessary. Before the COVID crisis, we were staring down the interrelated threats of a climate and environment breakdown, supercharged economic inequality and chronic job insecurity. These crises were being left unaddressed by a government that prioritised tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy instead of investing in its people and the community. What this pandemic and the response to the economic crisis has shown is that the government is able to respond to any big problems that we face, so long as they choose to put people before the private profit of their donors, and so long as they listen to the scientists and experts and we mobilise the resources of society for the common good. Australia's COVID recovery plan must renew the economy by putting the community ahead of those big corporations. The Greens would like to see us retain the rate. The rate of job seekers simply cannot go back to below the poverty line of $40 a day. We need to raise the rate for good and leave no one behind. The Greens want to see a special package for the arts to keep these creative industries which sustain us alive. And we want to see massive government investment in social housing, in health, in education, in manufacturing and renewable infrastructure, the building blocks of a fair, clean economy. Of course, we want to see early childhood education also remain free as an essential service that begins a child's education and enables workforce participation for parents. We need to borrow to invest to recover. Together we can lay the foundations of a better future for all of us by fighting for a clearer, cleaner, fairer future through a Green New Deal. Together we can build a better normal and a future for all of us. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. I also seek leave to respond to the statement by the Leader of the Government in the Senate. As leader of the Nationals in this place, uh, we'd like to associate ourselves uh, with the comments of Minister Cormann and the great work that the federal government has been doing in to actually stand out worldwide um, in our response to COVID. And I also wanted to briefly uh, remark on rural and regional Australia's commitment to pushing back against the pandemic and getting the national economy back on track. We're proud of our government and the nation, how we've pulled together and literally stunned the world in our response through our joint efforts at a state and national level. Rural and regional Australians are ready to lead our national economic recovery. <coughs> and as we all know, life has been tough out in the regions for many seasons now, droughts, fires, floods and now a medical crisis. And these challenges might have shaken us, but regional Australia is standing Strong. We'll be open for business as soon as health circumstances and premiers allow. 
Mr President, as you are aware, the Nationals are working with our rural and regional communities to do everything we can to not only help those affected get through, but to get back to normal as quickly as possible. We have worked hard to ensure supply chains were kept open and, in doing so, keep our country's supermarket shelves stocked with fresh fruit, vegetables and meat. We have made sure our truckies remained on the road, moving produce from its source to manufacturer to consumer. We have backed our mining sector to sustain our national economy uh, in now and into the future. We are safeguarding our air freight capacity, working hard with industry to re-establish supply chains. And the Nationals in government are focused on ensuring our regional air services are better equipped to support the return of visitors, business opportunities and freight movement. The remote airstrip upgrade program will improve aerodromes in remote areas. It will upgrade the safety and accessibility of aerodromes in right areas to improve the delivery of essential goods and services. It will make sure they are accessible in all conditions. Over this period, we have also invested in agricultural shows right across the country. I think one of the um, aspects of COVID isolation life has been missing opportunities for communities to come together and to celebrate what they do well. We want to make sure regional shows say, stay relevant and vibrant. And just last week, I had the opportunity to head up and thank volunteers in Koryong uh, in the northeast, in the Upper Murray, uh, who had been struggling with bushfires through January and then COVID-19 shutting down any hope of a quick recovery post bushfires. Uh, this is the home of the Manfa Snowy River, uh, and for them to have to cancel that event uh, has had a significant dampener on that community. But they were absolutely um, stoked that the federal government had not forgotten them, and I'm confident once this pandemic passes that the Koryong community again will stage great events and shows uh, and will welcome people from capital cities to celebrate rural and regional life in our communities. Our farmers have not clocked off because of COVID-19. They have tended stock, ensured crops are planted and harvested, and supplies are accessible. Our 85,000 agricultural businesses are ready to go because they haven't stopped, whilst uh, other aspects of the economies have. The Nationals represent workers and families on rural and remote properties, and we played a crucial role in securing visa changes and flexibility to remove the uncertainty around worker availability for our growers during this health and economic crisis. But that is work that will continue through the recovery phase. We made, remain committed to growing our agricultural sector, and it's be, because it's hard uh, to reach that $100 billion set by industry by 2030, despite the challenges. Um, we've seen ag fall down to $58.9 billion in 17-18, but it's more important than ever as Australia emerges from hibernation. If we want to see a strong and prosperous Australia post-COVID-19, then we need a vibrant, dynamic and prosperous agriculture sector as well. Uh, our produce is there, way more than we need, and as the world awakens, they too will need fresh food, fibre. Regional Australia stands ready to deliver. Our barley growers, for example, uh, producers operate in a competitive global market and price their products in an entirely commercial way. And I'm sure beer drinkers around the world can attest to how uh, the malting quality of Australian uh, barley. We also stand ready to uh, supply the world's markets. And on July the 5th, we see uh, the Indonesian Free Trade Agreement come into effect. That will mean more export opportunities and significant benefits for Australian farmers as well as businesses and investors. As the Minister for Trade has said, it's the most comprehensive bilateral trade agreement Indonesia has ever uh, seen. And it will give competitive edge to Australian exporters, particularly at a time when many of them are doing it tough as a result of the fallout uh, from the COVID-19 crisis across the globe. And Indonesia presents significant opportunity. But the drought is still with us and many of our communities are still struggling with the reconstruction post bushfires. And we, as a political party, stand with them. We've got the Drought Resilience Funding Plan to build uh, resilience and preparedness and also find ways to boost farm production and profits. We're getting on with building dams, creating regional jobs, more water capacity and security. And our communities do face a major um, rebuild following the summer bushfires. And in my home state of Victoria, the economic impact 
of agriculture, tourism and forestry industries of the bushfires was $237 million, and this is repeated across other states. That's why our government has provided $448 million for regional bushfire and recovery development program to deliver extra funding and expertise to revive local economies. And when restrictions on movement and travel are eased under our government's three-step plan, these communities will welcome back with open arm visitors. Treasury estimates that with the restrictions lifted under the three separate stages, 850,000 Australians will be back at work. The lifting of restrictions will see Australians move around more freely. Uh, of the $9.4 billion increasing demand, including in retail, will contribute $2.9 billion. So I urge my city-based senators, we all do in the National Party, to encourage your constituents to visit the regions when those restrictions are lifted. Spend a dollar or two, eat, stay, do your bit to get Australia's economy back on track. We're entering a new era of economic potential. We're uh, Australians are embracing domestic manufacturing opportunities. And another thing that I know my Senate colleague, uh, Senator Canavan, is incredibly passionate about seeing developed. The Nationals are backing small and medium-sized Australian businesses to tap into new markets around the world, supporting 10 export hubs across the nation, many of them out in the regions. Over 450,000 small and medium-sized businesses have now received over $8 billion under our cash flow boost program. Linked to the size of the payroll, this program will provide between $20,000 and $100,000 to small and medium enterprises to help them retain key staff and meet their fixed costs. We also introduced a separate 50 cent wage subsidy for 117,000 apprentices uh, to see young people with a career path, helping the local uh, apprentice baker hairdresser in work. The focus is on industries where Australia has large growth potential and we're incredibly excited about the potential for manufacturing in mining and obviously in food, fibre and agribusiness. Uh, our resources sector is ready to lead our economic recovery. Uh, this sector drives our local economies, employing over 255,000 Australians and accounting for 8 per cent of our GDP. And even now, during this one in 100 year pandemic, the sector is powering Australia forward, with resources and energy exports increasing by 2 per cent to $68.9 billion during this 2020 March quarter. Our world-leading iron ore exporters are surging ahead and are forecast to export over $101 billion worth of iron ore to our trading partners in Asia. That is great news for the regions and it is great news for our national economy and great news for local jobs. Latest export figures have confirmed the resilience of some of Australia's key resource exports as the COVID-19 pandemic grips the world. It increased nearly 34 per cent in the March uh, compared with the previous month. And this year, our resource uh, energy export are uh, set to hit $300 billion for the first time, and that is up 40 per cent from five years ago. So it really shows what you can do when you have a federal government focused on growing and promoting uh, the mining and resource and energy sector and what a ballast that is to our economy through these very, very difficult times. The next three months will bring some challenges, but it's clear that resources and energy exports will be a key driver of our recovery. And I want to thank the industry and its workers who have kept the sector operating during this crisis and look forward to working with them uh, as part of the Nationals team as we emerge from this global pa pandemic. And I know many of the workers um, have had to make tough decisions for their families to not return uh, home in often times indefinitely, not knowing when they'll actually be able to um, leave uh, their mining employment and head home during their breaks due to state boundary closes. So thank you for their efforts there. Um, rural and regional Australians have answered the call during the COVID-19 pandemic by embracing social distancing, doing things differently. Uh, we hope that our lifestyle um, and density proves popular uh, for those who live in capital cities to come and join us out in the regions where you, your neighbours aren't so close uh, and you have a great lifestyle and a great local job as well. And that is a vision that we as a National Party want to pursue in government. Rural and regional Australians are ready, willing and able to lead our economic recovery. 
thank their diligence, the recovery will need to focus on building Australia's sovereign capacity. If this has taught us anything, it's taught us that we need to be able to do things here in Australia and not rely on sometimes weak, volatile uh, global supply chains. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, through this recovery phase a vibrant advanced manufacturing sector um, really value adding to our ag food and fibre industry and our mining industry, building regional jobs uh, for our local communities. Thank you. Senator Griff. You missed, uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to respond to the statement made by the Minister of Finance. Leave is granted. Well, we've all come a long way since we first spoke of the coronavirus in this place. To a certain extent, we have so far dodged the proverbial bullet. While there is much sadness for those who have died, it is a relief that the potential for wide-scale deaths has severely diminished. We recognise that many people are suffering hardship and distress, and we won't know the full extent of this until restrictions are fully lifted. But in the main, Australia has done exceptionally well due to the vigilant actions of our governments and the collective will of our people. The federal government and state governments haven't always been in sync over what needs to be done, and that has caused much public and business confusion. But the National Cabinet has overall worked together constructively on the common goal of protecting the health and well-being of Australians. Australia is very much now in a better place to contend with the future pandemics that most certainly will arrive in the future. There has never been such a grounding of the economy, business and personal liberties as we've seen over recent months. Everything we have done was necessary at various points in time, and some restrictions will no doubt continue longer than others. But how do we return to the new normal? How do businesses that rely on close social contact, restaurants, cafes, pubs, retailers and the like, survive when they are encouraged to open but have to operate with restrictions? How many businesses that were struggling before COVID-19 and have only just hung on because of government payments and job seeker will rapidly fall by the wayside when these payments stop. How many people will lose their jobs when their employer can no longer rely on government effectively subsidising their payroll? How many people are afraid of going back into the workplace after many weeks of isolation? How long will it take to lift levels of consumer and business optimism, which are the main drivers of the economy? All of us here need to play a part in leading our country out of the slump and into a prosperous new normal. We must all be united in the desire to ensure Australia remains economically strong and socially cohesive. This means all of us need to work together, all of us in this place to put aside our partisan blinkers and use this rebuilding opportunity to decide how we reshape our nation. Now, I recognise this task is formidable. Hundreds of thousands of Australians have become unemployed. GDP is likely to fall for the first time in 30 years. We are staring down $120 billion of deficits this year and next year and debt has passed $600 billion. The government's strategy for budget recovery is to go for productivity and economic growth. All options are on the table, but we can reliably assume its strategy will be to drive business investment, which would drive a rapid economic expansion, lift GDP, reduce unemployment and increase tax revenue, enabling us to pay down the debt. I see the appeal in this strategy very much uh, for government and the community, but we need to learn from the past. Since World War II, there have been two occasions when debt has surged to new heights. In both cases, the Hawke and Howard governments acted to return the budget to a more sustainable position by cutting spending and hiking up taxes. We don't yet know if the Morrison government plans to cut spending. If they do, they must be upfront about where these cuts will fall and what the effects will be. 
The government has also said that they do not plan to increase taxes as part of the recovery. Whatever it does to repair the budget, the government must always remember its heart. It is on notice that repair cannot come at the expense of those who can least afford it. Repair must be sustainable and affordable and must also very much be fair. We expect it will not squeeze those who are already struggling or cut spending from health and education in order to mortar the huge holes that the pandemic has left in the nation's accounts. The government needs to level with us about what this recovery is going to take and how we're going to get there. We recognise that the federal government may need to reconsider the company and income tax cuts that were passed in better times and which are still to flow through. When we agreed to pass these tax cuts in the last parliament, we did so on the understanding that they were on a sustainable and affordable footing and that the government would revisit them if necessary. Tax cuts might support growth but it would be irresponsible to keep them if the government cannot do so without cutting spending in areas of need. We expect that the government will provide us all with a lot more information about the state of the budget in the coming weeks and how it intends to get us back in the black. There is much to be done by all of us and I know we will all look after the best interests of the country. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to uh, respond to Senator Cormann's statement. Leave is granted. Thank you. A one in a hundred year event, also referred to as a black swan event, an economic and financial metaphor for an exogenous shock to our economy, a shock that's difficult to predict, a shock that's dangerous and a shock that has extreme consequences. Two words, black swan, guaranteed to strike fear in the heart of any capitalist. So let me explain, senators, why that is the case. Our capitalist system, which I'll just refer to as capital, doesn't like risk. Anyone from a first year a uh, student of finance and economics understands that capital doesn't like risk. If capital takes on risk, it does so because it expects a high return. The risk return trade-off is also well understood by students of economics and finance. And that's why in times of extreme risk during black swan events, the only institution that can carry the day is the government. That's why the government has stepped in to provide living wages for workers through the JobKeeper. That's why government has injected money into the system through a whole range of different measures that we've heard Senator Cormann outline today. That's why it's government's job to provide confidence the psychological underpinnings to get our communities and economies back on track at times of extreme risk. Because governments don't expect a high return. They expect a different kind of return, a social return to their citizens. A government's number one job is to protect its citizens. And the idea that somehow the economy is going to snap back in coming months, that somehow this risk of this pandemic is going to disappear is ludicrous. Now, it may be debatable as to whether a global pandemic is indeed a black swan event, but I can tell you, we've been talking about pandemics for some time. I asked questions of Treasury and the Future Fund in just February around what risk assessments they were doing for exactly the kind of scenario we're in now. And you can go back and have a look at Hansard, but there's no way in the world that they were predicting we were going to be in this situation we're in now. We are in uncharted territory, a one in a hundred year event. But we also are confronting 
another great crisis in our time, a crisis of, of climate change. We just lived through a couple of the worst months in our country's history this summer, with loss of property and life and damage to our community, our economy, to our environment. And we're going to see a lot more of that. While we've been bunkered down in self-isolation, we've got the very sad data out from our scientists about the third mass coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef in five years. The sad decline of one of the world's greatest living organisms at the same time. So I would argue that while this is unparalleled in many ways, and there are so many risks we need to confront as a parliament, as a nation, as a global community, while there are so many risks we need to confront, it is also a significant opportunity, a significant opportunity to reform and rebuild and tackle not just the COVID crisis, getting confidence back into our economy and looking after the health needs of our citizens, but at the same time we inject that confidence back into the system, we can tackle the twin crisis of climate change by investing in renewable energy and a blueprint for a different future, a future that saves the planet and looks after people at the same time. Exactly what the Greens raised in 2009 when we were the first in the world to talk about a Green New Deal, which of course has been heavily debated in the US and in US political circles and will be so in this country as well. A Green New Deal, a way forward to create jobs, invest in the industries of the future and invest in solving the environmental crisis, the climate crisis, the catastrophe that's unfolding right around the planet. And that is going to require a strong role for government in our lives. And I would argue, Senators, if you look at other periods in our history where we faced great crises, that governments and government spending is the only thing that's going to get us out of this quagmire. I've heard in this place, especially in the last parliamentary sitting, many speeches talking about post-World War II, about the Curtin and the Chifley years, about the recovery, a decade of economic reform, a decade of reshaping of Australian society and community and economy. Well, back then, our net debt to GDP exceeded 120 per cent. And a decade of growth paid that back. A decade of growth paid back that debt. At the moment, Australia is sitting on a net debt to GDP of less than 30 per cent, if you include all states. Likely to go over 30 per cent, including all states and federal spending compared to a global average of advanced nations of 90 per cent, three times what Australia's net debt position is. Debt is not a dirty word. At times of record low interest rates, where the price of money is close to zero, we have an unprecedented economic opportunity to spend and invest in our community. Now, the Treasurer has said there is no money tree. Yes, there is. Our economy is a money tree. And if you water it, it will grow. If you water it, it will grow. Invest in people, invest in infrastructure, invest in communities, invest in clean energy, in transitioning our economies to a better future. The best thing we can do when we leave Parliament this week is give the Australian people hope. Hope that we've got their back, that we can take everyone with us and that we all have a plan for the future. What is this government's plan? I ask you to consider that before I finish my contribution today. Somehow they think things are going to snap back in a, after a one in hundred year event when we face so many other risks to our economy. Well, it's not going to happen. It's up to us as government to put in place a proper plan that looks after people and looks after the planet. And the Greens have that plan. 
and we'll be releasing our Green New Deal soon, and Australians will understand it and they will get it. Because it does provide for a future and it provides for a strong role of government in our lives. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to seek leave to take note of the minister's statement? If not, we will move to government business. I'll call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures, Bill 2019, and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Van, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, the cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures bill 2019 <clears throat> and the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage regulatory levies amendment miscellaneous measures bill 2019. These bills amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Act of 2003 and the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act of 2006 to clarify the regions that the acts apply to and the relate, related levies. These bills also strengthen and clarify the powers of the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and, and Environmental Management Authority inspectors during oil pollution emergencies that originate in our waters. These changes are important for the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority or NOPSEMA, as Australia's regulator for health and safety, well integrity and environmental management for offshore oil and gas activities. It is vital that there is clarity around the authority's responsibilities and jurisdiction. As my Senate colleagues in the Economics Legislation Committee reported, the current powers of the authority are not sufficient to ensure compliance by a title holder with its environmental management obligations in the event of an oil pollution emergency in the Commonwealth. In particular, the authority currently does not have power to inspect for or enforce compliance by the title holder in areas of state or territory jurisdiction, such as in coastal waters or onshore. To be burdened with the bureaucratic need to obtain a warrant or consent from another jurisdiction can significantly impede compliance monitoring in emergency situations. In an oil pollution emergency, the authorities' inspectors will need regulatory intelligence in real time under dynamic situations including monitoring and enforcing compliance across a number of locations within and outside offshore areas. The bill will amend the Act to enable the authorities inspectors to enter premises used for implementation of oil spill response obligations without a warrant, whether located in Commonwealth or state or territory jurisdictions, in the event of such an emergency. The amendment will enable the authority to monitor whether a title holder is in compliance with its oil spill response obligations and take enforcement action if the title holder is failing to meet its obligations. The bill will also amend the Act to extend the operation of polluter pays obligations and the application of significant incident directions. This may be given by the authority to areas of state and territory jurisdiction. Mr Acting Deputy President, there is another purpose for this bill, and it is to enable the Carbon Net project and the Hydrogen Energy Supply Chain project to proceed. These projects are of great interest to me and are also the conduit of many more jobs in my home state of Victoria. Our abundant natural resources mean we could become one of the first countries to create a hydrogen export industry, helping to generate a significant number of Australian jobs and lay the foundations for a new hydrogen in industry. The government has invested $96 million in the Carbon Net project, which is investigating the potential for establishing a commercial scale 
carbon capture and storage network in the Latrobe Valley. Carbon capture and storage is where we capture carbon dioxide released by industrial processes and compress it and store it. It is transported to an injection site to be sequestered deep underground for safe, long-term storage in suitable geological formations. Carbon capture and storage is being investigated as part of a suite of solutions with the potential to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and help address climate change. I am proud to say that those on this side of the chamber are supportive of carbon capture and storage. Additionally, both the International Energy Agency and, intergov and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change believe that carbon capture and storage can play an important role in helping to meet global emission reduction targets. CarbonNet has commenced its Stage 3 work program. This includes, firstly, drilling an appraisal well in the Bass Strait to determine the suitability of its preferred CO2 storage site. This work is currently underway. Secondly, the project will obtain a declaration of storage and injection licence. And thirdly, it will define a commercial structure and financial model to attract private sector investment, confirming interest in operating a carbon capture and storage service. Carbonet's preferred storage site overlaps both Commonwealth and state greenhouse gas titles. As such, these bills provide the mechanism to regulate the likely storage formation that straddles state and Commonwealth boundaries. Commercial scale hydrogen production from brown coal will require carbon capture and storage infrastructure such as those being investigated by Carbonet. The recently announced National Hydrogen Strategy highlights the economic opportunity the hydrogen export industry presents for Australia. It also aims to position our industry as a major player by 2030. The Carbonet project will facilitate the hydrogen energy supply chain project, which aims to produce hydrogen from brown coal, coal resources and requires suitable carbon capture and storage resources. This is the cheapest way to produce clean hydrogen. The government has invested $50 million so far in the world's first hydrogen energy supply chain pilot project, worth half a billion dollars in total. It is aimed at producing hydrogen from brown coal in Victoria's Latrobe Valley and liquefying and transporting the hydrogen to Japan. The pilot project is aimed to safely produce and transport clean hydrogen from Victoria to Japan. I am pleased that this pilot project presents an opportunity for our nation to establish a new hydrogen export industry and develop its own domestic hydrogen supply by using the Latrobe Valley's abundant coal reserves. As well as supporting a cleaner future, the pilot project supports great potential for new jobs based on brown coal in the Latrobe Valley. Madam Acting Deputy President, the government is committed to protecting our marine environment, also seen through our recent announcement that over 24 tonnes of rubbish has been cleaned up from the Great Barrier Reef last year. And I'd like to say congratulations to my colleagues Susan Lay, the Minister for the Environment, and Warren Ench, the Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. This bill is consistent with this government's commitment to healthy and cleaner oceans, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Carr. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Abbey, Deputy President. Uh, these bills raise questions about Australia's fuel and energy policies, and they go beyond the specific contents of the bills themselves. And on the face of it, they make technical and uncontentious changes to the maritime jurisdictions, allowing combined uh, Commonwealth and state jurisdictions to exist in coastal waters as, for the purposes of greenhouse uh, gas storage. And the first beneficiaries of these changes will be Victoria's carbon net and the hydrogen energy supply chain projects, which will sequester CO2 from the Latrobe Valley power stations in Bass Strait and generate hydrogen for export to Japan, a project I have strongly supported for some time. 
It will welcome development that, among other things, reflects many years of research on the technology of carbon capture and storage by the CSIRO and by the University of Melbourne and by the CO2 CRC. It means that the mining of Victoria's extensive brown coal reserves can have a future and contributes to the lowering of global emissions uh, and not to, uh, to increasing them. Hydrogen is an effective uh, as a zero emissions fuel and its use in motor vehicles, for example, would see the emission of water vapour uh, rather than uh, other noxious uh, fuels, uh, uh, vapours. All of this is undoubtedly good. But the export of hydrogen produced in this country is also a reminder of what we have to do to invest in the development of alternative fuels for use here. Now, it's troubled me that Australia, being what I think the ninth major uh, energy producer in the world, pens so little attention in terms of public policy on the development of fuel usage and storage, and of course so little attention is paid in terms of the wider energy policy, uh, particularly around the questions of the strategic value of providing energy security in this country. The most recently glaring example of this is failure to think strategically was the announcement by the Minister for Energy, uh, Angus Taylor, that Australia will buy oil and store it in the US Petroleum Reserve in Texas and in Louisiana. One consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic is that we have become more intensely aware of our dependence on fragile global supply chains. And of course, that's no more evident than our reliance on imported oil. Everything, and quite literally, uh, everything keeps uh, the, the economy moving depends on the availability of sufficient supplies of oil and the existence of sufficient refining capacity. And we have gone backwards in both respects in this country. And Minister Taylor's purchase of two days, two days of consumption in the United States does not fundamentally change that equation. Now, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, and the Age carried a report at the time of the minister's visit which said, and I quote, the US politicians have previously raised concerns about the idea of selling off uh, fuel from the petroleum reserve to other countries. But the fact that Australia's deal involves leasing facilities in the US rather than shipping the oil directly to Australia helped assuage some worries in Washington. And to me, that uh, quote summed up one of the major problems with this purchase. It's clear now that the new oil reserve is really part of another country's reserve. And we have yet to discover how this will actually work and how it will actually work in Australia's interest. Now, it's obvious from the point of view of Texas and Louisiana that Australian oil would not necessarily flow to Australia in the times of emergency. The reason is, that, of course, that the strategic reserve is held by that country in those states. And I asked a simple series of questions that Senate estimates around these matters, and I'd hope to get some clarification. The officers have responded in writing, a question I notice. Uh, the questions that they took on notice, and they said, unfortunately, they're about as clear as the contents of the barrel of West Texas crude itself. When I asked, uh, please outline the main steps in the process of Australia request for access to the arrival of fuel in Australia, we were told individually by the terms and conditions of the relevant commercial contracts. And that, of course, is subject to the ongoing negotiations with the United States. And I asked, was um, equally as murky in this response. Does this agreement include minimum and maximum times for the arrival of strategic petroleum reserve oil in Australia? I was told this is subject to negotiations with the United States. And finally, and this is a masterpiece of Zofrication, and worthy of the very best of Sir Humphrey Appleby. I asked, what arrangement does the Australian government have to place to guarantee timely access to appropriate shipping to bring the fuel to Australia in an emergency? And I was told, 
This is subject to ongoing negotiations with the United States. Though these negotiations, Australia will ensure any deal represents the best possible outcome for Australia. Well, of course, we live in hope, don't we? We live in hope. A great deal appears to rest on the ongoing negotiations. And as those negotiations have progressed, Mr Taylor, of course, should be able to by now enlighten us. Australia has purchased from this reserve. It will be held a long, long, long way away from Australia. And we're not able to know exactly how long it will take to get to Australia under what terms and conditions. And what happens if President Trump, or whoever it is that leads the United States administration at the, at the time, decides that in such a world emergency, the United States' interests are greater than Australia's? Would that oil legally belong to Australia? And if so, what would it matter? What would it matter? Have we not seen in the last six weeks of vital supplies being held up at borders despite contractual arrangements by governments that felt that their people deserve consideration over and above any contractual arrangements entered into by another government? The naive belief that contract law is going to rise above the national interests of other countries I find quite remarkable, but yet that is the belief that we have been peddled to us on a regular basis. Now, I hope that the operation of this faraway strategic oil reserve might become clearer when the fuel security review is actually released and when the government releases its response to this review's recommendations. But I asked a few questions on this matter as well, and we were told, well, of course, the timing of the release is a matter for the government, and the timing of the response will depend on the timing of the release. This, of course, is a pattern that's emerged, and unfortunately, what we see from that pattern is that Australia's position has only deteriorated. Australia joined in 1979, became a member of the International Energy Agency, and we're required to have 90 days supply of fuel reserves on tap. What we have seen since that time is that our position has steadily deteriorated. The Australian National Office Audit undertook, for instance, a report into a net import stock take in 2002. It decided that we had 310 days supply. And of course, by 2008, it decided that we had 101 days supply. In 2011, the Liquid Fuels Vulnerability Assessment concluded with the growing net imports, the stocks and net ports had likely to decline. And I understand that the minister now acknowledges that we have equivalent to 52 days supply. 52 days. Now, that's a misleading figure, of course, because the, uh, if we look at the detail of where that's held. That includes supplies held on water, supplies held in a foreign country, supplies held in people's petrol tanks, supplies held in reserve by private companies. That doesn't, of course, take into account that if we look at what's happening in terms of availability of specific types of energy and reserves, it's less than three weeks for jet fuels and for diesel and for various other types of different grades of fuels. So when you think about the vulnerability, if our shipping lanes were closed and reports that have been produced by the NRMA, for instance, back in 2013, suggested in the pharmaceutical industry, in the food industry, and many other key sectors of our economy that actually determine what sort of country we are, what sort of level of welfare our people enjoy, we may in fact be down to less than a week's supply. And when I ask officials, had you done modelling on that to confirm those things? Oh no, we weren't required. Just in last February I were asked those questions. We weren't required to examine the detail of those matters. So officially the government has not undertaken a study 
as part of this review. Now we know that we've seen the destruction of these fragile uh, supply chains in the time of the pandemic. Now circumstances there have highlighted particular uh, difficulties and it's unique in a way because people aren't driving. They're not actually using transport uh, for, for domestic purposes. It doesn't change the proposition that what was once considered only a theoretic pro proper model or in theoretical models, that international trading system could be thoroughly disrupted, has now been seen to be a real possibility. I say needs that, that way of thinking needs to be extended through to the implications of what might happen in times of conflict, real conflict, in which shipping lanes are affected as well, and what the consequences might be for us. So if the United States' strategic petroleum reserve is to be made available, under what circumstances would it be made available to Australia? What is the strategic thinking about supplying our fuel where we don't even have capacity to provide the shipping to get it to Australia in times of international crisis? What's the kind of thinking that leads us to make an assumption that those conditions are likely to change? What's the investment strategy that this government has undertaken to develop the storage capacity onshore? What's the strategic thinking that this government has undertaken to establish the refining capacity onshore? So when it comes to the development of energy security, you would think now would be an appropriate occasion on which to show some real leadership and to be able to demonstrate that it is actually cost effective to think in longer terms than what we have seen. The swiftness of which this pandemic has swept across the world shows that what can go wrong with neoliberal assumptions about the way in which the capitalist system actually works. It surely is a wake up call for us to think about what can be done to actually protect our national sovereignty and protect the welfare of our people and protect the living conditions of our people. The present crisis has shown there is no substitute for proper planning by government and by effective action by government. The prescriptions of neoliberal economics that have guided policy makers for a generation, I say, of course, have no basis for building a secure and prosperous future in this country. To create a future for this country where the national government is willing to take the initiative in fuel and energy policy. The government must be prepared to support the development of alternative fuels in this country, as well as that of options for our own export industries. We must be able to develop genuine fuel reserve on Australian soil, a reserve that will be readily available for the benefit of Australians in times of an emergency where we can genuinely demonstrate our sovereignty and our independence from dependence on long and fragile supply chains. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Greens support uh, this bill's aim to strengthen and clarify the monitoring, inspection and enforcement powers of Nopsema during an oil pollution emergency. Of course, earlier this year uh, we celebrated Equinor pulling out of the Great Australian Bight. It was a huge win for environmentalists, for coastal communities and the surfing community. For those who love our pristine beaches, the risk of an oil pollution emergency was not something to be monitored or managed. It was to be avoided at all costs. Thousands of people stood up and Equinor stood down. Uh, my colleague Senator Hanson Young will be moving amendments in the committee stage uh, to this bill to secure the ongoing protection of the bight from the sorts of emergencies that this bill is designed to manage. But what of the ongoing climate emergency? We've just experienced one of the hottest summers on record and a devastating, devastating bushfire season that claimed 34 lives. Regional communities are still struggling to recover from the impacts um, in the brief reprieve before the fire season starts again. But despite the need for urgent climate action, Australia's pollution from oil and gas production has increased a staggering 621 per cent 
since 2005, and it continues to rise each quarter. It's no wonder that we're on track for 3.4 degrees of warming. The Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis recently released a report comparing government and industry use of methane emissions data to the scandal of Volkswagen underreporting its emissions. And that report notes that methane from gas poses the greatest threat to the warming climate. Peer-reviewed studies have consistently shown that so-called natural gas emissions have actually been underestimated by at least 25 to 40 per cent, with some studies suggesting as much as 60 per cent. Methane leaks like a sieve from fracking for unconventional gas, and those fugitive emissions, when properly accounted for, make gas almost as polluting as coal and with damage to underground water supplies thrown in to boot. And yet the gas industry in Australia has no intention of reducing supply and therefore its emissions. Instead, Australia's gas industry has the enthusiastic support of government to keep on polluting, with a long list of new gas projects, both onshore and offshore, from Narrabri to the Galilee, from the Beedaloo Basin to the Burrup Peninsula. Just perhaps the regular donations from the gas industry, and they go to both sides of politics, is what shores up that enthusiastic support. While the country's attention has been on COVID responses, NOPSEMA, the regulator, has quietly approved the Scarborough offshore gas field development. That development is part of Woodside's proposed $50 billion Burrup Hub LNG project, which analysis estimates would have a footprint of 6 billion tonnes that's gigatons, of carbon pollution, equivalent to four Adani-sized coal mines. Emissions at that scale will jeopardise any prospect of Australia meeting its Paris climate targets. But most concerning is the statement from NOPSEMA that the project will be contributing to reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. Well, this is straight from the industry and government playbook that talks up gas as a transitional fuel. But there is little evidence that gas is in fact displacing coal globally. It simply adds to the carbon intensity in many countries, and it can divert efforts from a genuine switch to renewables. And no end date is being proposed for this so-called transition fuel. Australia's recovery from the COVID-19 crisis presents an opportunity for a genuine transition to a genuinely clean renewable future. The International Renewable Energy Agency has estimated that a renewable energy-driven transition to zero net emissions would boost global GDP by $155 trillion. Numerous business leaders have urged the government to use the recovery to invest in renewables, to support a green steel manufacturing boom and to provide sustainable jobs for regional areas. And yet this government remains focused on a gas-fired recovery, and so the carbon racket goes on. Given the energy minister's obsession with oil, gas and coal, it's hardly surprising that the COVID-19 commission tasked with guiding our recovery is stacked with the government's fossil fuel mates. The chair, uh, Mr Nev Power, is the director of an onshore gas exploration company, Strike Energy. Catherine Tanner is the managing director of Energy Australia and, of course, was a former director of the BP group who uh, led the charge to open up Queensland's gas fields. The list of high-priority projects promoted by the Commission includes a new fertiliser plant that is only possible if the Narrabri gas project proceeds. History shows that incumbent industries like the fossil fuel lobby use their power to convince governments that an economic crisis could justify the relaxation of climate change and environmental regulations. We will stand against such attempts. My bill to give traditional owners, farmers and landholders the right to say no to gas companies and coal companies, for that matter, has been before this parliament since 2011, and we will continue to fight for those rights to protect land, water, the climate um, and people's livelihoods. And we'll continue to push for the true cost of carbon emissions to be accounted for and for big emitters to be held responsible. Which brings me uh, to the second reading amendments that I'm moving today uh, on sheet 8894, which I so move now, to recognise that polluting companies are not currently paying for the damage that they do. When the carbon price was first established, West Australia removed its state requirements for gas projects to pay farmers to abate carbon emissions. But despite the scrapping of the carbon price, the abatement requirements were not put back in place. 
When the WIEPA introduced guidelines last year requiring resource projects to completely offset their greenhouse gas emissions, the usual suspects were outraged and they demanded the guidelines be withdrawn, and they were, and new guidelines have not yet been finalised. The gas donors called in their favours and used the Liberal and Labor parties to squash reform. If resource companies were required to buy Australian certified carbon units, it would not only drive efforts to reduce emissions, it would transfer wealth from gas companies to farmers who desperately need the income stream. It would be very interesting to see whose side the National Party is on. And when I move this second reading amendment, noting this, we invite the Nationals to come over and vote with us to represent farmers instead of their coal, oil and gas donors. Senator Waters, do you intend to move your amendment? Okay. I did. Thank you. Very good. Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I rise today to uh, speak to these two bills, the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Cross-Boundary Greenhouse Gas Titles and Other Measures Bill 2019, and the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment, Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2019. And I wanted to uh, perhaps cover three uh, points in the course of this uh, in the course of this speech. First, I want to give a short summary as to uh, what the bills are about. Secondly, why the bills are important, especially in today's context. And thirdly, I will make a few comments in response to some of the remarks which have been made by some of my uh, fellow senators. So, firstly, uh, why? What do the bills do? Well, the bills first enable title administration and regulation of a greenhouse gas storage formation that straddles the boundary between state and northern between state and or territory and coastal waters and commonwealth waters secondly they enable unification of adjacent commonwealth greenhouse gas titles thirdly strengthen the powers of the national offshore petroleum safety and environmental management authority during an oil pollution emergency originating in Commonwealth waters, and lastly, make minor policy and technical amendments to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act. And those issues have been discussed by a number of the previous speakers, and they're relatively straightforward. If uh, this nation is to develop uh, carbon capture and storage, then we need to have a title system which we which reflects the geographical reality of uh, where the formations are located, the jurisdictions in which they reside, and how the carbon cap capture storage technology would be utilised with injections into those formations. And those formations don't necessarily uh, respect state and territory borders. So that all makes great sense, Madam Acting Deputy President. It also makes great sense that NOPSEMA, the relevant authority and regulator, is given, appropriate, is given appropriate powers in the event of an oil pollution emergency. We need a regulator on the beat who can take the appropriate action if there is an oil pollution emergency. And of course, in that context as well, state and Commonwealth borders aren't necessarily respected in the context of that emergency. The reg regulator needs to act both in the Commonwealth jurisdiction and also in state jurisdictions. And the last point I'd make, just in relation to those introductory comments as to what the bill achieves, the bill does respect our federation and there's an appropriate allowance for Commonwealth state cooperation with respect to management and regulation of the titles, all the way from the initial grant to the uh, renewal process and through the imposition of various conditions on the titles. I'd now like to talk perhaps about why this bill is important. Last year, I served on a Senate Select Committee which looked at the vexed question of jobs in the regions. And some of those regions are suffering a great deal. And one of the regions which, uh, in relation to which we took evidence was the La Trobe Valley. And some of the most thought-provoking evidence I think we received in the context of that 
committee meeting was from representatives of the AMWU and also some of their members. And the point that they made smart during the... Very smart people. They, I'll take that interjection, Senator Watt. They were very smart people and they cared about their members. And one of the points they made was that uh, in the context of a major shutdown of, say, an electricity power station, uh, automotive manufacturing, the research indicates that the prospects of people who will employ on a full-time basis in, in those uh, facilities were quite grim. And the evidence suggests that uh, a third, only a third of the long-term employees would find long-term employment somewhere else after they'd been redu made redundant from such a facility. A third would go on a treadmill of short-term casual work, and a third would never have a full-time job ever again. And that evidence really did resonate with me and stayed with me far after the hearings of the committee. And when I look at this bill, it seems to me we have an opportunity here as a chamber to support the promotion and development of a new industry, of a new industry, an export hydrogen industry. And the position with respect to regulation of titles and the position with respect to uh, the formation of titles will assist the development of that industry. And the Commonwealth Government, has all, as has the Victorian Government, has already been supporting the development of the export hydrogen industry. And I want to talk about two projects in this context. The first is the government's investment of $96 million in the Carbon Net project, which is investigating the potential for establishing a commercial scale carbon capture and storage network in the Latrobe Valley, Victoria. Now, Carbon Net has commenced what's referred to as a stage three work program, which includes drilling an appraisal well which is currently underway in the Bass Strait to determine the suitability of its preferred CO2 storage site, obtaining a declaration of storage and injection licence and also defining a commercial structure and financial model to attract private sector investment. second project I want to refer to is the hydrogen energy supply chain into which the federal government has invested $50 million. Now, this is a world first pilot project a world first pilot project which is being supported by substantial uh, private sector and public sector investment from Japan. And this is where the opportunity lies. This is where the opportunity lies for this country to develop a world leading hydrogen export industry. HSC is co-founded co-funded by a Japanese-led business consortium to the tune of $230 million, the Japanese government by $166 million and the Commonwealth government by $50 million and the Victorian government by $50 million. If we can get that to work, Mr President, if we can get that project off the ground, it will provide billions of dollars of export dollars, it will provide hundreds and hundreds of jobs and it will do it in a way which is environmentally responsible and in a way which will provide job creation and investment in one of our regions which has suffered, which has suffered from redundancies over the past 20 years, the Latrobe Valley. It has suffered. And here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity for that region to reinvent itself. Here is an opportunity for that region to create additional jobs and employment and economic activity, the exact sort of economic activity that this nation will need as we emerge from this COVID-19 crisis, the exact sort of economic growth that this country will need. And the other aspect of that project which really resonates with me is the work being undertaken by the Commonwealth Government, Victorian Government, the Japanese Government and significant private sector players in both the Australian economy and the Japanese economy. And I've seen that work. I've seen that work in my home state of Queensland. I've seen that work. The BHP Mitsubishi Alliance in Queensland constituted a great partnership from great Australia, with, between great Australian companies and great Japanese companies, which developed undeveloped resources in the great state of Queensland. 
provided jobs, generated growth and provided prosperity for the people of Queensland. And I can see, I can see the opportunity we have here, Mr President, for exactly the same thing to be achieved in Victoria. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm supportive of this legislation, but I just want to make a quick point about hydrogen gas projects in the country. The explanatory memorandum for these bills says that they, that they will support two related projects in Victoria that will use coal and carbon capture and storage to export liquid hydrogen to Japan. The federal government has apparently tipped in around $150 million to get these two projects off the ground. Clearly, the government is pretty interested in getting the ball rolling on this one. I mean to say, this is the first thing we've been asked to look after, to look after months of parliament be, after months of parliament being shut down. Now, that's all well and good for Victoria, and good on you. I'm not going to get in the way of it. I can tell you that much right Order. now. Order, Senator Lambie. You'll be in continuation. Questions without notice, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the News Limited papers reported that, and I quote, Scott Morrison is considering slashing the $1,500 JobKeeper payment or phasing it out faster than expected. So I ask the minister, is the government contemplating the withdrawal of any job seeker support to Australians prior to the current September end date? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. No. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Government ministers and Liberal MPs and senators are reported to be actively debating ways to phase out COVID-19 support to Australians in need. New South Wales Liberal MP Mr. Jason Falinski told media today, and I quote, I think we should turn off JobKeeper as soon as possible. As soon as the schools are back, then it should go. Does the Prime Minister agree with his backbencher? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Firstly, on uh, our side of the parliament, on the uh, Liberal National uh, side of the parliament, uh, individual members of parliament are entitled to express their views on policy issues, and we think it's a very important part of the democratic debate, and it helps ensure that we get uh, better outcomes uh, going through proper process. Now, in relation, in relation to the JobKeeper program, uh, the government's position is, as it always has been, it is a substantial program, uh, providing support as we speak to more than 5.5 million working Australians, helping to keep them connected uh, to, their, to their employers, and, and that, is a, that has been a very good thing and has been extremely well received uh, by people right around Australia. We've always said that there would be a review at the midpoint. Uh, and Treasury uh, will be conducting that review and reporting that review uh, in, uh, in, in June. Uh, but it is a, it, we're six weeks in to a six-month program, and we're committed to the program uh, for six months. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Final supplementary. Does the Prime Minister share Mr Flinsky's view that we should turn JobKeeper off as soon as possible? Just, after, just one week after JobKeeper finally started flowing, will the Prime Minister cave to backbench demands to snap back at the expense of the continued support the economy and Australian workers need? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The first point I would make is that it was our government, our government that has put in place the support that the economy, uh, business and working Australians need. Our government. Our government. Now, what I would also, what I would also, what I would, what I would also, what I would also say is that, of course, uh, the, the uh, member uh, uh, for McKellar uh, is, of course, right when he says that we want people to get back into uh, their jobs and working for profitable businesses as soon as possible. Of course, that's, of course, that's what we want. Of course, we want to ensure that businesses can be back in business in a profitable fashion and can be back employing Australians, investing in their future success, hiring more Australians, paying them better wages over time. Of course, that's what we want to see as soon as possible. In relation to the JobKeeper program, the government's position is clear. Uh, we are six weeks in to a six-month program. There will be a review uh, mid uh, Y, and that is, that is as we've, that is as we've uh, announced it at the outset, and that is what we will stick to. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's response to the coronavirus pandemic and the progress Australia is making to protect lives? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for the, the question. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would also like to acknowledge, given that it is International Nurses' Day today, uh, the outstanding and tireless work of Australia's nurses, uh, in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, as the Prime Minister has said, we are fighting a war on two fronts in trying to protect both the health of Australians and our economy from COVID-19. Australians, though, have commenced the road back following the National Cabinet's decision last week to endorse the National Roadmap for COVID-19 recovery. And what we've seen since that time is state and territory governments respond and provide Australians with the vision for the road back, both in terms of their health and the economy. In terms of the work of the containment of COVID-19, we still have a long way to go. But our testing has now seen 861,000 tests across Australia. The rate of positive returns has now dropped to below 1 per cent across those 861,000 tests. Encouragingly, as we're doing more tests, we are returning a lower percentage of people who are positive across the country. We've now had less than half a per cent per day increase for over two weeks. And for that, Australians should be congratulated. That is an extraordinary milestone and one which even six or eight weeks ago would have appeared impossible. We are now seeing downward pressure on those numbers across the country, and that is only because of the hard work of Australians. And on behalf of the Minister for Health and the government, I acknowledge the hard work of all Australians in achieving those numbers. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise how Australia's response compares internationally? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and yes, I can. Our job as a government has been very, very clear, and that is to stand up for and to protect Australia's interests, in particular the health and safety of Australians. We have had particularly, when you look at, in an international context, significant success in managing and containing the outbreak of COVID-19 here in Australia. We have one of the highest testing rates in the world and one of the lowest mortality rates in the world. We've seen the growth in the number of COVID-19 cases go from more than 20 per cent per day just a few weeks ago to less than half a per cent today. Adjusting for population, the death toll in the UK is over 110 times that of Australia, France 100 times and the United States it is over 50 times. Again, this is due to the response of the Australian Order, people. Senator Cash, Senator ask you a final supplementary question. Minister, what are the government's key health priorities to manage risk as Australia begins to ease restrictions? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And in the first instance, as a country, um, we have now seen in excess of 5.8 million Australians uh, download and register for the COVID Safe app. Mr President, now more than anything, as we commence that road to recovery, uh, we encourage even more Australians to download the COVID Safe app. This is an important public health initiative that will keep Australians safe from the further spread of COVID-19 through early notification of possible exposure. Mr President, we've also seen a three-step roadmap adopted by all states and territories. And we now have the capacity to meet all of the foreseeable scenarios in Australia. And again, I congratulate Australians for the hard work that they have undertaken. Through the steps that they have taken, we have managed to flatten the curve through our containment measures, and we have also been able to adopt— Order. Senator Cash. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. ABS data released earlier this month showed that up to 700,000 people had lost their jobs since mid-March due to COVID-19. The RBA is predicting that unemployment will reach 10 per cent by the middle of the year uh, and remaining persistently high for years to come. 
Does the government agree with the RBA's assessment? And in what year will unemployment return to pre-coronavirus levels? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, well, the, the first point I would make is that, yes, we are going through a challenging period as a result of a, a very serious external health shock. Uh, the uh, measures that we've had to take in order to save lives uh, and protect people's health uh, have uh, required us to make decisions which have had a, a very uh, negative, devastating effect on the economy. We are sort of now uh, coming out uh, somewhat on the other side, uh, which is why we've been able to see some of the uh, early uh, phases of the easing of restrictions taking place uh, around, around Australia. But, I mean, you know, this is, this is an incredibly challenging period. Australia is in a better position uh, than many other countries around the world. We are winning the fight against the virus. But uh, there is still a lot of risk. Um, in re the um, Shadow Minister for Finance asked me about uh, our uh, um, expectations in terms of the unemployment rate. Well, the, the Treasurer and Treasury already uh, announced some time ago that the expectation was for unemployment to uh, reach 10 per cent during the uh, June uh, quarter. If it hadn't been for our measures, the expectation would have been that that would have been 15 per cent. And if you look at, again, on the economic front, at some of the other countries around the world, uh, you will see uh, unemployment rates of 15 per cent and higher uh, in many uh, economies around the world that have also had to deal with this challenge. We are not making uh, firm uh, forecasts now. Uh, we've shifted the budget to October for a reason, and that is because uh, there is too much uncertainty uh, in, uh, the, in terms of the economic context to make credible uh, forecasts uh, now. We will be providing a further update in an economic statement uh, in June. That is uh, you know, what we have uh, publicly announced. And in that economic statement, which comes after the March quarter national accounts have been released in early June, we will be providing uh, further assessments of our expectations on uh, economic parameters like the ones uh, Senator Gallagher has, uh, has referenced. Order, but it Senator would be premature Norman. to say more than we have now. Has expired. Senator Gallagher, Thank you, Mr question. President. Deloitte has also projected that unemployment levels will remain at heightened levels for years to come, predicting it won't reach its pre-COVID-19 level until at least 2024. However, on 13 March, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the Prime Minister was very strong on how there would be a snapback. They were his words. The economy would snap back. Does the Prime Minister stand by his snap back claim? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Of course, we want to see a strong economic recovery on the other side of this crisis. I mean, that is, uh, is self-evident. That is self-evident that that's what we want to see. And let me say, any Australian who uh, is watching what has happened in other economies around the world and compares that with what is happening here in Australia would say that both on a health front and on an economic front that Australia is performing comparatively better. That doesn't mean that we're not uh, facing continued challenges. Of course we are. And of course there's going to be much uh, hard work that will need to be done. But let me tell you, uh, our uh, agenda of uh, lower taxes, a smaller government, uh, encouraging and incentivising uh, uh, hard work, effort, uh, risk-taking. I mean, these are the sorts of uh, policy values and principles that will, that will stand Australia in very good stead, that will help us to ensure that Australians will have the best possible opportunity to get ahead in the future. We need a, we need a strong private sector-led recovery. We need to ensure that the nine out of ten working Australians who work for private sector businesses uh, have the Order. best possible Senator Coleman, job opportunities. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, don't Australians deserve better than a post-crisis snapback to an economy in which workers worry about job insecurity and where job seekers are relegated to poverty? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of that question. I completely reject the premise of the question. At the, at the, well, I reject the premise of uh, your description of the way the economy was. Let me just remind, uh, let me remind the honourable senator that the last election was actually was actually a referendum on two competing uh, economic plans. Your plan for higher taxes, your anti-business, anti-business, high taxing, socialist, anti-aspiration agenda, and our pro-opportunity lower taxes, a pro-growth, pro-business agenda, which Australians judge 
was a better way to ensure that, they and, uh, that Australians today into the future had the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, we, we, will, we will do what we have done in the past. We will pursue a pro-growth, pro-opportunity agenda which will ensure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, and, and that is, of course, the basis on which, under our leadership, 1.5 million new jobs were created in the economy uh, in the period prior to this COVID crisis hitting us. Order, Senator Cormann. Time jobs. for the answer has expired. Senator Seward. President, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Today, the Minister for Finance referred in his speech to ensuring a safety net which is underpinned by a sense of decency and fairness. Does the government think that living on $40 a day is decent and fair? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Seward, for your question. Um, one of the things that um, we do need to make very clear here, Senator Seward, is that the, um, the $40 a day to which you constantly refer is the primary payment for JobSeeker. Um, and, uh, and that is, it is but the primary payment. And almost nobody in Australia who is on a job seeker payment only receives the primary payment. Um, I draw to your attention a number of supplementary payments uh, to make sure that our social security system is targeted and to make sure that when people need a little bit of extra support, we actually target that support to those people who need it. For example, uh, obviously people who have children are going to require additional support, so through Family Tax Benefit Part A and Part B, we are able to target uh, additional support to those people. Uh, people who are find themselves in a situation where they're renting, we are able to target our rental assistance to those people. Uh, in addition, there are a number of other payments, which could be energy supplement, the utility allowance, the telephone allowance, carers allowance. The list goes on, Senator Seward. So to say that you're referring to $40 a day is not an accurate reflection to the targeted social welfare system that we have put in place to help Australians when they're down or when they're out of job. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Through you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said, "If people are in jobs, they don't need income support." Does the government think by the end of September that the potentially 1.4 million people who are still unemployed will have found work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Senator Seward. Obviously, the number one priority of this government over recent weeks has been to make sure that we keep Australians safe from the corona pandemic. We have worked tremendously hard on our health response, and I think everybody in this chamber would have to agree that Australia has done phenomenally well in dealing with our health crisis. But we have a second responsibility, and that is to make sure that we kickstart our economy. And the road to our recovery is going to be built on the back of business because it's businesses that create jobs. And as Senator Corman has just said, you're nine out of ten jobs in Australia are with the private sector. And so we are going to work very hard to make sure that we are able to stimulate the Australian economy within a COVID-safe environment to make. Senator Seward, on a point of order. Point of order. I asked a very specific question in terms of does the government think those 1.4 million people will have found a job? Um, you had a quote from the Prime Minister and that was a summary of the question you asked. I am listening to the Minister. I have let you remind, remind the Minister of the question. I think the Minister can be directly relevant by speaking to the government's objectives in that matter, but I will listen carefully for the last 15 seconds. S Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know whether you do have, have one too, Senator Siebert, but what I can tell you is that this government will work tirelessly day and night and between now and whenever we are past this pandemic to make sure that every Australian who needs Order, a job Senator is Rustin. Be a Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Through you to the minister. Can I ask, is the government going to drop the job seeker payment back to $40 a day after the 25th of September this year? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Senator Seward. The, 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 uh, the government has been very clear uh, that the measures that we've put in place, and there are a number of measures, including the corona supplement that you refer to, uh, that have been put in place to help Australians to be able to get to the other side of this crisis. But we have always said they would be targeted. We have always said that they will be temporary. Um, and we will continue to work with the Australian um, people and through uh, the economic stimulation that we need to put in place to make sure that we, on the other side of this crisis, are able to get Australians back to work. But we have been very, very clear uh, about 
out the supports that we've put in place, a whole range of them, ranging from the $750 twice um, economic supplement that we have given to, uh, to people on pensions. The corona supplement, whether it's been um, reducing eligibility um, requirements for people getting onto payment, whether it's been the removal of the asset test, all of these things have been put in place to help Australians to get to the other side of this corona pandemic. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, as chair of the Australia and New Zealand Forum on Food Regulation. Minister, I refer you to your recent letter to me regarding the Forum's decision to ask FSANS to revise its proposal for mandatory pregnancy warning labels on packaged alcohol. In your letter you claim FSANS proposal places an unreasonable cost burden on the alcohol industry. FSANS cost-benefit analysis says each new case of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder costs at least $13,847 a year in health and disability costs alone which equates to a projected annual cost of over $3 million each and every year for new cases. Yet the one-off cost to industry is just $4,924 per product. Minister, are lives or alcohol industry profits more important to government? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thank uh, Senator for his question. Mr President, the decision uh, that I wrote to you about uh, in response to your correspondence was a decision made by ministers of all states, territories and the New Zealand government with respect to the report provided to food ministers uh, into the um, labelling of alcohol and, and pregnancy warning labels. Uh, it was considered by all of those ministers and a majority of states, territories uh, at that forum voted to review the uh, recommendations that have been put forward. I might add, Mr President, that, the, that all governments sitting around the table are committed to um, alcohol warning labels, on the compulsory alcohol warning labels on, on um, alcohol receptacles. Uh, that decision will be made uh, very soon. We've asked for for Zance to come back to the committee with a report uh, within 12 me weeks of the last meeting, which is, I think, from recollection, sometime in June. Senator Grip, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, your letter also mentioned that FSANS is being asked to review the colour of the warning label, and FSANS elected to use red because, and I'll quote, evidence indicates red increases the speed of identification and level of attention the warning receives. Minister, why does the government or the respective state governments have an issue with using red on a warning label given FSAN's evidence-based reasons for using it. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, the evidence presented in FSAN's report also talked about the importance of contrast on labels. Uh, and in some circumstances, red, quite frankly, just isn't practical. Um, the point that uh, Senator made in his primary question with respect to cost was one of the considerations that was a part of that process as well. Uh, but I can say quite categorically uh, the importance of pregnancy warning labels is such that it needs to be visible on a label, and in that context contrast is important, uh, and a red symbol on a red label simply won't work. So one of the concerns that we had was that uh, there was appropriate contrast of the label, uh, of the symbol on the label, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, minister, food ministers asked Fazans to reconsider a, as a part of our decision-making process, uh, and as I said, the report to come back to uh, food ministers' meeting within 12 weeks of order. That Senator report. Colbeck, Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Min minister, you stated that you are committed, and everyone is committed to mandatory pregnancy warning labels. If the revised proposal that comes back within 12 weeks um, from Fazans puts forward uh, essentially the same. Um, recommendation as in the original proposal, will you accept it? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, that is in fact quite a hypothetical. Uh, we've asked for Zance to review the report that it provided to us. We've pointed to two particular issues that we wanted for Zance to reconsider. Uh, my conversations with them is that they are considering that work. We've asked them to report back to us to, within 12 weeks so that we can reconsider it. Uh, and, with, uh, and, and hopefully, Mr President, we'll be in a situation whereby later in this year we have a decision to have mandatory pregnancy warning labels on alcohol receptacles 
uh, within a period of time. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. How many Australians are earning more than their normal wage because they are now receiving the JobKeeper wage subsidy of $1,500 per fortnight? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I take that question on notice. Senator Keneally, a supplementary no, question. We don't know. We don't know. Order, Senator Keneally. Why should a single mother working as a casual teacher for five years miss out on JobKeeper because she hasn't worked 12 months with a single school, while a university student who's been a part-time worker for a lengthy period receives significantly more than their regular income? Shame on you. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. There is clearly evidence emerging of a split between Mr. Albanese oh. and Mr. Chalmers. A, a, a clear split between Mr. Albanese and Mr. Chalmers, and, and clearly Senator Keneally, right, for the moment at least, uh, is on Mr. Albanese's. Uh, no, actually, yeah, she's on Mr. Albanese's side because this is the point Mr. Albanese raised when Mr. Chalmers, the shadow treasurer, was all in favour of the way we framed it and saying it was better to be more to err on the more order. generous than Senator, the less generous. Senator Keneally, uh, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I think you know, Mr. President, my point of order is going to be direct relevance. The question that I asked clearly went nowhere near any of the things the minister is talking about. I would be appreciated if you could draw him back um, uh, to the disparity between the single mother and the university uh, student. Senator Keneally, I will, I will draw the minister's attention to the question you asked. Um, and Senator Cormann, I ask you to return to the question. Senator Cormann. Well, uh, clearly uh, Senator Keneally is very sensitive about what I've just revealed uh, to the Senate chamber. And I mean, the argument that she's picking up, and that is directly relevant to the question that she's asked, the argument that she's just picking up uh, is the argument that Mr. Albanese pursued on Fran Kelly this morning, where he is raising precisely that question. Um, uh, Directly relevant to the um, question. Um, I, I'm Senator Keneally on the point of order. Sorry, I did, that was my fault. Again, direct relevance. He seems to be ignoring your ruling to draw him back to um, the matter I, I, in the I, question. I, he is speaking about a member in the other place, not the disparity between the teacher, the single mother teacher, and the university student. Thank you. On, on, a, on, a design on, flaw under his own sorry, program. Senator, Senator Coleman on the point of order. On, on the point of order. Uh, how can I not be directly relevant when I'm referencing directly the question she's asked, which is directly the same as the question raised um, by Mr. Uh, Albanese this morning? I'm, I'm going to listen to the minister's answer. He is asserting that the quotation or the reference he's about to point to is directly relevant. I do take senators at face value when they indicate that. I call the minister. He has 11 seconds remaining. Well, this is what Mr. Albanese said this morning, and it goes directly to the question that Senator Keneally raised. Well, I don't think there's ever been a justification for people to get more money than they were getting before. Uh, I wanted to have order, an Senator. Well, we've ex the question has expired. Time has expired, but I'll take the point of order, Senator Wong. Thank you. Maybe this, perhaps, it might be relevant to the next answer, Mr. President. I don't think any president has ruled it in order as a to persistently simply quote the opposition. I this goes to administration. This, this goes to the administration of public monies in this minister's portfolio. Uh, and on, so on the point of order, I, Senator Keneally's point of order, I allowed some latitude in her making it due to the first part of the minister's answer. Um, the point being, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question nor to address a specific term in it or an example in it as quoted by Senator Keneally. Um, the minister must remain directly relevant. I didn't get to hear the end of that, um, but I'll ask ministers to keep in mind the need to be directly relevant, not broadly relevant, to the question asked. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister confirm that approximately one million casual workers, such as the single mother who's worked as a casual teacher for five years, are missing because they haven't been with a single employer, are missing out and remain excluded by the government's design of the JobKeeper program? Why won't the Treasurer fix the government's design flaws and use his extraordinary powers to include hard-hit Australian casual workers into the program. Senator Cormann. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. President. We are supporting long-term casuals, and we are relying on the definition of long-term casuals in the Fair Work Act. 
in the fair work act and i mean the whole objective of job keeper as opposed to job seeker is to keep is to keep uh, workers connected to their employer uh, and indeed as far as casuals are concerned that is for casuals who have worked for the same employer for 12 months, for 12 months, at least 12 months. Now, and we are, of course, providing support uh, to more than 5.5 million Australians, a staggering number, 5.5 million Australians through this uh, JobKeeper uh, program, and, and the number is, I believe, still rising. But, uh, but, but, of course, I mean, there are other supports available. For, there are other supports available subject to their circumstances, depending on how much uh, they uh, otherwise earn and the like, but uh, there are other supports available. Uh, for, for those who find themselves out of work uh, through the Job Seeker program, which of course comes with all sorts of ad additional uh, benefits as well, uh, such, as, such, as, such as, of course, rental assistance Order. and Senator family uh, tax Time benefit for the plans and the like. Expired. Senator McMahon. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister outline the benefits of the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement and inform the Senate when the agreement will enter into force. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for her question and, of course, uh, knowing that uh, the Northern Territory in particular has uh, enormous opportunities uh, from closer relations between Australia and Indonesia, uh, and I know that your passion there is, is to see those opportunities realised. So I'm very pleased to inform uh, Senator McMahon and the, uh, and the Senate uh, that following discussions I had early last week with my Indonesian counterpart, August Supermanto, that uh, Indonesia completed last week its domestic ratification procedures uh, and provided formal notification to Australia, which means that the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement will enter into force on 5 July. Uh, closer economic relations and closer strategic relations between Australia and Indonesia has been a long-term objective for Australian governments of all political persuasions. And I do note, uh, as IACEPA heads towards entry into force, the bipartisan support that was offered uh, for the agreement uh, and the legislation enabling it. It is crucial that we see uh, this continued strength and growth in the relationship between Australia and Indonesia uh, and, indeed, the trade opportunities that it will create. And the trade opportun opportunities from IACEPA uh, are quite real and tangible. Uh, over 99 per cent of Australian goods exports to Indonesia uh, will enter duty-free or under significantly preferential arrangements. Uh, this will see some 575,000 live cattle able to enter Indonesia duty-free in year one, some 500,000 tonnes of feed grains, including wheat and barley and other grains, be able to enter duty-free in year one. Up to an estimated 455 semi-trailer load equivalents of oranges will enter duty-free. Potatoes, carrots, frozen beef and sheep meat tariffs, dairy tariffs, all of them being reduced, as well as goods such as rolled coil steel uh, to the equivalent almost to make enough for five Sydney Harbour bridges Order. each year. Senator Birmingham. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate of the feedback from farmers and industry groups about the agreement, which will provide new market opportunities and protect livelihoods for our farmers and business owners? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, given the scale of the new opportunity created with Indonesia as a, as a large and, uh, and we trust, still fast-growing economy once it recovers from the challenges of COVID-19, there has been very warm reaction from Australian farming and other industry representatives. Uh, uh, the chairman of Grain Growers said that access to this new feed grain market is great news and timing could not be better. We have safe, nutritious grains for Australians as well as our closest neighbours. Uh, Ausvegas, National Manager of Export Development, said that this should lead to an immediate increase of over 300 per cent in current trade values of fresh vegetables to Indonesia. The National Farmers Federation said uh, that the entry into force of IACEPA provides some much-needed perspective for Australia's farmers, encouraging us to look beyond the present hardships of drought, bushfires and coronavirus and to the bright future ahead. While the Business Council of Australia said that it will help open new markets, create new jobs and build a stronger recovery for both nations, and that is certainly the government's Order, aspiration to see that Senator strength forward. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the coalition government working to keep trade flowing, to keep more Australians in work? Senator Birmingham. 
Mr President, despite the challenges posed by COVID-19, the latest ABS trade data shows that Australia recently recorded our 27th consecutive monthly trade surplus. And indeed, it was a record, another record trade surplus to the tune of some $10.6 billion. And I'm pleased to highlight for Senator McMahon's benefit uh, and, uh, uh, and others from the Northern Territory uh, that this included a record value of goods exports and that indeed goods exports from the Northern Territory increased in 2019 by some 73 per cent uh, under the policy settings uh, of our government. Uh, but during the month of March, we saw strong goods exports growth to a range of different markets for Australia, a 354 per cent increase in goods exports to Hong Kong, a 30 per cent increase to the Republic of Korea, a 96 per cent increase to the United Kingdom and a 51 per cent increase to the United States of America. Now, all of this demonstrating that the diversity of opportunities available to Australian exporters continues to grow Order. and they continue to Senator seize Birmingham. those opportunities. Time for the answers expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Defence, Minister Reynolds. In July 1940, the mortally wounded leading seaman Jack Mantle trained his weapon on a swarm of Nazis. Nazi Stukas attacking HMAS Foilback. Jack Mantle was awarded the Victorian Cross. Two years later, the HMAS Armadar was hit by Japanese aircraft and began to sink rapidly. 18-year-old ordinary seaman Teddy Sheen was wounded during the attack, but rather than flee, he strapped himself to his anti-aircraft cannon and opened fire. That decision to tie his fate to a gun sinking to the bottom of the ocean brought down two planes and helped save the lives of 49 crew. You have the power to recommend Teddy for Australia's highest military honour, the Victorian Cross. So our question from Tasmania is this. What more could Teddy Sheen have possibly done to have earned a Victorian Cross? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank very much uh, Senator Lambie for that question. Uh, Senator Lambie, I am very well aware of the heroism uh, and the service and the sacrifice of Teddy Sheehan. He did the Australian Navy a great credit and he is worthy of significant acknowledgement. Uh, the issue you raise in terms of a posthumous Victoria Cross is a very challenging policy issue, uh, which does not in any way detract from uh, his worthiness in terms of his service. Uh, Senator Lambie, I will take that question on notice because I'll have to uh, find out the status of this and I will come back to you at the earliest possible opportunity. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government and yourself have had the Teddy Sheen report for the Awards and Honours Tribunal since July 2019. We're nearly 12 months on. Uh, your government and yourself have blocked every effort to get it released because you say you're preparing a response. How long does it take to say accept or does not accept to a document? What is the hold-up? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, I will, uh, Senator Lambie, take that on notice and get back to you at the earliest possible opportunity. I do need to check with the Minister for Veterans Affairs and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Gary Ivory, the nephew of Teddy Sheen, wrote to the Prime Minister in February asking for an update on when to expect a response from the government. Out of respect to Gary Ivory, he's yet to hear back. Teddy's been waiting for recognition for, 47, for 78 years. How long is the Prime Minister planning to keep his nephew waiting? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And again, I will take that on notice and I will get back to you at the earliest possible opportunity. Uh, and I do, as I said, I do understand uh, the passion uh, for his service and his contribution to our nation, not only by Tasmanians, uh, but by all naval personnel and, in fact, all Australians. But as I said, uh, the awarding of a posthumous VC is not a simple issue. But I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can, Senator Lambie. You have my word on that. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. On 20 April, superannuation funds wrote to the Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Senator Hume, outlining their concern about the risk of fraud under the government's early superannuation scheme and calling on the government to enact greater protections. On 1 May, the very same day that the government received advice from the AFP saying that it was investigating suspected fraud in the scheme, Assistant Minister Hume replied to concerned superannuation funds, saying the government had, and I quote, substantial checks in place to guard against fraud. 
Does the Prime Minister stand by Senator Hume's claim? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Of course he does. Uh, Senator Hume is doing an outstanding job, an absolutely outstanding job uh, in, 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 helping, in helping the government develop our response, supporting, supporting Australians through this, through this crisis, supporting Australians through this crisis, helping Australians who, are, uh, who have lost their job or who have lost significant work hours, who are facing significant financial challenges, to be able to get through this period, pay the mortgage, uh, pay, the, pay, pay, pay the fees, pay the, pay the fees that they're facing by accessing, by accessing, uh, by accessing some of their superannuation early. This is actually not a new system. Uh, ha hardship provisions and early access to superannuation under hardship provisions uh, is a well-established system. Uh, we, we we have, we have adapted it in this context. And of course, the, the correspondence that the senator refers senator, to had some senator other Watt. assertions too, like that somehow $50 billion worth of uh, superannuation savings would walk out the door. We always said that that was an excessive and an exaggerated uh, prediction. And, and if you look at the figures that the way they have order. been uh, developing, senator that Coleman, is indeed I have been proven McAllister to be right. Point of order. Senator McAllister? I wish to raise a point of order about relevance. Uh, I am hoping to learn whether the Prime Minister stands by the Minister's claim that substantial checks were in place to guard against fraud. That is the materialist issue in this question, and I would like an answer. Um, that is on the point of order, or the, on the point of order, Senator McAllister, that was the conclusion of your question. I am listening carefully to the Minister's answer. I can't instruct him which part of a question to answer, but he is allowed to address any parts of the preamble to that part, that concluding question. So I'm listening carefully to the Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Senator Hume was right, the Prime Minister is right. Of course there are substantial checks and balances, but any program, any government program, any business is exposed to the risk of fraud. And when, if and when fraud does occur, you take appropriate action. And of course appropriate action was taken. This is not a widespread problem, it is an isolated problem, but of course, uh, as is appropriate. I mean, there, there, is, there, is, there is fraud in relation to job seeker. There's fraud. I mean, do do you suggest that we should close down the entire job seeker program because there's a risk of fraud? There's a risk of fraud in relation to any government program. And of course, you put appropriate checks and balances in place, which does not entirely eliminate the risk of fraud. But when fraud is detected, uh, you take action. And that is, of course, what is happening consistent with uh, the laws that this parliament passed with your support. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why did it take the government seven days from receiving advice from the AFP about suspected fraud to suspend assessments under the scheme? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I've indicated, th th this, this, these were isolated examples and appropriate action was taken. The Minister has concluded his answer. Senator McAllister, a supplement final supplementary question. Only three days after the government suspended assessments under the scheme, the responsible minister reopened assessments. Can the minister guarantee no further Australians will be defrauded of their retirement savings through this scheme? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Can Senator McAllister guarantee that nobody in Australia will speed because our speed limits? Uh... Order. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. And he might think it's funny to dismiss this, but they are the government, and the question is about the government's program and the probity of the government's program. So, so, Could the on, minister on, please be directly on, relevant to the question? On, on, with, with respect, on the point of order, I mean, the minister had been speaking for seven seconds. I, I, I didn't have him at a full stop at that point. Um, I don't believe that actually, I don't believe if he was prefacing his answer with such a statement that I would be in a position to rule it as not being directly relevant seven seconds into the answer. I've allowed you to challenge the minister's answer. There's a time for debating it after question time. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. It might be very hard for Labor senators to understand, but for Australian families facing hardship uh, in this, during this period, this is actually an important option for them to be able to uh, release some of their own money, some of their own money in order to, uh, in order to deal Watt. with their cost of living pressures through this period. Uh, appropriate checks and balances are in place and of course we'll Senator continue to Watt take action as appropriate. Direct relevance. The minister was asked a specific question about guaranteeing that no further Australians would be defrauded under your scheme. We'd, I can answer, Mr President. Um, with, with respect, Senator Wong, I mean, the, the, uh, can, I, can, I, can I conclude my? And I'll, I'll take a point of order. I'll take a further point of order after I rule. Um, you, 
your point of order there moves into asking me to instruct the minister how to answer a question, which I don't believe is within my power. He was talking about the risk of fraud or otherwise, as I was listening to in the program. I believe that is being directly relevant, and there's an opportunity to debate it afterwards. I can't instruct him to um, answer a question or use a particular term. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. We will, continue, we will continue to manage this program appropriately, which is very popular, and we will ensure that all Australia's interests, uh, all Australia's interests are appropriately looked after. Order. Order on my left. Senator Patterson. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President, and what an excellent answer about an excellent program. But uh, my question is for the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on what actions Defence has been taking in support of whole of government efforts to reduce the spread of COVID-19? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Patterson for that question. And the answer is, I certainly can. Uh, while this government has been focused on protecting Australians uh, and enabling Australians to live safely in the age of COVID, uh, Defence has yet again been playing its part. And it's not only our men and women in uniform across the three services, it's also uh, personnel from right across the Department of Defence who have been assisting in the whole of government response right across this nation. Uh, Defence has been responding in four key ways. We established in March a COVID-19 task force and the four areas of main response are assisting states and territories with their health responses, uh, secondly, assisting with the economic stimulus activities, uh, particularly with our engagement with defence industry, uh, also ensuring, of course, that our men and women overseas, there are a thousand of them, are uh, safe and well, uh, and also dealing with all of the other issues of national security. But fourthly, we have been providing additional support to our near neighbours because clearly uh, the threat of COVID-19 in many of our smaller Pacific nations in particular has the potential to be quite catastrophic. Uh, today we have over 2,000 ADF personnel on the ground doing tasks ranging from contact tracing, comp quarantine compliance and also importantly protecting our Indigenous communities. Uh, for over a month, just a few examples, for over a month a small team of highly qualified ADF engineering maintenance specialists helped a surgical face mask company in Shepparton boost the output uh, exponentially of life-saving facial masks uh, until uh, sufficient civilians were able to be trained to actually now run that facility. And more recently, as part of an OSMAT-led Commonwealth team, the ADF deployed 50 personnel to the Northwest Regional Hospital in Burnie for two weeks to allow the staff to go into isolation and provide much needed medical support to over 400 uh, residents of North West Tasmania. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister inform the Senate what defence science and technology have been doing to support the whole of government uh, efforts on COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, again, thank you very much, Senator Patterson, uh, for that question. Without question, the men and women of our, science and techno our defence science and technology group are without doubt some of the smartest and most capable men and women uh, in, in the world. And I'm extremely proud of the contribution that our defence scientists have made contributing their expertise and their smarts to research in COVID-19 virus and also for mitigation activities. Uh, Defence has partnered with a South Australian company, Axiom Precision Manufacturing, to rapidly produce a new face shield. Uh, boosting the supply and also expanding uh, local industry capability. Our Chief Defence Scientist, Professor Tanya Monroe, is leading a rapid response group aimed at repurposing in existing non-invasive ventilators and turning them into invasive ventilators. Uh, Defence is also researching the virus's survivability on a range of different surfaces, and we're doing that in conjunction with a range of international partners. And these are just a few examples Order. of what Senator the Defence Reynolds, Science and Technology Group is the doing. The answer has expired. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline what actions the Australian Signals Directorate have been taking to protect Australians online and to support Australia's economic resilience in response to COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President and uh, Senator, for that question. Again, another part of the defence portfolio that is doing outstanding work as part of our national response to COVID-19. The Australian Cyber Security Centre is protecting Australian families and businesses uh, against COVID-19-related cybercrime. 
and importantly, cyber attacks against critical uh, areas such as our health agencies and uh, companies. So, to identify and disrupt malicious cyber criminals offshore, the ACSC is closely collaborating with industry here in Australia and overseas, with law enforcement, with government agencies, and also with our telecommunication providers. But they're also working with frontline healthcare providers to reduce their risk of cyber compromise at this time. The Australian Signals Directorate itself is using uh, its offensive cyber capabilities to disrupt uh, foreign COVID-19 related cyber criminals. And these are criminals are attempting to exploit Order. Australians Senator in this time Reynolds, of crisis, time which is utterly has despicable. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In response to a question on ABC yesterday about Australians being defrauded of their retirement savings, Senator Bragg said that fraud resulting from the Commonwealth's or the government's early super access scheme was, and I quote, an immaterial component. Is Senator Bragg correct? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. About $10 billion or uh, thereabouts uh, in uh, early uh, released superannuation uh, payments have been released back to the owners of that money, people saving for their retirement, to help them deal with the challenging circumstances, the challenging financial circumstances they are facing. Uh, and there has been a comparatively minor incidents of fraud, which has been detected, which has been acted upon, and the interests of those impacted Australians will of course, will of course be looked after. Of course, they will be, of course that will be addressed as appropriate. But let me tell you, this is an important program. It's a popular program. We will continue to take effective action to prevent, to prevent fraud and, of course, to, uh, to deal with it if and where that occurs. And anyone who commits fraud will have the book thrown at them. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. While Australians facing financial hardship have resorted to access their retirement savings early in the absence of adequate government uh, assistance, Senator Bragg has said, and I quote, I think it's a good idea to have access regimes like this on a more permanent basis. Does the minister agree with Senator Bragg? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, President, as I've said in response to an earlier question, uh, individual members and senators uh, on the Liberal National side are uh, free to express their views and express to speak their mind. I know that on the socialist side of the chamber that is not so easy, but on our side, people can speak their mind. But as far as the government's position is concerned, the measures, the support measures that we have put in place in the context of uh, helping people to transition through the challenging period that we are going through now are temporary. They're not ongoing. Uh, and uh, we are not considering making any of the temporary measures uh, ongoing, I, not this one and not any of the other temporary measures. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, in light of that answer, Minister, do you agree that Senator Bragg's plan would undermine Australia's world-class superannuation regime? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. There's just no uh, truth to the premise of this question at all because there's no proposition by government to go down that path. Uh, so the government is not proposing to make that change. Uh, access, early access to superannuation under hardship provisions is a long-standing arrangement that has been in place, uh, you know, I, I would think, uh, since inception of compulsory super, if not soon thereafter, and it's appropriate for that to be in place. Uh, it's been uh, adjusted as we are going through this period to help Australian families get early access to the superannuation in the context of the hardship they uh, may be facing, uh, given the economic impact of the coronavirus crisis. Now, that is entirely appropriate, uh, but uh, this is a temporary measure. We're not proposing to make it permanent. We don't think that would be appropriate, and that is not something that is uh, on the table. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mark on. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government supporting Australians who are being impacted by the economic downturn resulting from the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and can I um, thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question and, and the opportunity to advise the Chamber of the supercharging of the welfare system that has been put in place to help people who find themselves unemployed during this COVID virus outbreak. 
Um, as we um, have already mentioned, uh, there is a temporary uh, supplement that is being paid at a rate of $550 a fortnight to people who are on payment. That means that anybody who is currently eligible for a job seeker payment will receive in, in, addition, uh, in excess of $1,100 a fortnight for the duration of the pandemic. Uh, and this is being paid not just to new people who have come onto payment, but also to people who find themselves uh, who found themselves already on payment. Job seeker payment, youth allowance payment, parenting payment, people who were on farm household allowance, and those on special benefit. But we've also relaxed a number of criteria uh, to make sure that those people who find themselves coming onto unemployment through no fault of their own are going to have a quick and easy access to be able to get the support that they're going to need during this pandemic. For instance, we did, we've waived the, the one-week ordinary waiting period, uh, we've waived the liquid asset waiting period, and we've also, for our, uh, our permanent residents uh, on their way, pathway to permanent residency and, and a citizenship of Australia, we've waived the newly arrived residents' waiting period. But we've also relaxed uh, the income test measures to ensure, uh, for partner incomes to ensure those people that find themselves uh, requiring job seeker payments, uh, if their partner's payment is, uh, is less than $3,700 per fortnight, they will also be able to get access to the job seeker payment uh, or part thereof. This is in addition to the $750 um, one-off payment that was made in early April to people, all people on payments and a further $750 uh, payment that will be made in July to those people that haven't been eligible for the job seeker payment uh, corona supplement. Order, so Senator Rustin. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, what in particular is the government doing to support people with a disability during this time? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. From the outset, the Morrison government has taken very decisive action to make sure that we protect the lives of, uh, of Australians who live with disability. Uh, they uh, released um, early on the management and operational plan for COVID-19 for people with a disability, which was received uh, hu with huge um, acclamation from the sector and, uh, and was a significant milestone in the health response to make sure that people with disability had the protection that they needed during this crisis. But in addition to that, through the social services portfolio, we've announced another 90, uh, over $90 million worth of uh, initiatives in a support package to help uh, Australians, particularly those that find themselves in difficult in employment situations. Um, in addition to that, we have put uh, $2 million to a dedicated phone line to support our current um, web-based um, outreach programs to make sure that we are able to provide the advice and the direction to service that people with disability may be requiring information about during this crisis. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government ensuring stability of services to help protect the lives and livelihoods during this current, uh, coronavirus pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the absolute focus of this government during this crisis has been to save lives and then to save livelihoods and to make sure that we can assist Australians to be able to deal with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. To that end, there have been a number of grants that exist within the Department of Social Services that we, uh, that we use to deliver essential services to all Australians. And in April, uh, I announced a $64 million extension to about 3,000 grant recipients to the 31st of March 2021. Uh, those are the grants that would have possibly um, ceased uh, in the coming months. This is to make sure that we are able to uh, uh, maintain a continuity of service throughout this time to make sure that we're providing the services to Australians, uh, particularly those that are most at risk of this uh, pandemic. Uh, we acknowledge we have a long road ahead uh, and we are here to make sure that we support all Australians with this great challenge. We have planned for the worst and we are working hard to make sure that does Order. not happen. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister of Foreign, for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. The Sunday Mail Brisbane reported that LNP member for Dawson, Mr. Christensen, blindsided cabinet ministers by launching an inquiry into diversifying Australia's trade and investment profile by the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth. When did the minister first become aware of the inquiry? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for her question. As I understand it, the inquiry itself was commenced. Uh, some months ago uh, in February of this year. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Did Mr. Cri I ask a supplementary. Did Mr Christensen consult with the minister about his approach before publicising his intentions in the media? 
Senator Payne. Um, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for her question. Uh, as the Senator would be well aware, there are countless inquiries undertaken across the Parliament, in the Senate, in the House, and in joint committees. And I certainly don't expect that every chair will consult with every minister in that uh, process. Mr. Christensen uh, did not raise the particular inquiry with me, largely because it had, of course, commenced several months ago in February of this year. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Does the minister believe it is in the national interest for a backbench LNP member to be so prominent in the management of Australia's largest trading relationship? And does the minister endorse Mr Christensen's actions? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, it's, it's certainly the case that uh, Australia's democratic system of uh, government allows, respects, uh, indeed uh, welcomes members of parliament having a voice on issues across the nation, issues in Australia's national interest. It's one of the reasons why we come to this place to go to work. It's one of the reasons why we do this job. It's one of the reasons that we are blessed with the privilege and the opportunity of standing up in a House of Parliament, freely and democratically elected to do that job. So, Mr President, I understand the issues that prompt Senator Wong to ask that question. But for my part, I am very strongly attached to Australia's democratic processes, and I will continue to be so. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My, thank you very much. Order. Thank you very much. Your immaterial. Thank you. Well, I'd, will I go ahead or? Yes, Senator Bragg. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic response to the coronavirus pandemic is helping small and family businesses to remain resilient and supporting the livelihoods of business owners and their employees? during this unprecedented economic crisis. Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for his question. Small and family business, uh, they are indeed the backbone of the Australian economy. And the Morrison government has put in place uh, a significant range of support measures to help them through the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, we have an investment of $320 billion across the forward estimates, representing 16.4 per cent of annual GDP. Mr President, as the Minister for Finance has said today, the support is temporary, measured and scalable. And a centrepiece, of course, of this historic support package is our $130 billion JobKeeper payment. Mr President, in the absence of the Morrison government's JobKeeper payment, Treasury estimates that unemployment would have been at least five percentage points higher and would have peaked at around 15 per cent in the September quarter. Mr President, the ATO has now received around 835,000 enrolments from entities that employ over 5.5 million Australians. Money began flowing back to these businesses last week. And, uh, as a government, we are confident that the JobKeeper payment and the ability to maintain that connection between employers and employees will enable those businesses to return with their teams as soon as they are able to. Mr President, in addition to the $130 billion JobKeeper payment, we are also providing much-needed cash flow support to small and medium businesses, with boosts of between $20,000 and up to $100,000 to eligible businesses delivered through credits in the Business Activity Statement system. The measure has gone a long way to improve confidence among our small and medium businesses. Mr President, small and medium businesses are the backbone of the Australian economy and we will continue to support them. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. What actions is the government taking to ensure small businesses can access the cash they need during this time? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And we know that cash flow remains critical, in particular at this time, to small and family businesses. Mr. President, the boosting cash flow measure to date has delivered almost $7.79 billion 
in cash flow to nearly 440,000 businesses. Via this measure, money is going directly into the bank accounts of these small and medium businesses who employ Australians. Mr. President, we're also facilitating greater access to finance through the SME guarantee. This is helping small and medium businesses access much needed funds by providing lenders with a guarantee of 50 per cent of new unsecured loans up to $250,000. Almost $1 billion of loans to small businesses have been approved to date. Again, small and medium businesses, the backbone of the Australian economy, and we will continue to support them. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What steps is the government taking to ensure small and family businesses are able to recover once restrictions are lifted? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as we saw last Friday with the meeting of National Cabinet, we are now on the pathway or the road to recovery through the three step process that has now been implemented by the state and territory governments. We have one goal in 2020, and that is, of course, to protect, in the first instance, the health and the wellbeing of Australians and their livelihoods through what is a global crisis, and to ensure that when the recovery comes, we are well positioned to bounce back strongly on the other side. Mr President, as the Prime Minister has said, the pathway to, be our, to our recovery will be through growing the Australian economy, and you do this by supporting your small and medium businesses who employ nearly 7 million Australians. Mr President, when we came to government, we backed these businesses through lower taxes, cutting red tape and providing incentives for them to invest back into their businesses. And through this crisis, we will continue to support them because they are the backbone of the Order. Australian Senator economy. Cash. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. There are, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Wong and Gallagher. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, all of us in this chamber would acknowledge that right now Australia and the world faces incredible challenges. Coronavirus, tragically, has led to the, death of the, the deaths of 280,000 people worldwide, including 97 here in Australia. And now, as we appear to be emerging from the worst of the health crisis in Australia, we face a significant economic and unemployment challenge. We've seen hundreds of thousands of Australians lose their jobs. We've seen small businesses destroyed. And we've seen particular impacts on, on certain industries, most of all the hospitality industry, which has seen one in three jobs disappear in such a short uh, uh, period of time. Treasury and the Reserve Bank are predicting that unemployment will remain high for the rest of this year. Uh, Deloitte yesterday released, re released a report which said that unemployment won't reach pre-COVID levels until at least 2024. So we're looking at high unemployment, uh, according to Deloitte, for another four years. This week, as we have returned to Parliament, we've heard two very different approaches outlined for how the country should respond to this crisis and how we should approach economic recovery. Yesterday, the federal Labor leader, Mr Albanese, gave a speech which outlined Labor's approach to how we should recover. And what he was saying was that we shouldn't just go back to the, the way things were. We need to build an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We need to build a stronger, fairer economy with a focus on reducing unemployment and underemployment. Sadly, we are seeing a very different approach from the government, and we saw that here again today in question time. Thanks. The approach well, that this government is taking was described by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer recently as one of snapback. They seem to live in this mythical economic world where everything can just snap back to the way things were. That's assuming, of course, that you think that everything was perfect in the first place. They seem to think that we can snap back overnight uh, to a world in which we still had low productivity, high, uh, high unemployment, uh, low economic growth, low business investment wages that were stagnant and high levels of insecure work. That's the kind of world that this government thinks that we can snap back to. And nowhere is this approach more on display at the moment 
with the government's statements around its intentions in relation to the JobKeeper payment. This, of course, was the wage subsidy which this government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to implement uh, against the calls of Labor, uh, the union movement and businesses. They finally got there uh, and, and finally implemented the JobKeeper payment. But the fact that they were opposed to it from day one continues to be on display with early calls from members of this government to start winding it back. That's what snapback means under this government. It means winding back and cutting off the very payments that this government has finally put in place to try to keep this economy alive and to try to keep people in work. We've seen over the last few days reports that the government wants to wind back the JobKeeper payment, and that's before unemployment has even peaked. The reports from the Treasury and the Reserve Bank are, are that we won't hit uh, the maximum rate of unemployment of around 10 per cent until around June this year. So before we've even seen unemployment peak, we've got members of this government who want to start winding back the JobKeeper payment. In fact, there are many businesses across Australia who are yet to even receive JobKeeper payments uh, to reimburse them for payments they've made to their workers. And before the businesses have even started to receive the JobKeeper payment, we've seen members of this government want to start winding it back. Today in question time, uh, Minister Cormann, the finance minister, uh, was asked uh, whether the government was considering a windback. And on the one hand, he tells us that the government isn't considering an early end to the JobKeeper payment, but then he goes on to confirm that it act is actually under review. And it's that second answer which is the most important. What it shows in the fact that this government is already reviewing the JobKeeper payment before it's even been received by some businesses, before unemployment has even peaked, is that the clock is ticking for the JobKeeper payment. The, the clock is ticking and the snapback has begun. The snapback that this government wants to see in place of a return to low wages, uh, higher than average unemployment and low economic growth has actually begun. Jason Falinski, the member for McKellar, today has been reported as saying that he thinks that we should turn off the JobKeeper payment ASAP. As soon as schools go back, then it should go. The snapback has begun. Now, there are many business groups in my home state of Queensland uh, who, want us, who are saying that cutting the JobKeeper payment would be disastrous for the economy. They know that snapback would dis be disastrous. It's about time the Thank government you, did Senator too. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator Seselja. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, can I start by um, outlining, um, I think, in support of uh, the Minister of Finance's statement today uh, to the Senate and indeed the Treasurer's statement uh, to the House. Uh, the significant challenges that this nation uh, is facing uh, at the moment. I think the very strong way that we have responded to those challenges as a nation, uh, this health crisis and this economic crisis, uh, and then uh, to point to the way forward. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, there is no doubt uh, that we faced uh, only a short few weeks ago. Uh, it seems a lot longer, uh, but only a few weeks ago, as the significance of this pandemic uh, became apparent, uh, we faced an unprecedented health and economic crisis. And I think as a nation, we can be very, very proud of how we have responded uh, to that crisis. Uh, when it comes to dealing with the health crisis, uh, through the leadership uh, of the Prime Minister and the Health Minister and the Cabinet, along with it, uh, in, and indeed informing the National Cabinet, uh, we have seen a response that I think is the envy uh, of most of the rest of the world. Uh, you would not want to be uh, in virtually any other country in dealing uh, with this significant challenge uh, than in Australia right now. Uh, but notwithstanding that, uh, it has had a major impact on Australia, even though our relative performance has been much better uh, than most other comparable countries. It has had a health impact, and of course we mourn those who have been lost and, of course, the loved ones who are left behind and those who have suffered and our frontline health workers who have been dealing with that. Uh, but the economic impact has been huge. And as we have dealt with that economic impact, uh, we have sought to do it based on principles uh, and based on values. And as we seek to come out of this economic and health crisis, uh, we will maintain that approach. We will maintain that approach, and I'll, I'll get to uh, briefly the contrast in a moment. Uh, but we have to go back to the starting point of what we had, and what we heard there from Senator Watt, and what we've heard from the Labor Party uh, generally in their criticism is this big lie 
uh, and it is a big lie, uh, where they claim that the Australian economy was not doing well, was not strong going into this crisis. Uh, that is not true. That, is, that was not the view of the Reserve Bank. That was not the, re the view of the IMF. You know, we just had Senator Watt uh, saying, well, we had high unemployment. Uh, well, it was 5.1 per cent going into this crisis. 5.1 per cent, and we saw economic growth ticking up. Uh, we saw expected economic growth in 2020 and 2021 being higher than virtually every other G7 economy. So this big lie that the Labor Party looks to retail to try and make a political point during this crisis that our economy was weak is wrong. Uh, we were strengthening our economy uh, based on our policies. Uh, we were strengthening our budget. And isn't it a great thing that we went into this crisis uh, with a budgetary position which is far better, vastly better than virtually every other comparable nation, uh, with a debt to GDP ratio a quarter of what we see in places like the United States and the UK and about a seventh in places like Japan? Uh, that's no thanks to the Labor Party. Uh, we inherited a $48 billion deficit and we brought the budget back into balance. We saw unemployment coming down with 1.5 million jobs being created. Uh, so that track record holds us in good stead. Uh, but, Deputy President, these are great and challenging times. Uh, and as a government, we are working with the Australian people, we are working with state and territory governments to deliver for the Australian people. Uh, our absolute focus is on keeping Australians safe during this health crisis and in protecting their livelihoods. And as we open up uh, our society again, we want to open up our economy as, as soon as it is safe to do so. Now, we hear the alternative approaches from the Labor Party. They want to permanently put government at the centre of our national life. We heard it again from the Shadow Finance Minister today when she was critical of policies like cutting taxes. The shadow finance minister critical of policies like cutting taxes. Well, as we come out of this, I think Australians can take great comfort from the way we have handled this crisis to date. And as we continue to work together, uh, we can bring our economy back to where it needs to be. It's not going to happen by government continuing to be at the centre of things. It's going to be small and medium and large enterprises getting on, creating jobs on behalf of all Australians. Those are the policies Thank we're going to continue to pursue as we recover. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. We have uh, Senator Sheldon, if you come to the lectern. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, uh, President. Well, first of all, isn't that an extraordinary uh, description of what's happened in the economy pre-COVID-19? Here's the party, here's the government that doubled the debt. But also, let's just look at today. We've got a budget. You know, this is normally budget day, but we've got no budget. But we've also got a government without a plan, without a plan on what we do moving out of this COVID-19 period. But don't worry. It's probably a little bit unfair to say they don't have a plan. They have a plan to snap back to no plan. That's their strategy. Let's snap back to no plan. In actual fact, in the case of a number of their uh, backbenchers and others within their, on their side, they have a plan to snap back real quickly to no plan. In actual fact, in the case of underemployment, let's look, back, look at what we'd be snapping back to. Pre-COVID-19, Australia had 1.23 million workers wanting more hours than they were getting—8.7 per cent of the workforce. Even before COVID-19 layoffs, the headline unemployment rate in Australia sat at 5.3 per cent, the number of people who either can't get a job or can't get the hours they want spiked under the Morrison government to 13.8 per cent. Snap back. They want to snap back, and I'll give you an example, a survey by the Transport Workers Union of Jetstar workers, where 90 per cent of Jetstar workers want more hours. Not only is Jetstar refusing to guarantee workers' hours in future arrangements, but their agreement also restricts workers from getting another job in aviation. Snapback. Let's look at other snapback strategies that this government's got. Underemployment. Snapback. Wage theft. What's the plan? Billions of dollars taken out of our economy, and that's their snapback plan. We see people having their money stolen. We see superannuation theft. We see companies that have been unfairly competed with 
that are doing the right thing, abiding by the law, but they want to snap back. In actual fact, they want to snap back a bit further, because in the case of the gig economy, except for probably Senator Bragg, not many people would have picked this up. But there was a decision made by the Fair Work Commission, rightly looking at the laws, which is going to be challenged in the High Court, about what rights people have in the new economy, in the gig economy. It actually made a decision that many workers in the gig economy, particularly in Uber, would not have any rights, and particularly in the case that was taken forward for the Gupta family, Amita and Santosh, who were taking, doing some work to support the dis uh, disability pension that they were on. They wanted the right of reinstatement after being victimised, they felt, by the company. Now, what does a gig economy look like? In the case of these workers, they're averaging $7.85 an hour, half the minimum wage. Snap back. That's what this government wants to see. Snap back, not just to pre-COVID-19, but snap back in the case of the gig economy, the sort of practices that were happening with piecework in the 1800s. When they snap back, they snap way back. And of course, snap back when it comes to New Start, $40 a day. How could you possibly see that anybody would have the capacity to turn around and survive on that sort of income? Snap back. But let's look at the consequences of the last recession, major recession that we had in 1990-91, where the Secretary Treasury, uh, the Treasury Secretary Stephen Kennedy made the comment, whilst he's been cross-examined, cross-questioned uh, at uh, a Senate hearing that in 1990-91 recession, almost 1.2 million Australians had manufacturing jobs. More than 100,000 jobs were lost from that sector in a two-year period. And of course, despite a larger economy and workforce, the number of manufacturing workers today is 25 per cent below the pre-1991 peak. Snap back. We have to have a plan. We have to have a plan about how we actually move this economy forward how we deal with a new economy, how we deal with the consequences of COVID-19 and, the, and the, uh, the consequences, economic consequences that we're facing, and make some decisions about how we actually not snap off our economy, but actually turn it around and make it work for us. It's critically important whether you're in suffering from wage theft, in the gig economy, Thank or in the you, manufacturing Senator sector. Sheldon, your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, before I, I get to uh, uh, the substance of my contribution, taking note on the, uh, on the questions asked by the opposition today, I, I too would like to commend uh, the government, but all governments around Australia, indeed the, uh, the entire Australian people, for how they have responded, uh, combined and acted uh, over the past uh, two months. Uh, uh, it's perhaps becoming too easy to forget that uh, two months or so ago when we left this place and basically suspended at least normal operations of the parliament, uh, uh, we had our cases growing at uh, well above 20 per cent a day. It was very much on an exponential growth path, and if that had continued, uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians would have been infected. Thousands more would have died, unfortunately, if we'd continued on that path. Uh, it has been a remarkable turnaround. Uh, uh, it has been at least in part testament to the strong response of the Australian people and the combined and consistent actions of Australian governments, uh, this one here in Canberra but also right around the country. Uh, I think um, at least I, I take some heart today that in, in, the, in the, the only way possible for an opposition to do that they too paid some credit to the government for its actions over the past couple of months. Uh, 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 there's very little indeed. I, I didn't really pick up any criticism uh, in question time of what the government has done uh, over the past uh, two months in response to this global pandemic. The substance of the uh, opposition's points today were all about what we might do, that they, what, we might, what they fear we might do in the future. Uh, there was very, very little, if nothing, about what has actually been done. And I do take some heart from the fact that I know an opposition can't come into question time and, 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 and put up Dorothy Dix's and, and suggest what a great job 
uh, the government has done that would in fact be uh, perhaps a, uh, a, 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 an incorrect application of the tools here for us as senators, where, where he, you're, the opposition is there to, to hold the government to account. So it, it can't just come in here and, and, and uh, provide bouquets to, I think, a government that has done a, a pretty good job in the Australian public spec. So I understand that. But let's be clear what the opposition has put forward today is only criticisms of what might some hypothetical in the future government do. So the contributions we've just heard are all about uh, how and when, maybe if uh, this, the JobKeeper program is, is changed or, or amended, uh, how, if or what happens uh, to, uh, to the withdrawals and drawdowns uh, on, on superannuation. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, critiques of future actions that have not happened uh, don't carry all that much weight, but they carry even little weight, little weight here because they are caricatures of future decisions that a government might take. In the Labor Party's mind, we over here on this side are all cigar chomping, uh, 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 big business loving, uh, 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 cashed up senators. That's their, that's their caricature of us. And, and you can see in their, in their nightmarish uh, Labor-centred vision of the future that that's where they think things will be going. Well, I think that it's clearly a caricature and clearly demonstrated to be a caricature by the actions of this government the last couple of months. Uh, we have taken action to support workers, enormous action. We were criticised a few months ago for being, uh, being enslaved to a, uh, uh, to a rock-solid commitment to a budget surplus. Obviously, we weren't enslaved to such a commitment because when action was required, when we had to uh, respond uh, to help and assist thousands of Australians, we did that very thing. And we ditched what was, yes, a very important commitment of ours, what was something we worked very hard to achieve to put this nation back into surplus, but it had to be ditched for the greater good, and we showed ourselves uh, with the pragmatism to do that. Now, how we've acted in the last couple of months is exactly how we'll act in the months ahead. The government will be pragmatic. It will be sensible. Uh, it will respond to the needs uh, and concerns of average Australian citizens. Uh, and of course, we will seek to manage uh, the money that ultimately is other people's, that is Australians, that has to be repaid as carefully as possible. Because in terms of the future, which today's question time is focused on, in terms of the future, the question that will have to be asked is, is which, which government, which side of politics do the Australian people trust to get people back to work, uh, to restart this economy? Because we cannot continue to subsidise the, the wages of millions of Australians day in, day out. Uh, we cannot continue to, to double welfare payments on an unending basis. We will have to get Australians back to work, and the question that the Australian people will ask is who is the best to be trusted uh, to unlock business, to get people employed and get our country back onto the strong track it was on before Thank you, Senator Canavan. Your time has expired, and we have Senator Walsh up at the lectern. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy President. And we ask questions today about the government's plans to uh, snap back the JobKeeper program uh, as calls from their backbench grow to snap back and cut back vital support to the Australian people. Uh, and of course, this is a program that the union movement and the Labor Party advocated for and pushed the government to adopt. Uh, and this is a program that the backbench Liberals, the ideologues in the Liberal Party, can't wait to get rid of. They are desperate to snap back the government's support. They are desperate to let the markets rip again. And they are desperate to do this just at the time when Australians need their government to back them up the most. And with even the Reserve Bank now projecting unemployment to reach 10 per cent in just a couple of months, it is a good thing, a very good thing, that Labor and the unions advocated for this wage subsidy program. Because right now, today, a third of people have lost their jobs in the hospitality sector alone. And there is no one in hospitality, be they hospitality workers or hospitality employers, who think that that sector is going to snap back any time soon. And there is no one in hospitality, be they workers or be they small businesses, who think that we can snap back the JobKeeper program in September or even earlier, as the ideologues on the Liberals' backbench are now arguing for. 
Uh, and there is no one in the hard-hit arts sector either that think that that sector can snap back straight away and that we can snap back JobKeeper programs in sectors that have been hard hit by this coronavirus crisis. It is going to take time and it is going to take a plan for these sectors to recover. And of course, having sectors like this continue to struggle is not just bad for the workers and for the businesses in those sectors, it is bad for the whole economy. An economy that was already struggling under the plans or lack thereof of this government. Uh, and this week, Deloitte Access Economics also warned against a snapback strategy. They highlighted how important it is for our recovery that there is ongoing support for workers, for vulnerable Australians and for the broader economy. They warned against the quick withdrawal of support programs like JobKeeper and also the JobSeeker program. Because if these programs were withdrawn overnight, we know that we will see hundreds of thousands of Australians moving on to Newstart, a payment that is so low that it actively impedes people's ability to find employment. So we have to ask today, is the government's plan to snap back to New Start, the old New Start rate of $40 a day, is that really the government's plan for workers in Australia today? And is that the plan for our country today? The government has the opportunity and they need to take a new approach. Their old approach, which they are desperate to snap back to, meant that we actually entered this crisis from a position of economic weakness, not one of strength. So let's not snap back to the lowest wage growth on record. Let's not snap back to an explosion of insecure jobs, of casual jobs, of gig jobs. And let's not snap back to our manufacturing jobs continually being offshored. And let's not snap back to sluggish and weak economic growth. Uh, and let's not snap back to unlivable social security payments. The Prime Minister told us when launching the JobKeeper program that we're all in this together. Well, right now, that couldn't be further from the truth. We are not. People are doing it tough. Millions are going without the support that they need already and they need a government that will stay the course with them. They need hope for a better future. This government doesn't have a long-term plan for our recovery from this crisis. It didn't have a plan for growth and good jobs before this crisis. And if its only plan is to snap back now, then it doesn't have the plan for the future that all Australians need. Oh, thank you, Senator. The question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you. I take note of Minister Rustin's answers uh, to answers to the questions that I asked about the job seeker payment and whether the whether forty dollars a day for somebody on job seeker payment is uh, decent or fair. And it's quite answer it's quite obvious that the government has in fact snapped back. They've snapped back to their old rhetoric that you can live on $40 a day because most people get other payments. The, the payment that most people get is the energy supplement. Wait for it, folks. A whole $8.80 a fortnight, which is around, what, 65 cents a day. So for $41 a day, to be correct. Can people live on that? No, they can't. Is, is it decent and fair? No, it isn't. In answer to my question, which was about, well, will all those 1.4 million people who are currently now receiving job, keep, job seeker at that much higher rate, thank goodness, would they be employed in September? Well, quite obviously the answer is no. No, the minister didn't actually say that because she wouldn't actually commit. She told us what the government might try and do to try and get people into work, which is all very well and good. But I'm sure the government knows just as well as we do on this side of the chamber that there is no way that on the 25th of September that all those 1.4 million, that's assuming that the government doesn't muck around with JobKeeper and more people fall out of employment, 
and, and add to the growing list of the unemployed that there's not more people there. But we will certainly have a large, large number of people, likely over a million people, still on the job seeker payment come the 25th of September. And what are those going to, people going to do? Going to try and survive on $40 a day. And when I asked about whether the government intends taking that payment back to $40 a day, I didn't get a straight answer. But my assumption is yes, that's what they're going to do. Even though I'm not saying that's what the words that were in, that's what the minister said, but it was very obvious from the way the minister answered the question is the government wants to drop job seeker payment back to $40 a day. $40 a day is way below the poverty line. Way below the poverty line. So we know very well that people are living in poverty. And we know the government knows that because they actually did increase job seeker payments. They did include a supplement. And oh, by the way, that supplement gets paid along with people's CRA, their, their rent assistance, along with the energy supplement, and along with the family tax benefit. So the people that were trying to survive on that $40 a day, plus, as the government keeps pointing out, some, some of them get some of those additional payments. They are a, still living in poverty and b, they're still getting those with the supplement, as they should. I'm not arguing for a second that they shouldn't. What I'm arguing is that the government needs to acknowledge that we are not going to snap back in September, that people will still, a large number of Australians, will still be trying to survive on a measly, if it goes back to $40 a day, or $41 a day if you include the energy supplement, on $41 a day. And the government knows you can't survive on that. They know you can't because they doubled the payment, quite rightly so, and I'm very pleased that they did. They saw that people weren't going to be able to survive. They saw when that up to well, the prediction that we heard in the COVID inquiry uh, on the 30th of April was that the estimates the Treasury working on were 1.7 million Australians were likely to be, or potentially um, going to be, um, on job seeker payment come the end of September. So the government quite rightly, and we congratulated the government for making sure that people that were living on the job seeker payment could survive. But let's not pretend that even that supplement is anywhere near because it's not the medium wage. So people are still, still yep. harding it fine to make ends meet, even on that payment, but at least they're not living in poverty. They are living above the poverty line, which is what we should be seeing in this country. We don't want to see people living in poverty. We should not be dropping people down to 40 or $41 a day for those that are pedantic. We should be making sure we retain the rate. We need to be making sure that people are living with in decency and fairness. The government's own words, decency and fairness. Now that's what our safety net should be providing, decency and fairness, so we need to retain the rate. We need to keep that payment, the job seeker payment and youth allowance with the extra supplement at the rates that they are at so that people aren't dropped back into poverty when they are trying to find work, making it even harder to find work. Because it's been proved beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt that living in poverty is Order, in itself Senator a barrier Seawitt. to work. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Theravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to notice given on 8 April 2020, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for tomorrow, proposing the disallowance of the Taxation Administration Private Ancillary Fund Guidelines 2019. Thank you, Senator Theravanti Wells. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Oh, Senator Seawitt, sorry. Um, Mr President, I withdraw general business notice of motion number 522 standing in my name for today. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Rustin. Um, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Mr President. I give notice that on the next sitting day I shall move that the provisions of paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. The Age Care Legislation's Emergency Leave Bill 2020, Export Control Legislation Amendment Certification of Narcotic Exports Bill 2020, 
National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Governance and Other Matters Bill 2020, Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020 and Superannuation Amendment PSSAP Membership Bill 2020. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated yes. in Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Sorry, Senator Smith, it's been a while, so even I'm getting a bit rusty. I failed to call the clerk to not notify postponements and extensions. The clerk. Mr President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notice number one for today postponed to the tomorrow. General business notice of motion number 254 for today postponed until three sitting days after today. And uh, business of the uh, Senate General Business Notice of Motion number 361 listed for tomorrow, postponed to the first sitting day in September 2020. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for the 12th to the 14th of May 2020 for personal reasons, Senator Dunham, Senator McLaughlin and Senator Molan. Cool. The question is that motion moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I move that leave of absence be granted for personal reasons to Senator O'Neill for today and for the following senators from the 12th to the 14th of May 2020 for personal reasons. Senators Brown, Dodson, Green, Polly and Stirl. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Steele John from the 12th to the 14th of May um, 2020 for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, there being no other matters. And I'm going to commence with motion number 526 at the request of some senators. And I will call Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Unless, uh, anyone unless anyone objects, I generally try and accommodate the needs of party leaders and, and whips. So, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Mr President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 526, standing on my name for today relating to Collins class submarines, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Mr President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to amend Gen General Business Notice of Motion 526, uh, standing in the name of Senator Patrick. Is leave moved? Can leave granted to move an amendment? Um, all right, so it's being circulated now. Are people happy if it is circulated now? Um, or are we going to deny leave uh, and then move to a potential debate on suspension? Senator Patrick, I'll give you the call. Mr President, the motion has been on the notice paper since February to have a last-minute amendment uh, on just denying leave. OK. Leave is denied. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving the amendment to the motion. Question. This debate, this motion is no longer subject to debate. It is immediately put to the Senate. So I'll put the motion to suspend standing orders to the extent that it allows Senator Cormann to move an amendment to the motion moved by Senator Patrick. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required? Yes. Division required. Ring the bells. I remind senators that they, they have the ability to avoid the need for divisions by recording party votes in the, hand, in the journals through the process adopted last time, but absent a senator doing that, we will move to the division. So with the leave of the Senate, can we cancel the division?
Division cancelled. Senator Patrick, do I take it that you would like your vote? And um, I'll look to Senator Griff next year if he's in the same position he is, recorded as voting against the motion. Is anyone else? All right. So those two votes are recorded as against the motion. Senator Cormann now can move his amendment to your motion. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. I move the amendment as circulated in the chamber. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Patrick. Mr. There's... President, I withdraw the motion. Yeah. Um, so with the, you, because we've proceeded to it and the motion has been moved, you now need leave to withdraw the motion. It's in the possession of the Senate, so to speak, Senator Patrick. President, I seek leave to withdraw the motion. Um, leave is not granted. Um, I now must put the amendment. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Cormann to the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Um, Senator Patrick, are you rising on a point of order? Uh, I'd li I'd like to, uh, I seek leave to make a one minute statement. Uh, can I ask Senator Patrick that I put the amendment and then you seek leave because with the division the amendments before the chamber. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it, so the amendment to the motion is passed and it is therefore adopted. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Just so everyone's clear, people who are watching this are clear as to what is going on here. I put a motion to the Senate recognising the great work that has been done down in Adelaide uh, in the sustainment of Collins-class submarines uh, uh, and asking the Senate to agree that uh, that work should stay in South Australia, where the expertise is, and indeed to avoid a billion-dollar cost, which we can simply no longer afford uh, in the face of uh, what has just happened to this nation. Uh, what's happening here is neither Labor nor Liberal want to uh, uh, put a position. Uh, they don't want to, uh, to recognise that that is the best place for this to happen. Uh, the government. Uh, uh, senators, we know last time uh, were not in the chamber for the vote. Uh, same with the uh, with Labor uh, the last time around. This is just a stunt to avoid uh, making a commit to South Australians. Order. I'll go to Senator Cormann, then come to you, Senator Roberts. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, no nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the work that is being done by the uh, workforce in relation to Collins class uh, submarine sustainment is very important, and the workforce is doing a great job. But there is a process underway, which is uh, a matter of public record, uh, of assessing the uh, uh, optimal future configuration of the uh, submarine sustainment effort in the context of our transition from Collins class submarines to attack class submarines. Uh, that will be a decision made uh, in the national interest. Uh, this is, I mean, cl clearly um, Senator, Senator Patrick has moved this initial motion knowing that no decision has been made. He knows that the decision will be made based uh, on an assessment of the national interest. He knows that these decisions will not be made by a Senate motion, and that is why the government has uh, moved this amendment, which the Senate has unanimously supported, which recognises the demonstrated skills and expertise of the existing Collins class submarine uh, sustainment Order. workforce, Senator and Cormann. of course a number of Time other matters. The statement has expired. Senator Roberts. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. One minute. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. We supported the original motion. The current sustainment model that supports the Collins class submarines works well in South Australia and it is not warranted to move this to Western Australia. Of greater significance is the absurdly expensive contract that the government signed to purchase 12 new submarines over the next 20 years. The current cost of building them with all peripherals is now around $200 billion. $200 billion. Has this government gone mad? In the middle of this pandemic, we cannot afford to proceed with this contract. This money will be far better spent to support the Australian recovery from the economic pit that is caused by this pandemic. By the time these submarines are delivered, they will be obsolete, a complete waste of money that would be far better spent elsewhere. The cost of $400 million to cancel this contract is a pittance compared with proceeding. We need to dump this new subs contract. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Patrick as amended by the Senate be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we go to matter number 523, Senator Waters, in your name? 
Thank you very much, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 523, standing in my name for today, proposing an order for the production of documents concerning Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines, continuing order, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. As you foreshadowed in your earlier statement today, and in lieu of calling a division, uh, I ask that all coalition senators be recorded as having voted against uh, the notice of motion 523. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Keneally's motion number 527. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the chamber that Senators Ciccone, Walsh and Sheldon will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 527 standing the names of Senators Keneally, Chacon, Walsh and Sheldon for today relating to migration be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator McKim, and I'll come to you next, Senator Rustin. Senator McKim was on his feet first. Senator, uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Le is leave granted for a one-minute statement? Leave is not granted. Not uh, leave is not granted. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the hands of the chamber. Um, I'm going to move to vote, putting the motion. On that basis, the question is, Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, um, Senator Rustin. Um, the question is that motion number 527 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. You, Mr. President, as you foreshadowed in your statement earlier today, and in lieu of calling a division, I ask that coalition senators be recorded as having voted against notice of motion number 527. Sorry, that's quite correct. I should have actually declared it as the ayes have it before I did. I uh, thought I did, but the, the ayes have it, um, and we take the statement by Senator Smith on behalf of coalition senators. We're all getting used to the new practices. Senator Faruqi, motion number 528, matter number 528. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 528, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the following bill to be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. I present the bill the and question. move. Sorry. I'll just put the first reading oh, question sorry. first. Senator Faruqi, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Give me an aye. The, the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. For an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Seawitt, matter number 529. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 5299, standing in my name for today, relating to survivors of child sexual abuse, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. Move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The government is committed to the implementation of recommendations made by the Royal Commission. It must be noted, however, by the Senate that many recommendations deal with redress and acceptance requires agreement of the Minister's Redress Governance Board, made up of responsible ministers from Commonwealth states and territories. The government acknowledges the courage of survivors and victims of institutional child sexual abuse, as well as their families and their supporters. Senator Grip. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Alliance supports this motion and wants it noted that survivors of institutional child sexual abuse are waiting too long for redress scheme payments. The government has acknowledged that some survivors have died before receiving financial compensation. This is a travesty. 
The latest data, as of the 24th of April, shows there are 526 survivors waiting to have their claims processed because named institutions have not yet joined the scheme, despite the scheme commencing over two years ago. Institutions that are stalling or refusing to join the scheme are compounding the severe trauma of survivors who need resolutions so they can continue their path to healing. Those institutions who fail to join deserve to be named and shamed, and the clock is ticking. The question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, matter number 530 in the name of Senators Wish Wilson and Waters. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Mr. President. I set general business notice of motion number 530, sending my name and the name of Senator Waters for today relating to the Great Barrier Reef to be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. Mr. President, I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government accepts the science of climate change and the troubling outlook for coral reefs globally, including the Great Barrier Reef. Australia is one of a handful of nations to have comprehensively beaten our Kyoto era targets. The latest mass coral breaching event on the Great Barrier Reef underlines the importance of our concerted global action under the Paris Agreement and the government's $1.9 billion investment guided by the Reef 2050 plan to protect this World Heritage property. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Le leave is granted for one minute. One, thank you, Mr. President. One nation opposes this motion. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest single structure made by living organisms. The current reef is between 6,000 to 8,000 years of age. It stretches over an area of approximately 344,000 square kilometres. Our understanding of its history and its ebbs and flows over thousands of years is in its infancy. Claims that the reef is dead due to a natural atmospheric trace gas are a lie. Coral bleaching events are natural and reoccurring events that are the result of a temporary increase or decrease in ocean temperature and a lack of wind to mix the ocean waters, sometimes compounded with low sea levels. As with things natural, after bleaching, the reef immediately starts to repair itself. The greatest threat to our Great Barrier Reef is activists and ignorant, uncaring politicians falsely using it as a poster child because that leads to underfunding of real environmental programs like eradicating the crown of thorn starfish. I remind the Greens that it is day 246. Order, Senator Roberts. The question is the motion moved by Senator, Senators Wish Wilson and Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. That uh, Senator Roberts. To be have my name recorded as opposing it. Thank you. So recorded. That concludes the discovery of formal business, Senators. Oh, sorry. Have I missed one? Um, oh, my apologies, Senator Faruqi. Um, I accidentally crossed it out. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 525, standing in my name for today, relating to the tertiary education system, before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Right. Is leave granted? Senator Faruqi too. It is granted. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator, oh, Senator Roberts, are you objecting to the motion being no, taken? No, sorry. Right. Senator Faruqi, there Mr. being President, none. Mr. President, I move the motion as amended. Senator Rustin. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Morrison government is providing record funding to Australia's universities of $18.2 billion in 2020, with funding set to grow each year in line with population growth under performance-based funding. International students arriving in Australia are required to support themselves for their first year as a condition of their student visa. Well, those here are, um, for longer can access their superannuation like other Australians facing financial difficulties. $200 million has been provided to charities and community groups to support those in need, including international students. Universities, together with states and territories, have established hardship funds and other supports. Australia's universities are autonomous institutions governed by university councils. Reporting of liquidity across the sector as of 31 December 2018 showed total cash and investments of $20.3 billion. Universities are eligible for JobKeeper if they meet the relevant criteria. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation opposes this motion. We are concerned that everyday Australians who are doing it tough right now may have to bail out the universities that have become dependent on foreign students. These universities expose us to significant financial risk when they va spend vast amounts of our money that have on overseas students to create more revenue for them. So where was their detailed business case and their risk analysis? If government did a utilisation study on these campuses before approving more building, they would find that their existing buildings are underused. 
and universities should not be in the accommodation business. James Cook University has just tended to develop student accommodation at a time when I found 216 vacant rental properties in Townsville today. James Cook University should give us our money back. We value their research and teaching, but they must act professionally. If the universities were serious, then they would lead by example and cut the million-dollar-plus vice-chancellor salaries. Why won't they? Because they lack accountability. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, leave is not granted, Senator on Gallagher. On your indulgence. Sorry, leave is not granted to make a statement. Uh, you, you can move suspension of standing orders to the extent, uh, if you have a, uh, to the extent that would allow you to make a statement for one minute, and I will put that to a vote without debate. So you're moving so much of standing orders be suspended that would allow you to make a statement of one minute. I will then put that motion. They are put without debate. Those who support the motion to suspend standing orders to allow Senator Gallagher to make a statement of one minute say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I'll put that again because I do need some indication. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Ayes have it. The ayes have it. So Senator Gallagher is entitled to make a statement of one minute. Thank you. Thank you. And I make this statement because originally one-minute statements were used to explain a voting position, not to debate the motion, um, which is why leave has not been granted. Which is why leave hasn't been granted in the past when it's to debate motions. The one-minute statements for, for explaining voting position. Labor will be opposing this motion because important facts in the motion aren't true. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Frugge as amended be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. That does conclude the discovery of formal business, unless I've missed another one. Thank you, Senators. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator Steelejohn. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The new rate of job seeker payment and youth allowance should be retained so that no one lives in poverty and we continue to stimulate the economy. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to uh, kick off the debate on this very, very important issue. The fact is, is that nobody in our community should be living in poverty. The fact is, no one on income support should be living in poverty and condemned to live in poverty. But the terrible fact is, is that many, many people are living in poverty in this country, and particularly those that were trying to survive on the former rate of the old New Start, now job seeker, payment of just $40 a day. The government knows that the old job seeker rate, stroke New Start, is below the poverty rate, the poverty line. The fact that they moved so quickly, and as, of, as I have already articulated, we were strongly supportive of them moving quickly to double the job seeker rate, shows very clearly that they knew that people cannot survive on $40 a day, which was the old rate of New Start. If job seeker drops below $40 a day, or, uh, or with the energy supplement, $41, less than $41 a day, at the end of September, the government will be condemning over a million people, most likely, who will still be unable to find work, due to no fault of their own, as the government pointed out earlier. They will be potentially condemning over a million people, a million Australians, to living in poverty. I can tell you now that $40 a day does not provide an adequate standard of living. But you don't just have to take it from me. Take it from the hundreds of people that submitted to the Senate inquiry into the adequacy of Newstart, which was tabled, the report of which was tabled on the 30th of April. 
They told us about the daily dilemmas of how to cover the basic costs of essentials despite rigorous and careful budgeting. The new rate of job seeker with the supplement being paid at $557 a week is well below the average minimum wage of $740 a week. Even with the supplement, Anglicare found that only 1.5 per cent of properties were affordable for someone on JobSeeker. That's through their annual uh, survey of rental affordabilities. This demonstrates that the new rate of payment will not act as a disincentive to work, um, but it will help pe keep people living, uh, not living in poverty. In contrast, it will allow people to better meet the daily costs of living while looking for work. How is the government going to manage the social and economic costs of poverty come September? When government MPs start to talk about budget constraints around job seeker, they fail to take into account the devastating cost of poverty. On the old rate of poverty, those people that uh, very bravely told us their accounts of what it's like to live on the old new start rate to the, Sen to the Senate inquiry told us of going hungry of skipping meals, particularly parents skipping meals so they could feed their children. People couldn't pay for their medications. Some were on multiple medications. So even with P the, the, the uh, health care card and the lower rates of medications, people were still missing, medica missing uh, skipping taking their medications because they couldn't afford them. They couldn't afford to keep the heating on during winter. They talked of sitting with blankets around them, going to bed early and turning off the lights. They can't cover their rent or their mortgage payments when you're trying to survive on $40 a day. It is, quite frankly, impossible. You do not and you cannot look after your mental and physical well-being. You can't address your mental health issues when you're surviving on $40 a day. The more it continues, the more poverty becomes a barrier. It becomes a barrier to work. And poverty, of course, is one of the social determinants of health. Increased rates of poverty in Australia means more people are relying on charities for support, more pressure on our health systems, more and more people will be stuck on income support long term. Previous modelling undertaken by NATSEM found that if Australia adopted huge rec uh, the sorry, World Health Organisation's recommendations to tackle the social determinants of health, it could, it could potentially support extra Australians into work. And it was done some time ago, so the figures uh, will be higher now, but it was at the time 170,000 Australians into work. It could save $4 billion each year in income support. See around 60,000 fewer Australians admitted to hospital annually and result in 5.5 million fewer Medicare services each year. So people not living in poverty, not only does it help their own well-being, it helps the well-being of the nation. Retaining the rate of job, start, uh, sorry, of job seeker and youth allowance will not only stop the devastating impacts of poverty, it will also help stimulate the economy. In 2018, Deloitte's Access Economics found that raising New Start, by then it was 75, um, they did the modelling on $75 a week, but, just, but that would help stimulate the economy by $3.3 billion in consumer spending. It would also create 12,000 jobs, and particularly those jobs would help regional Australia. Lower and middle income households are likely to spend the extra, every cent of the extra money they receive, especially um, if they have um, been living um, on the $40 a day. That supplement is being spent and very much appreciated. The coronavirus cash payments to households, the $750 uh, payments and the supplements, have had a, a significant stimulus effect. We've seen already the uptick, the uptick in consumer spending just with the payment of the $750. We know that when you're on a low income, you spend the money. Um, you spend it and that stimulates the economy. The ANU Centre for Social Research and, Me and Methods recently found that those on low incomes are less 
likely to be finding it difficult or very difficult to cope on their incomes due to the corona stimulus payments. We saw the benefits of the stimulus package, as I said, in the uptick in consumer spending. It is not surprising that increases in income support help boost the economy and consumer confidence. Many Australians have little to no savings and struggle to pay bills and rent. Last year, Deloitte's found that half of Australia's population ha don't have any emergency funds to fall back on in a personal financial crisis. Today, the Minister for, not for Finance said that the economic stimulus introduced by the government also not only had uh, financial benefits but also provide a psychological boost, an economic lifeline to people in their hour of need. Well, the hour of need is going to continue after September. It is not suddenly going to just bloom roses for everybody. Unfortunately, not all those people that have become unemployed are going to be able to find work come the 25th of September. The reality is people are still going to need payments to survive on. They're going to need a decent and fair social security safety net, just like the Treasurer and Senator Cormann, the Minister for, not for Finance, pointed out today that our social safety net needs to be underpinned by decency and fairness. Dropping people on to $40 a day come the 25th of September is not decent and it is grossly unfair. It is not fair. The inadequate rates of income support payments are, have harmful effects on people's physical and mental health. Therefore, dropping people onto an unfair payment will have devastating in and harmful impacts on people's physical and mental health. It was only last week that new modelling demonstrated, unfortunately, poor uh, Australians' poor mental health and raised very deep concerns about the potential suicide rate in this country. We need to be making sure we are looking after people's well-being, that we're looking after people's mental well-being. The impact of dropping people onto very unfair payments of $40 a day will have devastating impacts on people's, in people's physical and mental well-being. If the government is serious about doing whatever it takes to stimulate, to stimulate the economy and doing whatever it takes to protect people from the devastating impacts of a recession, they must, they simply must retain the rate of job seeker payment and youth allowance, create a decent and fair social safety net for this country, which includes making sure people are no longer condemned to live in poverty on income support. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Let's be very clear. The use of this current crisis, with its unprecedented health and economic challenges, should not be an opportunity for the Greens to propose irresponsible acts of economic vandalism. The federal government takes its responsibility to the taxpayer seriously. They expect us to use their funds sensibly, and we're working hard to provide new ways to stimulate the economy, not through higher taxes or via a living wage, but by getting people back to work. Our approach remains that we will invest in our economy in ways that will stimulate jobs for Australians. And whilst we have also funded a short-term lifeline to those workers that have been stood down, we will not be bankrupting our country with a welfare-for-all approach. We already have reports of workers rejecting opportunities to work casual shifts because, in some cases, job seeker payments are more lucrative. So in response to the reckless calls for a living wage, I'd say this. Our country has weathered the COVID-19 storm better than any other affected nation. We've achieved that by applying careful, deliberate and sensible measures to the health crisis. And we're approaching the reignition of our economy with the same principles. We will ensure that we experience a similarly measured and steady economic recovery. And we're not forgetting those in need. About one third of the Commonwealth's budget is spent on welfare. Accordingly, government has a responsibility to taxpayers to ensure that welfare is targeted and sustainable. And our approach to social welfare in Australia has been far from cavalier. 
Few countries have provided the strong safety net that we enjoy, and Australia has one of the most targeted welfare systems in the world. It's been caring and focused on those who need it most. Job seeker and youth allowance payments are taxpayer funded and they provide a safety net for people while they search for a job. Unlike other countries, they're not linked to the recipient's contributions. They're increased twice a year, every year, in line with CPI. The job seeker payment is a temporary transitional support with close to two thirds of recipients expected to ex exit the payment system within a year. Almost every Australian who receives JobSeeker also receives supplementary payments on top of that base rate. Supple supplementary payments ensure that our system is targeted to those most at need. So if you have specific circumstances that require extra support, then that's available. For example, if you have children, you'll likely receive family tax benefits both A and B. The government also provides rent assistance, which is paid at up to $185 a fortnight to help cover the costs of housing. Additionally, there's also the energy supplement, utility allowance, telephone allowance, carer allowance, and the list goes on. So it's important to note that the job seeker payment is not the only payment or support that job seekers receive. It's part of a broader, flexible social security system comprising of payments, services, concessions, childcare, housing and employment services and associated programs. The Morrison-led government is also supercharging our safety net to provide additional support to Australians throughout this extraordinary period for those Australians doing it tough. We've instituted temporary measures to support individuals, families and businesses affected by the coronavirus. Those measures will also serve to boost confidence and domestic demand within our economy. Further help includes a coronavirus supplement of $550 per fortnight, two $750 economic support payments to existing payment recipients and concession card holders, expanding eligibility and qualification for payments, making crisis payments available for people who need to self-isolate at home, and a reduction in the partner income test taper rate. These temporary measures will be in place until September of this year. The safety net provided for the most vulnerable among us is particularly important and why the system must remain robust. Clearly, social security and welfare expenditure is a large and important component of Commonwealth spending. Changes to the policy settings will only be carefully considered with regard to budget sustainability. The Morrison government is focused on growing the economy getting more people into work and delivering well-targeted social security funded through a strong budget. That's why we've acted to support households and businesses and to address the significant economic consequences of the coronavirus. Our economic response totals $320 billion over the next four years to 2023-24 and will protect the economy by maintaining confidence, supporting investment and keeping people in jobs. And there has been no change in the government's view about the broader role of Australia's social security safety net. It should be remembered that prior to the coronavirus crisis, we saw the proportion of working aged Australians relying on welfare payments down to their lowest levels in more than 30 years, at just 13.5 per cent. And unemployment was down to 5.1 per cent with more than 1.5 million jobs created. This is clear evidence that our welfare strategy net, coupled with our economic strategy, works. Evidence brought forward by the Productivity Commission has clearly shown that jobless households are among those most at risk of poverty. And it should be noted that helping people out of poverty, poverty is a complex challenge, which is why the government has to be willing to trial new initiatives and remove the barriers to work and tackle disadvantage and intergenerational welfare dependence. This includes initiatives such as the $96 million Try, Test and Learn Fund, which embraces new ways to assist groups of people at risk of long-term welfare dependence. Those groups include young parents, students, at-risk youth, carers, working-age migrants and the older unemployed. It's a complex strategy to address groups at risk of long-term welfare dependence. 
That's why the best thing the government can do for all Australians is to focus on investment to support businesses reopening and workers returning to their jobs. We have a mountain to climb on the other side of the coronavirus crisis, but we have a proven track record to achieve our goal of seeing Australia's economy recover. And a crucial component of that recovery is a strong social security system. There will be more challenges ahead, and some industries will recover more quickly than others. We recognise that further assistance may be required. It's why government policy is informed through a variety of inputs, including the data collected by organisations such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Department of Social Services, Services Australia and the Productivity Commission. In responding, I think it's appropriate at this time to quote the member for Fenner, who in 2016 remarked on our welfare system. He wrote, quiz time. Of the roughly 200 nations in the world, which country's welfare state is best targeted to those in need? If you answered Australia, then you're absolutely correct. Australia really does have a world-class social safety net. Put simply, a dollar spent in the Australian social security system does more to reduce inequality than a dollar spent in any other welfare system in the world. In conclusion, the Morrison government has no intention of throwing away Australia's economic recovery on a welfare-for-all approach. And we will continue to demonstrate fiscal discipline while adopting only those evidence-based policies that will ensure our wonderful nation's speedy economic recovery. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on today's matter of public importance. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing an unprecedented number of Australians on the job seeker payment many of those people who have never been on a government payment previously. People now find themselves on the job seeker payment by no fault of their own. Thousands have had their hours slashed or their jobs cut. The government, the government made the decision to provide an additional coronavirus supplement of $550 on top of eligible income support payments, and they did this, they did this because it was quite clear long before COVID-19 that the rate of the job seeker payment was inadequate. The government actions are an ad admission of that. It should not have required a pandemic for the government to realise that an economy and society organised on the principle that we're all in this together is preferable to the attitude of letting the economy decide. It's what we from the Labor Party say every time we're in this chamber. And I hope the government will heed the warnings from other jurisdictions, double-digit unemployment and massive drops in GDP, before they make any rash decisions. Australia has been so successful because we've listened to experts and we've worked together across the economy—workers, employers and unions. But we've heard disappointing and disparaging noises even from the government about the rate of job keeper and job seeker. The idea that you could have a six-month program and then it just ends abruptly is ridiculous. In fact, it's economically reckless. You can't just immediately snap back to the payments to half of what they are now. As I stated, the government increased job seeker payment because they knew it wasn't fair dinkum, that people just couldn't survive on $40 a day. And what Labor said is that the coronavirus supplement should be phased out over time and that when it is, we need to lock in permanent and livable increases to job seeker payment. Some 1.3 million Australians are currently on job seeker, and it is expected that by September another 400,000 Australians will require job seeker payment. The high rate of job seeker has actually kept some small businesses in Tasmania, my home state, open during this troubling time, as customers are able to shop at the businesses that, that they supported when they were still employed. And to just snap back the job seeker payment to the old rate is going to cause extreme hardship for hundreds of thousands of Australians, causing them to miss their rent or mortgage repayments, not being able to afford basics, support local stalls, or even to afford to look for work either. The Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee, of which I'm a member, recently tabled its report into the adequacy of New Start and related payments and alternative mechanisms to determine the level of income support payments in Australia. It made a total of 27 recommendations to improve the level of income support. 
One of the recommendations of the report was that once the coronavirus supplement is phased out, the Australian government increase the job seeker payment, youth allowance and parenting payment rates to ensure that all eligible recipients do not live in poverty. Snapping the payment back to its old rate will be the equivalent of removing $1 billion per fortnight from the Australian economy. And those on the other side need to think about that. Labor has taken a constructive approach throughout these testing times. We have advocated for those who have been left behind, whether they be casuals and labour hire workers, small businesses, visa holders or those in the arts and entertainment sector. Indeed, the government has taken up many of our proposals, including wage subsidies, better income tests for working families, support for students, telehealth and mental health provision, support for tenants and increasing testing. But Many Australians are still hurting. It's been a terrible time for those of Australians who have lost loved ones, and I pass my condolences on to all of them. And it's been really tough for those who have lost their jobs. Our essential workers have shown what heroes they are, each and every one of them, to keep food on our shelves, our hospitals staffed, medicines in our pharmacies and our hospitals running. I thank these workers for their amazing efforts. But unfortunately, I fear this government will use this COVID-19 outbreak as an excuse to implement their tired right-wing agenda. They may talk the talk of all being this together, but they are firmly on the side of their big business mates. Do not be fooled. They want to snap back to the industrial relations policy of work choices as well. They want to snap back to a time when workers had no security and no rights at work. And it's completely the wrong approach for our country. The end result will be double-digit unemployment, businesses folding and mortgages Thank going into default. Thank you very much, Senator Villick. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Let me start by reassuring the Australian people that One Nation has a very strong understanding of the pressures faced by almost a million unemployed throughout the country right this minute. And it frightens me to hear that earlier today the government announced that they are bracing for up to 1.4 million unemployed because of this Chinese pandemic. There is a genuine need to use every mechanism possible to avoid people losing their homes and personal possessions, and that's why Senator Roberts and I have backed the Morrison government's emergency measures to safeguard jobs through the JobKeeper program and equally support the additional payment to those job seekers who have either lost or will lose their incomes. But unemployment benefits are not a permanent stimulus package or a measure, which is exactly what the Greens are proposing in this notice of motion. While I agree that the ordinary New Start payment should incur an increase of $75 a week, it should also provoke a limit to the time in which people can receive unemployment benefits. It's already unacceptable that this government allows 2.2 million foreign workers into this country to take Australian jobs while our unemployment numbers skyrocket. On the 27th of April this year, we recorded approximately 727,000 unemployed Australians on New Start allowance, each receiving approximately $282 a week in social security benefits. In light of the coronavirus, this parliament doubled the unemployment payment regardless of whether a person had been jobless for a week or their entire working life. What the Greens are proposing here today is that we permanently double unemployment benefits without a care in the world about how we are going to pay for it. This is socialism at its best. I'm afraid that if it's good enough for the Greens and Labor and the Coalition to kick farmers off the farm household allowance after four years, well, then why can't we kick long-term unemployed off Newstart? Now, I'm not suggesting we do this to people over the age of 50, but I am suggesting that we do it to fit and able Australians who think they can live a lifestyle off the back of hard-working Australians. Mark my words. If you go ahead and permanently double the New Start allowance, it will only lead to an increase in taxes. There is no other way of paying for it. These are uncosted increases that will only bankrupt this nation and create intergenerational dull bludgers. Before the coronavirus here in Australia, this government shelled out more than $180 billion in social security and welfare a year. That's more than one third of all government revenue. 
As a fiscally Thank responsible party in this parliament, you, One Sen Nation will not support Sen the Greens. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Hanson. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this MPI brought before the Chamber by Senator Steele-John, and I recognise I do so as the nation begins this long road to economic recovery. Uh, due to the efforts of the Australian community and the way they have heeded the advice of medical experts, we are able to commence this journey well ahead of many of our international counterparts. Uh, now is not the time for politics as usual. It is the time for the team approach which has underpinned our response so far. Our focus now is ensuring Australia is reopened as soon as possible and getting Australians back into work. And despite these events, our plan for Australia has not wavered. We will continue to implement our growth-enabling, job-creating agenda. It remains the case that Australia has one of the strongest and most targeted social welfare safety nets in the world. And it has served us well. And in doing so now, it, it, this is critical at this amazing time of need. But this safety net should not come at the expense of people finding a job, which is what Senator Steele John would see if it were to become so. Those who need support uh, the most receive it. The additional payment of $550 per fortnight is appropriate recognition of the economic shock which has impacted Australian households. And this, uh, and this as the shock will ultimately be temporary, uh, the payment itself should also be temporary. The coming months and years will, will call for greater fiscal responsibility and economic management. And this is what we will deliver. Those same policies which have put us in this position to weather the crisis will also serve Australia well in the recovery phase. We, will not, we must, I beg your pardon, continue to stay the course. We will continue to stick to the plan. The Treasurer uh, quite rightly said this morning in his ministerial statement that there is no money tree. What we borrow today, we must repay tomorrow. And despite this, the Greens continue to come into this place and endorse reckless policy agendas, a policy agenda which would mean Australia continues to borrow an agenda which would tie future generations of Australians down to the future debt burden their socialist utopia would create. And we all know how those on the other side like to play and pay for their uh, back-of-the-envelope ideas, all of which results in increased spending, new taxes on hard-working, everyday Australians. People would receive less take-home pay under their policies and businesses would pay more tax and the cost of living would increase exponentially. And Australians know this. Growth enabling, job creating policies and strong economic management has never been as important as it is today. The Prime Minister has released a three-stage plan to get Australia reopened as soon as possible. The states and territories are now mapping out what this means for them and they're putting those measures in place. In addition to health considerations, the single most important pillar which underpins these plans is getting people back into work as soon as possible. In my home state of Western Australia, restrictions will start to ease on Monday and will continue to do so incrementally, uh, should we continue to see the good health outcomes that we're seeing. This means that business can start to reopen and Australians can get back to work. Since we're last in this place, I've spent time speaking to so many businesses in WA who've been impacted by the coronavirus. Service-focused businesses in particular and those in their supply chains. I've heard some positive stories of innovation and reinvention, but I've also heard some stories of those who, at this time, are not doing so well. But above all, the message has been very clear. While so many have had to make tough business decisions, indeed, sadly, many have had to close their doors temporarily, the policy agenda of this government has been well received. The JobKeeper payment has been critical in keeping people connected to their employer. Take Alba Edible Oils in Palmyra, for example. They've told me that the JobKeeper program and payment system has saved at least 17 jobs in their business. And combined with the cash flow relief and the instant asset write-offs, 
They are using this time to build their capability for when things reopen. And the JobKeeper payment is not the only thing that is there, of course. It is the JobSeeker payment and the supplement that has gone with it. And that is there for those to assist those uh, that are in that position where being, maintaining a connection with their employer was not possible. And this means that when we're on the that uh, when we're through the other side, these Australians will be ready to get back to work, as many of them are already doing so. And we're having these businesses uh, able to enter into and maintain an effective hibernation period. Uh, this means that more people will be able to transition from the job seeker payment back into paid employment at the appropriate time. The temporary boost to this payment has injected the confidence we need to exit this challenge in the best possible position. It means people can continue to support their families from a position of relative strength, continue to make their rent payments or mortgage payments where possible, and continue with their regular purchases and fund household expenses and support local businesses who need it. Without this, the impact on the economy would have been more catastrophic. We know that each and every week the that the restrictions remain in place, there is a reduction of $4 billion of economic activity. This is the result of lower workforce participation, productivity and consumption. But from where we are today, with the effective implementation of the three-step plan, GDP can be expected to increase at $9.4 billion per month. This would see 850,000 Australians back at work, a direct result of the economic response to this challenge. Further, we know that the unemployment rate would climb to over 15 per cent if Australians are not able to maintain a connection to their employer. And this would be the start to recovery, that the start to recovery would be much slower than what it would be, than what it is under this program. It would mean businesses would need to find people, rehire people, retrain people, and they would lose their investment in human capital and would need to start from square one. Mm -hmm. This is why our economic response is critical. Now is the time for the Greens mm -hmm. to come to this place, not with their standard rhetoric. Every Australian has been impacted by the economic consequences of this challenge in some way. It might be a family member, it might be their children, or friends, or those of a, of a staff member. We're all familiar and acutely aware of the pressure that this is placing on individuals. We understand the seriousness and consequences of the times that we're in. There will be a time for the Greens to come back in here and play their politics, but now is not their time. There will be a time for the Greens to come back in here and air their grievances against every other party in this place, but now is not that time. This economic package that this government has delivered is unprecedented. At $320 billion, it's a historic investment in our future and represents over 16 per cent of GDP. Now is the time to work together constructively in the national interest. Parliament is, quite appropriately, playing its multi-partisan role in assessing the policy agenda of government. This is taking place through the relevant committees uh, on the things that are related to the coronavirus response, as it has been in this chamber. Now is the time for the Greens to look at the environment we're in, understand it and, importantly, play a constructive role. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The fact we have a strong social safety net is a matter of pride to Australians. There is comfort in times of crisis, whether personal or national, to know there is a strong and inclusive policy that offers assistance when we fall on hard times. Our social safety net has proven critical to the success of our response to COVID-19. It's hinged on our efforts to reduce the economic barriers to complying with self-isolation and social distancing rules. And what we never want to see is people faced with the impossible choice of staying at home and staying healthy versus going to work just to put food on the table. And yet still thousands of Australians are faced with that. This is why Labor called for a wage subsidy from the get-go, a wage subsidy that will keep employees connected to their employers right through to when we can't come out the other side of this pandemic. 
and for those who, despite the wage subsidy, were unable to hold on to their jobs, a boost to income support has allowed them to make ends meet while social distancing. The social security response to the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown into stark relief this government's usual handling of anything that relates to our social safety net. With half a million more Australians expected to be accessing support payments by September, the government cannot continue to demonise and punish those forced to seek out the comfort provided by an adequate social safety net. It cannot just expect hundreds of thousands of Australians to just cop being forced onto a cashless debit card to access income support payments to having their money quarantined because they can't be trusted how to spend it. It cannot expect Territorians on income support to just roll over and accept the cashless debit card with no evidence that it works to do anything but punish recipients. Thankfully, the Minister for Indigenous Australians pressed pause on breaching CDP participants who did not comply with job seeker compliance actions. Many providers have been unable to send trainers and staff out bush to conduct face-to-face -face activities. The minister also said he had put in place arrangements to lift any existing suspensions and penalties for, job, uh, for CDP job seekers. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, it goes to show that it can be done. Uh, Labor has stood in the Senate time after time after time in relation to CDP and those breaching uh, penalties that further put people into poverty, entrenching people into poverty. But we have seen in these last few months just how the government knows it can move. And when it does move, it does improve the lives of those people who are in our regional and remote Australian communities. There does not need to be a system, Madam Acting Deputy President, that punishes and controls people who, facing hardship, receive income support. What we do need is what Labor has been advocating for, a system that actually provides jobs and economic development in remote areas, instead of a system that has failed to do either and really unfairly penalises participants. The COVID-19 response has also highlighted the difficulties remote community residents face in accessing and affording healthy foods and other goods. With communities in lockdown, the weaknesses in supply chains have been exposed. Ironically, with families now actually more able to afford to purchase healthy food options, there have actually been less options available to them. It's not good enough that the government still wants to snap back to its old ways, to pursuing policies that punish Australians who are already facing hardship. We cannot afford to revert to the old ways, to assigning a value judgment to those receiving income support. This pandemic has been a timely reminder to all of us about the randomness of hardship, how quickly and dramatically personal and business circumstances can change. And when their circumstances do change, Australians should have the peace of mind knowing there is a strong and adequate social safety net to catch all of us. Thank you, Thank you Senator McCarthy. Senator Walters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. We simply cannot allow people to go back to living on $40 a day. We are a wealthy nation, and it is a national shame that we have people living in poverty. People should not be forced to choose between missing a meal or getting a new school uniform. Before this latest coronavirus increase, the last time government income support was lifted above inflation was 26 years ago. It was 1994, and it was raised by $2.95 a week. Is this really what the government wants to revert to? Everyone has to be supported with a livable income above the poverty line. We shouldn't choose groups that will be left behind. What the government has shown us is that there is money available to do the things that need doing. They just refused to do it before. There are plenty of ways that we could raise the necessary revenue. 
We could reverse stages two and three of the income tax cuts due to start in 2022 that go to the wealthiest Australians. We could end the $7 billion in public funding in subsidies to fossil fuel companies that gets doled out every single year. We could actually make gas companies pay tax and pay royalties for the gas that they currently get for free. We must ensure that everybody has access to the financial support that they need to live and the ability to provide for themselves while they are studying, caring and looking for work. In addition to supporting Australians through the recession, maintaining the rate will also boost jobs, as job seeker funding is spent throughout the economy. We estimate that increasing, uh, the increased spending unleashed by maintaining the rate would create at least 19,000 new jobs across the economy. And we need those new jobs because forecasts for the next year are grim, and young people in particular are facing the prospects of long-term unemployment and underemployment. With a million people likely to be out of work when job seeker is due to be halved, we need urgent action to make sure that people are kept out of poverty. The cost of putting food on the table and a roof over your head won't halve after the COVID crisis, and neither should income support. The Greens have long campaigned to raise the rate, but the government's doubling of it during the coronavirus crisis is in fact admitting that people out of work need $110 a fortnight to pay the bills and the rent. Now that we've got a more realistic rate of income support, we will campaign hard to keep it. We back the calls of thousands of Australians who are urging the government to keep the job seeker payment above the poverty line. It is unacceptable to return the job seeker rate to $40 a day, condemning over a million people to live in poverty. People on income support spend that money uh, to make sure that they're looking after themselves and their kids. Raising the rate isn't just the right thing to do for people. It's absolutely necessary to stimulate the economy. We do live in a society and not just an economy. And I think some of those examples of revenue raising, like not dishing out massive tax cuts to people that don't need the help, cancelling those billions of dollars of free public money to people who are polluting and wrecking the climate, and making fossil fuel companies pay their fair share, is a more than adequate response in a compassionate society where we are wealthy enough to make sure that no one is left behind, no one, no child, lives in poverty. It's about time this rate was retained. We welcome the fact that it has, in fact, been lifted at all. Let's now retain that rate. We cannot drop people back down to poverty just as this crisis is due to end. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, Australians have responded magnificently, working together to stay at home, observe social distancing requirements, and take care of one another. But after months of being inside, isolating from friends and family, trying to balance work with the added responsibilities that come from children learning at home, Australians could be forgiven for wanting things to return to normal. But for many Australians, normal was not good. For casual warehouse workers, it meant not knowing what your wage actually would be in the following week. In many, many cases in the retail sector, it meant working in an environment where your employer was stealing your wages and doing so knowingly. For childcare workers, it meant that no matter how much you loved your job, you did it knowing that it was undervalued for the skill and care required to perform it. And for people on income support payments, it meant a daily struggle for a dignified life. People who are out of work deserve to be treated with dignity. The rate of job seeker was inadequate before this pandemic, and the government's increase to the payment during the pandemic is an admission of this fact. And the increase that's been provided means that people don't have to choose between missing a meal or missing a job interview because they don't have the money for both. It is strange indeed that the top priority for the Liberals appears to be cutting this payment. Reports are that the government wants to snap back the job seeker to $40 a day, and those reports are disturbing. The latest advice from the Department of Social Services is that it believes another 400,000 Australians will require the job seeker payment by September, bringing the total number of recipients to 1.7 million Australians. 
This is important for those people, important for those 1.7 million people, but it is also incredibly important for the Australian economy. It is a payment that is helping to keep the economy afloat. And snapping back the payment to its old rate will be the equivalent of removing $1 billion per fortnight from the Australian economy. It will have a dire impact on small businesses. It will have a dire impact on jobs. This money is all being spent on essential services in local communities, and it has a big impact in the regions. This is a payment that means a great deal to small businesses in northern New South Wales. This is a payment that means a great deal to small businesses on the south coast, those communities ravaged by bushfires. These are payments that mean that in communities there is money available to keep businesses afloat, but also to keep people healthy and safe in their homes. So why would the government be even contemplating doing this? This is a group of people attached to their ideological ideas. This is a government that struggles, struggles to adjust to changing circumstances. We saw this in the policy proposals floated by the Treasurer in his statement today. In good times, the policy solution, tax cuts and IR reform. What's the policy solution in bad times? It's also tax cuts and IR reform. It is a policy for all seasons. There is no circumstance where the government's response will not be tax cuts and IR reform. In this policy area, the government has an obvious, sneering, ideological distaste for people who require welfare. We hear them say the best form of welfare is a job. Well, jobs are good, and we need more jobs. And these kinds of payments at a time of crisis support jobs. But if you ask the Australians who can't find work, they'd probably say that an unemployment payment that you can live on is also pretty good. 1.7 million Australians won't be out of work in September because they're lazy. There simply isn't the work out there. And any examination of the stats from the ABS, and in particular the underemployment figures, will show you that there hasn't been sufficient paid work in the Australian economy for some time. Yeah. The government should treat people who are out of work with dignity. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Fruki. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the call to retain the rate of job seeker and youth allowance. A return to the old rate of job seeker and youth allowance below the poverty line would be a colossal moral failing. The Liberals must be forced to confront the fact they are considering thrusting hundreds of thousands of Australians back below the poverty line in the middle of a crisis. This must not be allowed to happen. We must retain the rate. I particularly want to focus on students and young people. Before the rate was raised, successive Liberal and Labour governments had abandoned students to face the high cost of living and extreme stress on their own. Instead of focusing on studying, they were struggling to get by, many working multiple jobs to survive because of inadequate support. Research last year found a quarter of students were experiencing food insecurity and 15 per cent reported experiencing hunger or not eating because there wasn't enough money for food. The fundamental principle is simple. Full-time university and vocational and training students should have income support that enables them to focus primarily on their studies. While not perfect and certainly lacking on the eligibility front, the current payments are much closer to that goal than they were before. Retaining the rate is made all the more urgent by the outsized impact of this crisis um, and the impact of this crisis on young people. In the month from mid-March, 7.5% of jobs were lost to truly devastating consequences for people around the country. But for young people, it was even worse. Nearly 12% of jobs held by people aged between 20 and 30 were lost during that period and an enormous 20 per cent of jobs held by people under 20 disappeared. Those figures are only expected to get worse. 
A recent Grattan Institute, Institute report found about 30% of workers in their 20s will be made unemployed by this crisis. Even once the depths of this crisis pass, young people will bear the consequences for years to come as they're confronted with decades of student debt to pay off, pay cuts on top of already flat wages and degraded workplace rights. As well as retaining the rate, we have to make sure access to income support is fair. For students, that means putting the nonsensical independence test behind us and expanding youth allowance eligibility to all students. That means ensuring eligibility for our study is expanded to all postgraduate students. That means including international students in income support just as New Zealand, Canada and other countries have done. Only by retaining the rate and expanding eligibility for income support can we keep people out of poverty and rebuild as a more socially and economically just society after this crisis. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm just getting used to the uh, new seating arrangements and it uh, feels a little bit more like a Labor Party conference with a lectern than <laughs> the Senate chamber itself. Um, I'll try and behave a little better in here than I do at those conferences. I do want to um, take the time today uh, uh, broadly to support the comments uh, of my fellow Labor senators uh, on the MPI debate, but I do want to make a couple of comments uh, following Senator Faruqi's comments about the position of international students and the government's approach to the higher education sector more broadly uh, in the uh, coronavirus crisis uh, and in the following period. I, I walked into a food queue last week uh, of Thai uh, students organised by uh, a Thai community organisation uh, in, a, in uh, uh, Chinatown in Sydney. A hundred Thai students lined up with their bags collecting food because they couldn't afford food. There was another queue just like that uh, in Ultimo today. Uh, the university sector is Australia's third largest exporter. It's certainly the most labour intensive. 130,000 direct workers, highly skilled people, tens of thousands more people employed as casuals, a very big employment footprint. The coronavirus crisis means in the next six months Victoria University predicts a $4.6 billion hit uh, to that sector. Uh, it's going to compound $19 billion uh, over the next three years, but there's no package. 21,000 lost jobs if action isn't taken by the federal government, but no package. Many of those jobs will be in core research areas in big cities. Thousands of them will be in regional communities. Uh, represented by uh, some of them by people on the other side. No package, no action. Worse still, research will stop. Classes will be cancelled. Opportunities for kids from working class families gone. It's one more example where the posturing to the base of figures on the backbench of the Liberal Party and the National Party is dictating government policy. This week, it's been George Christensen running foreign policy for the government. Uh, a few weeks ago, it was Senator Patterson running higher education policy for the government. Uh, he stood up reportedly in the caucus and said, with the ongoing tra China travel ban, I'm very sympathetic about the impact of tourism and farmers, but I'm less so with the universities. Uh, the universities, he said, rode the cycle up, now they can ride, ride the cycle down. Those sort of comments reflect a majority view on the other side and it shows what a deep misunderstanding they have of the sector and its value. Fighting a culture war against imaginary people in turtleneck sweaters in, uh, in uh, uh, university English departments, well, what do universities actually do? Agricultural research, medicine, cancer, mental health, engineering, economics, uh, thinking about the future of work, research into space, defence technology, epidemiology and public health. Universities are full of experts. I understand the hostility of people on the other side of this chamber to experts, but they are experts nonetheless, the very people who the federal government relied upon to develop its COVID-19 response. They don't just teach. They do deep research, and one of the consequences of this 
this failure to have a package is that much of that research will stop. University research is not something that can be turned on and turned off, just like a tap. Further to this, there's this hostility from the other side to international students. Well, the truth is Australia's enormous contribution in terms of education of international students subsidises the places of Australian students at our universities. The uh, increase in international students does mean less of a Commonwealth government contribution. We should be supporting these young people uh, in this country. We have made a deep contract, not just each individual university, but as a country with the parents of these young people to educate them and to look after them. And the shameful scenes of food queues, the reports back uh, to these people's host countries will do enormous damage to the reputation of Australia as an educator uh, and as what should be a good global citizen. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ayres. I don't believe there are any more speakers on the MPI, so we'll move to um, proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on pages four and five of the notice paper. I plan to go through those by the groups, by page and by the groups. So on page four, the documents presented by the president. Uh, there's Auditor General's reports for 2019-2020, government documents. Senator McCarthy. Apologies, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I was just slightly distracted. I do. I would like to uh, request, in terms of the Auditor General's reports, uh, point five seven eight documents. If I could um, ask for those documents, and also if I could continue, Mr. Acting Deputy President, to government documents number ten and 15, and responses to Senate resolutions number 19, and seek leave to continue my remarks in relation to those documents. Okay. Leave is, is granted. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Senator Seward. I seem to be going at a rapid pace. Um, could I also seek um, leave to take note of item 18 and seek leave to continue my remarks? We hadn't got over the page yet, I don't think. So um, no, but Senator. Oh, oh, oh I, you had. Yes, okay. I had gone right, right through, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, thinking that we were moving quite quickly. Okay, so I think leave is granted. So uh, we are on oh, Senator Rice. On the on the next page. On on page uh, five. Um, so I was going to move to responses to Senate resolutions. No, government documents still. Go, it's on government documents, yes. page five, Senator yes. Rice. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I wish to take note of um, the government documents, the Regional Forest Agreement's deeds of variation. For the deeds of variation in document 16, the agreements between the Commonwealth of Australia and Victoria in the Central Highlands, Gippsland, North East, West Victoria and East Gippsland. So deeds of variation in relation to regional forest agreements, they are bureaucratic words hiding a massive impact. When the people of Australia are asked their opinion about protecting our forests and wildlife, they have two overwhelming responses. Number one is that they don't know that our precious forests are being destroyed by logging. And secondly, if they do know, they want it to stop. And over 80 per cent of Australians, including two thirds of Australians who live in regional areas, they want to see our forests and our wildlife protected from the devastation of logging. So what do these deeds of variation to our logging laws, the regional forest agreements, do? Do they reflect the, the wishes of the vast majority of Australians? Australians? Sadly, I think you know the answer. No. They continue the logging, the devastated log devastating logging in Victoria's magnificent forests for at least the next 10 years. That's 10 more years of wildlife being killed, 10 more years of streams being polluted, 10 more years of our carbon stores just going up in smoke, 10 more years of wonderful tourism and recreational opportunities being destroyed, and 10 more years, at least, of making our forests more fire-prone, 
less safe for communities that live nearby. I mean, we're told that these are so-called modernised laws, that wildlife protection is being given priority and that climate change is being taken into account. But if you read them, you will see that there are so many loopholes. But they, in fact, they're not loopholes. They are giant bulldozed clearings that basically, sadly, our wildlife are falling through, as they have for the last 20 years. There's no certainty of wildlife protection here. There are processes, there are words, there are promises to use reasonable endeavours that at the end of the day are absolutely hollow without political will to follow them through. And if these agreements, if these fine sounding words, if at the end of the day they are breached, what's the sanction? It's unclear even as to whether legal action be, can be taken to hold the governments to account to these agreements. And meanwhile, we have got species that are critically endangered and hurtling towards extinction, like Leadbeater's possum, which is still waiting for a recovery plan. We've got greater gliders that have had almost a quarter of their habitat destroyed in last summer's fires. We've got the crustaceans, the freshwater lobsters, that our environment minister was actually tut-tutting about on radio this morning, but he's unwilling to actually protect by stopping logging of their habitat. And what's even worse, the government actually announced just yesterday that they're actually giving the timber industry $15 million to facilitate the pillaging of these forests, the so-called salvage logging, the most destructive and damaging logging that can occur, that will set back the recovery of these forests for decades. In these regional forest agreements, we've got the promise of a so-called major event review that could take place after the fires, but we've got no certainty that it will take place and no legal mechanisms to ensure it does. We don't need rolled over logging laws, outdated logging laws. We need forest protection. We need wildlife protection from koalas to crayfish, from possums to potteroos. And we need all timber produced in Australia to come from plantations. We're currently at 88 per cent. Come on, Australia, we can make it to the 100 per cent. That's what Australians want to see occur. They want to stop the logging, the outdated logging of our native forests that belongs in the last century. I mean, COVID-19 has shown us that what we once thought was impossible is possible, and that to protect our communities, we have to change the way we, take, we do things. We need to learn that lesson with our forests too. We need to learn for our climate, that for our forests that we literally need to breathe, that we need to stop logging them. We must stand up to the bully boys of the native forest timber industry and invest instead in environmental rehabilitation, in recreation and tourism, in managing our forests, in dealing with weeds and pest animals and reducing fire risk. Instead of rolling over these outdated logging laws, that protecting our forests is the new direction that all Australians would applaud. Senator Rice, do you seek leave to continue your remarks? I do. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, question is, the Senate take note of the document? Uh, all those? No problem. We are on page uh, five of the order of business. We will move on to responses to Senate resolutions. No one for Senate um, resolutions. Documents pursuant to continuing orders. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of document 21, the Department of Home Affairs Protection Visas statement pursuant to the order of the Senate of 14 November 2009 to March 2020. And, uh, it's worth putting on the record the context under which Senator Keneally and her Labor colleagues sought these documents. And By the way, the Greens did support uh, these documents being provided to the Senate. But unfortunately, since the last election, Labor has been engaged in a coordinated attack on people seeking asylum and migrant workers. Now, that's uh, further in the context of uh, the Labor Party's support for um, the cruelty that we have seen towards people who sought asylum uh, in Australia in offshore detention. 
The Labor Party has sought to blame migrants for declining wages and for taking Australian jobs. This is a deeply short-sighted and wrong-headed approach that risks further damage to Australia's migrant communities. It's wrong because migrants are not to blame for employers paying low wages. In fact, it is employers enabled by both major parties in this country who are responsible. And by trying to outflank Minister Dutton from the right, the Labor Party risks egging him on to crack down harder on some of the most at-risk people in this country. Labor are using Minister Dutton and Senator Hanson's language on border security. They are implying that we have something to fear from migrants, especially people seeking asylum. If people have a claim for asylum in Australia, they must be allowed to make it. We are still, despite 20 years of bipartisan cruelty towards refugees and torture of refugees in the offshore detention regime, we are still signatories to the Refugee Convention. And now that the so-called airplane people have been stopped because of the pandemic, I'd urge the Labor Party to start working to help those who in fact are in desperate need. People who are stranded overseas, who are in Australia on temporary visas across a range of visa categories, who have been separated from their homes, their families and their work. And I just want to share a couple of stories very quickly with the Senate now from Michael who uh, says this, I'm on a 457 visa listed on the medium and long-term strategic skills list and eligible to apply for permanent residency this year. Our entire lives are in Australia. We also have a puppy in temporary care. We recently travelled to the UK to visit family before the outbreak. During our time on holiday, the border closures were announced by Scott Morrison. We booked the next available flight, but with the travel time from the UK to Australia and the time difference, we were unable to return to our lives in Australia before the travel ban. And this from Sean. My fiance Aoife, received a devastating phone call on 22nd of March. Her sister died suddenly from epilepsy. She was 25 years old. We returned home to Ireland to support her family and be with them in this tragic time. Aoife is 22 weeks pregnant. Our obstetrician and hospital are in Sydney. She is due to give birth in Randwick on 7 September 2020. Her doctors have advised it is unsafe for her to travel on long distance flights too late in the pregnancy, so time is really not on our side. We need to get back to continue our planned scans and appointments. All our private health insurance is only valid to us in Australia. We have put our heart and soul into building our lives in Australia over the past four years. In both of those circumstances, this government has rejected claims from those people for exemptions to the travel ban. This is a major problem for the government because it is a major problem, not just for Sean and Aoife and not just for Michael and his family, but for so many other people who have built homes and lives in this country but who are still on temporary visas and this government is keeping away from this country. The arbitrary decision-making process around claims for exemption from the travel ban must end. The government must immediately publish a list of criteria against which applications for exemptions to the travel ban are assessed. This would at least give people the common courtesy of understanding why they are being kept from their homes at a time like this, and it would provide accountability and transparency in the decision-making process. The government must act on this now. Thank you, Senator McKim. Do you seek leave to continue your remarks? I do, thank you. Thank you, President. Senator McKim. If there's no other senators who wish to, to rise on page five, we will move to the tailing and consideration of committee reports and government responses. I think I'll go to Senator Ciccone uh, first. Okay. I think. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is the, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Acting mm. Deputy President. Um, I'd like to take note of um, items 22, 23, 24, 26, and 27, and seek leave to continue my remarks for all those documents. 
before I, th I th it was, sorry, we'll come back to you shortly, yeah. Senator Hume. Thank you, time. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I present the government's response to the report of the Parliamentary Joint Inquiry, sorry, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights on its inquiry into the quality of care amendment minimising the use of restraints principles 2019 and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. So leave grant. Yes. Senator Hume. I, what am I doing? Do you have I, anything else? I have nothing else for you. No, okay. Thank you. So we will move to the consideration of committee reports and government responses, which are listed on. Sorry, Senator Seward. I seek leave to uh, take. Oh, I don't need to seek leave. I take note of the Community Affairs Reference Committee uh, report number at uh, number 24. Okay. Uh, this I chaired the inquiry into um, this. This is a report is uh, the adequate about the adequacy of new start and related payments and alternative mechanisms to determine the level of income support payments in Australia. So the C word, sorry, I'm just waiting for a um, a committee a privileges committee report, which which is what I was thinking Senator Carney was going to. So if you don't, oh, I don't mind yeah, if we okay. can just deal with that first. And then we'll, we'll come back to you, if that's OK. Senator Tashoni. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I, will, um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the 179th report of the Standing Committee of Privileges, which was presented at a sitting on the 24th of March 2020 and tabled on the 8th of April 2020. And I move that the report be adopted. Okay. Well, leave is, is granted. So the question is now the report be adopted. Those say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Senator Ciccone. Do I have it written on page six now? Or I'll go back to Senator Seward. I'll go back to Senator Seward. Okay. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, I take note of the report, the New Start Inquiry report. I'll just call it that because it's got such a long title. Um, this was tabled on the 30th of April and made 27 uh, recommendations. And first off, I would like to thank most deeply, in particularly individuals with lived experience who took um, the brave step, because many people feel uh, quite worried about talking about their uh, personal experiences in front of a group of uh, senators. So I'd like to thank them most uh, strongly and deeply for the time that they took um, explaining their lived experiences. And for many, it was very painful um, to, to basically re relive the difficulties they are facing living on Newstart. People talk to us about not being able to get their teeth fixed, about their health concerns, about not being able to afford the out-of-pocket expenses for uh, medical appointments, not being able to, uh, to adequately access mental health services, about choosing to forego meals for themselves, sometimes only eating one meal a day so their children could eat, about, about not being able to send their children to school with lunches, about making choices about medication, including medication for uh, their mental health, about foregoing their medication so their children could have medication, of repeatedly trying to get the disability support pension because they had uh, significant uh, disabilities and did not meet the eligibility criteria or found the system so complex and hard to navigate. They talked about not being able to relate to Centrelink. Um, many of those experiences, unfortunately, I have uh, heard uh, through my constituent office as well, and it really did reinforce for uh, people that people are struggling and cannot survive on $40 a day. We made 27 recommendations because we looked at a range of issues when, we're dealing, when we were looking at the adequacy of Newstart. And I can say overwhelmingly um, we found it was inadequate. One of the key thing that we looked at to begin with was the issue of poverty and people living in poverty. It was very clear that people are living in poverty on $40 a day. We looked at the fact that there is, in fact, there is not a definition of poverty 
in this country. So our first recommendation is, in fact, how about Australia defines uh, what poverty is? And then the second recommendation is ensuring that the income support payment, that people that are uh, on income support payments do not live in poverty, which of course they are doing if they're living on Newstart or Youth Allowance of $40 a day. We looked at the issues around the uh, Commonwealth rent assistance and recommend that that be looked at. We also looked at um, the barriers that people face beyond poverty. There's, as I mentioned, that uh, the out of uh, the sorry out of pocket expenses for healthcare. We looked at the barriers that single parents face, particularly those that are struggling to survive on Newstart when their oldest child turns eight. The barriers that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face, um, that which are uh, there are some very specific barriers that they face and we make recommendations there. We also look at the adequacy of our employment services and heard uh, many accounts of people's uh, concerns and uh, lack of support that they get from employment services and the need to employ, improve those employment services. We also uh, look at a range of other barriers in the report, which I urge members of the Senate particularly to have a look at. It outlines very clearly why the job seeker payment, because Newstart, of course, is now job seeker payment, why that rate of $40 a day is so inadequate, and why also the argument that you get plenty of other payments, so it's not too bad, really, folks, nothing to say here, is just a fallacious argument. It really is a fallacious argument. So we make a, a number of uh, recommendations about how to address specific barriers. Uh, we make a recommendation to the Senate that we should be looking at another inquiry into uh, health inequality um, because we think that's a particularly important issue. We also make recommendations that the department look at the adequacy of support for young people and the adequacy of the payments. The last recommendation we make is recommendation 27. How many times do we have to tell this place that job seeker payment of $40 a day is inadequate? Their recommendation, another one, I know people say it's just another recommendation, but read the report. See the arguments about why the payment is so inadequate. Read the lived experiences of Australians who are telling you from their heart of their lived experience. You cannot deny people's lived experience. Read that and then see why at recommendation 27 we recommend that the, once the coronavirus supplement ends, that the rate is increased of job seeker payment is increased so that people do not live in poverty. Read the bit in the, in the report that talks about the OECD relative measure of poverty which says and finds that that is $1,012, which is extremely close to where we are right now with the job seeker payment with the supplement of $1,100. That's why we are so passionate in our support for retaining the rate, for making sure that people are no longer living in poverty because that rate is above that the current rate is above the rate OECD relative measure of poverty rate. It is really, really essential that we do not condemn Australians to be living in poverty on income support. Please read the report. Please take on board their messages. Please, please read and understand people's lived experience. We need to retain the new rate of job seeker so that this country is not condemning people to be living in poverty. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Okay, Senator, S S Senator Smith, and then I will come to you. Senator. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. I seek leave to take note of item 26, implementation of the National Redress Scheme Joint Select Committee First Interim Report dated May 2020. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on the Implementation of the National Redress Scheme, I am pleased this afternoon to make some comments about the Committee's first interim report to the Senate. 
The committee has tabled an interim report to reassure survivors of institutional child sexual abuse that their voices are still being heard and, importantly, to help direct and inform the second anniversary of the National Redress Scheme set to commence prior to 1 July this year. The interim report contains 14 recommendations to guide the upcoming review of the scheme, and importantly, in regards to the scheme's current administration, there are a number of issues that have been identified in the interim report that can be addressed and should be addressed immediately to improve the survivor experience. These five reforms that would improve the survivor experience include removing the requirement for a statutory declaration to accompany each application for redress, introducing time frame flowcharts to help survivors track their individual applications, establish a direct complaint avenue for survivors and increase the provision of adequate timely access to counselling and psychological care services, and importantly, and importantly improve in favour of the survivor indexation arrangements so that indexation is applied up until uh, up until the date an application is submitted rather than the date a payment offer is made. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, the most critical and immediate and urgent issue that this interim report addresses is the matter of whether or not institutions are actively working to sign up to the National Redress Scheme by 30 June 2020. In regard to institutions that have yet not joined the National Redress Scheme, and let's remember we are about to celebrate the second anniversary, almost a thousand days of the National Redress Scheme. In regards to institutions that have still not joined the National Redress Scheme, the committee is clear, is firm, is unanimous in its view that every possible action must be taken to ensure that institutions fulfil their social and moral duty to survivors. It is irresponsible, it is naive for the administrators of the National Redress Scheme, the Commonwealth and every state and territory jurisdiction to pretend that it can continue to rely on the goodwill of institutions. Time is up. We, on this, in this interim report, give a very clear signal about what the parliament's attitude is and needs to be and it's a clear signal that sits comfortably that sits very very comfortably with the announcement that the minister for social services senator rustin made only in the last few weeks our view is and the committee has recommended very very strongly that the national redress scheme should obtain a written statement from each named institution that has not yet joined the scheme and that that written statement must include reasons for the delay, a list of the key officers of the institution, the expected joining date, and all financial benefits accrued by means of their charitable status or other sources of public funding or concessions received. The committee has then recommended, and this is the most critical point, that that information not be hidden from public view, but that information be publicly disclosed to the Australian community the Australian community so it can act as judge and jury, so the Australian community can act as judge and jury, that those written statements with all of those details should be published on the National Redress Scheme one week before the 30th of June 2020 deadline. Not because myself as chairman of the committee or not because of Senator Seawitt, because of her, her long work on these issues should stand in judgment, but the Australian community deserves to know why institutions have not yet joined and what are the excuses and what are the time frames for their joining the institutions. Because, colleagues, time is running out for survivors. How ironic, how ironic it would be that the, move, the, 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 the more we move away from the Royal Commission process and its recommendations, the more we move away from the apology, the less visible survivors of institutional child sexual crimes, as I like to call them, how invisible they come. How ironic that a group of people who for a great bulk of their life were invisible, then they get an opportunity to, be, to tell a story, to have appropriate redress. Expectations are raised by the Royal Commission and by the apology, raised by the creation of the National Redress Scheme, only to find now that they're feeling invisible and unheard again, that is savage, that is unfair, that is unjust. 
I'd like to thank my colleagues on this joint select committee uh, group. We had a choice. We had two choices, actually. We could have waited until May in 2022 to issue a final report of this committee. And the 30th of June deadline would have passed. The second anniversary deadline would have passed. The review would have conducted its work. And we, as parliamentarians, would have issued a report when it was too late. But instead, we decided, despite the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic, we decided that we would go out there early and issue an interim report so that the voices of this parliamentary committee, tripartite, tripartisan parliamentary committee, could be heard loud and strongly, not just by the Commonwealth government, but the Premier of Queensland is as involved in the National Redress Scheme as much as the Prime Minister of Australia. The Premier of New South Wales, of Victoria, of Tasmania, of South Australia, of Western Australia all have a responsibility because nothing happens when we, we, when we think about reform of the National Redress Scheme unless every state and Commonwealth jurisdiction agrees. Now, I would like, my ambition is for the spirit of the National Cabinet, the spirit of the National Cabinet, to refocus its energies and its activities post-coronavirus on de delivering real, timely justice to those survivors who are still waiting. Who are still waiting. It pains me to say the National Redress Scheme is not yet living up to expe expectations. I believe it can. I believe it should. I came to this committee position with less knowledge about redress matters than, than others. But you only have to listen to the real stories, the pain and suffering in people's voices still today. And if you really listen intently, you can't help but be moved, compelled to want to fight for justice for these very, very, very important people very, very important people. And even through our process, having told their stories a hundred times before to other strangers, other parliamentary committees, the Royal Commission process, they found the courage to get on a telephone call with senators and members of the House of Representatives and tell their story again. This is a good committee report. It is one that deserves attention now. And that's why the committee has written to each state jurisdiction, to the Commonwealth, and asked them now, what do you think about our recommendation for full public disclosure? There may be some very, very good reasons. And the Australian community and the Australian parliaments across this Commonwealth will be generous in their considerations of those very, very genuine reasons. No one should be allowed to hide as we get close to the two-year anniversary of the National Redress Scheme. Thank you, Senator Smith. I will go to Senator on the same matter. I will keep it fairly short. It's on the report. You'll, you'll continue your remarks, Senator Smith? Or continue my okay, remarks. Thank, thank you. you. But you've already spoken, haven't you? It's a different report. It's a redress report. To see what the debate continues with you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Smith, um, through you, Chair, for your very eloquent words just then and for your excellent chairing of this committee. It, it, you can't say it's a pleasure to work on this committee because we're dealing with such devastating issues, but in terms of the uh, collegiate support and the way that we work together, um, I thought um, was uh, Excellent, and in terms of we all came, we all come on that committee from the same uh, position of hearing survivors and needing to make sure that they have justice. And unfortunately, um, the the uh, scheme at the moment is not providing that justice to survivors. The report, I agree with Senator Smith. Um, the report, I think, is a very good report in terms of addressing the issues that came up. And I urge all governments, it's not just about the Australian government, it's about all state and territory governments, to read the recommendations and take action. 
Senator Smith has very eloquently pointed out the issue around institutions. I totally support what he said in terms of they have to get on board. Um, we need to be um, making sure that the recommendations in this report are implemented to hold them to account. What I wanted to just touch on, so I don't go over the same issues as, as Senator Smith, other than I do want to repeat his uh, support for survivors and also acknowledge the fact that they actually by retelling their accounts of their experiences, I, I know a number were re-traumatised again for having to articulate their experiences yet again, and I thank them most deeply from the bottom of my heart. I did want to just touch on the funder of last resort issues, because these issues are issues that I raised in this place when we were debating this legislation, because the approach taken at the time was clearly not going to address survivors' needs, and unfortunately that has proved to be the case. We do need to make sure that we address this. We touch on it in our report. There are a number of survivors that were in institutions that now are defunct and do not have uh, an institution in which to seek redress from. This, it was inevitable that this was going to happen. It was inevitable that the provisions that were uh, that currently in the legislation are not going to be adequate. It is absolutely essential that the state and territories and the federal government work together to address this issue. And it is going to take, in my belief, amendments to the, to the legislation itself. It's an issue that has been uh, raised. It needs to be carefully looked at during the review. I have particular opinions about how this should be addressed, which we touch on very uh, we, we touch on a little bit, but I deeply believe that the governments need to take responsibilities, make sure people get redress, and then sort it out amongst themselves as to who pays. But don't make the survivors pay, which is what they're doing now, because they can't get access to redress under the current circumstances. Very few people that were in uh, institutions that are now defunct have been able to access redress to date. We know that we are working against the clock for some people. It is, it is not an exaggeration. We need to make sure that we address this issue with a sense of urgency. Uh, we've also set a fairly, I think, clear timeline um, for how we think the review, the standard, the, the review that has to occur under the, under the legislation of the implementation of the scheme. Um, we expect big things from that review. Uh, not to put any pressure on the, the, uh, the person who's uh, appointed to this and the, and the review process, but it is really, really essential that they look at these key issues, that they uh, take them on board and come up with substantial solutions so that survivors actually are able to get redress. We need to. We gave them a commitment in this place, and we are not meeting that commitment with its current implementation. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Seawert. If there's no speakers on, on that item, I will go to Senator Ciccone with my, my sincere apologies. No, that's all right. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I appreciate your patience. Um, on that, could I, uh, I'd like to um, take note of items 22, 23 and 27 on page 6 uh, of, the, of, um, of uh, the order of business and seek leave to continue my remarks. Okay. Leave granted. Yes, leave is granted. Okay, got them in the end. Thank you. Are there any other senators who wish to to rise on any of the documents on page six? If not, we will move on to have a message. The president has received a message from His Excellency the Governor General, notifying assent to four laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Cross-Boundary Greenhouse Gas Titles and Other Measures Bill 2019 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate and on the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters. Okay, so Senator Lambie, please. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Now that's all well and good for Victorians and I'm not going to get in the way of, of that, that's for sure. I just want to ask why aren't any hydrogen projects in Tasmania getting the same special treatment for the federal government that they seem to be getting in Victoria? And I think it's a fair ask. 
It's not like we don't have an appetite for this stuff in my own state. I can tell you there are Tasmanian investors and outside investors who are chomping at the bit to be able to build up our hydrogen industry in Tasmania. The state government wants it as well. We're ready, set to go. There are shovel-ready projects that are so close to getting off the ground. The plans are there, the finance is there. It's not that far off, and we can taste it. You just need to, we just need a little push to get it going, just like what Victorians are getting here. And good for them. Like I said, I'm not getting in their way. I don't want to tread on their toes. But frankly, I think Tassie would be a better investment. And quite frankly, I think there's enough money to go around for everyone. Our, hydro our hydrogen industry wouldn't have to be stuffing around with these exp expensive carbon capture projects to make it happen. Instead, we're perfectly placed to use renewable energy to make proper green hydrogen. It would be cheap to produce and it would bring thousands of jobs to my neck of the woods. And I can tell you, I can tell you after being the epicentre of COVID-19, we are going to need those jobs to get back on our feet. It would also help stabilise our energy market so we don't have the threat of massive price hikes on our electricity bills if a big industrial player pulls out. Honestly, it would be a win-win for everyone. So I just don't see why we've been overlooked on this one. Maybe this is just another case of Tasmania being left off the map. Well, I'm putting us back in the spotlight because Tasmanian green hydrogen could be a huge opportunity for the country and also my state. And I invite the federal government to come on board with it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, cross boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures bill 2019, and offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage regulatory levies amendment, miscellaneous measures bill 2019. And it's a very opportune time to be speaking about this bill given the veritable stampede we are seeing in this country to open up new exploration acreage to fossil fuel companies. It is a veritable stampede going on uh, as we speak right here now. Now, the purpose of these bills, uh, dealing with the first one, the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures, is to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006, including to provide for single greenhouse gas titles that are partially located in Commonwealth waters and partially located in state and Northern Territory coastal waters, and strengthen and clarify the monitoring, inspection and enforcement powers of the National Offshore Petroleum Safety Environment Management Authority, uh, commonly known as NOPSEMA. Uh, during an oil pollution emergency originating in Commonwealth waters. And the purpose of the second bill uh, is to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage of Regulatory Levies Act 2003 to clarify the application of levies in relation to cross-boundary uh, greenhouse gas titles. Now, I don't believe in uh, coincidences in politics, Acting Deputy President, uh, but we've just been through a summer in this country of the most devastating bushfires. We've seen the Great Barrier Reef bleach the third time in five years, the worst mass coral bleaching on record. We've seen every temperature record in this country broken, a record drought and a broad recognition, a broad recognition around the country that we are in a climate emergency and we need to take action. And it's counterintuitive but contrary to what most people would expect and that is this government would be taking real action on climate change and reining in the profit interests of the fossil fuel industry, the exact opposite is happening. The exact opposite is happening. Exploration acreage has been released right around this country, both onshore and offshore, and we have seen state and federal governments and the regulator relaxing measures during this COVID crisis during this pandemic to enable the oil and gas industry to get out there and explore for more oil and gas. It's almost like they are sniffing the wind, that their social licence is running out of time and they're getting as much done as they can as quickly as possible. Let's talk about what's happened since we've had a pandemic in this country. Why would one particular industry, the gas industry, be receiving such favourable treatment at such a time. 
For a start, on the 23rd of March, we had Premier Daniel Andrews in Victoria shock the Victorian public and climate change activists by lifting the ban or the moratorium on conventional gas development in his state, something he'd made an election promise that he wouldn't do. We've seen Santos ramping up their endeavours around coal seam gas in Narrabri in New South Wales and a big campaign rallying against that. We've seen on the 17th of April, just recently, Resources Minister Keith Pitt in his media uh, statement, flexibility for offshore explorers during the COVID-19 crisis. Yes, that's right. He's put in place a specific policy for this industry during COVID and he acknowledged the impact that COVID had had on the sector and the greater need to make it easier or more flexible for explorers. At the same time, he opened up 49 new areas for offshore petroleum acreage, majority of it off the northwest coast of Western Australia, but some of it also uh, in the Great Australian Bight and in Bass Strait. New areas being issued in WA, Northern Territory, Victoria and Ashmore and Cartier Islands. Now, we've also seen, because uh, I had had a look, a very quick glance on Nopsema's website, uh, a new, and this was retrieved uh, just yesterday, a new 21 applications, including three seismic survey applications and six applications for drilling and two applications for a petroleum pipeline just this week, approved. And we've seen uh, recent approvals, and I've gone back over recent months, over 100 recent approvals for seismic, new seismic testing. And I recently spoke to some Tasmanian fishermen uh, who uh, Senator Colbeck in this chamber would know quite well, who were devastated when they heard that Beach Energy were applying and had just received permission from Nopsema to do seismic testing in Bass Strait in one of their productive scallop beds. Uh, ten years ago, uh, the scallop industry clearly blamed that seismic testing for the loss of an entire scallop bed and $50 million worth of exports. And yet it's still happening. Why is there such a stampede? As I said, I don't believe in coincidences in politics. We've also seen today uh, announcements uh, by the Western Australian Government of a new Pilbara LNG fuelling hub offering 50 per cent discounts for LNG vessels to uh, use this facility to attract more large fossil fuel ships. And we've seen a very disappointing decision by the EPA in Western Australia uh, around uh, the regulator taking a hands-off approach to Yarra's emissions up in the northwest. And Senator Smith, who's in this chamber, was part of the Senate inquiry, uh, which I chaired, uh, that looked at the Aboriginal rock art in Western Australia, which I grew up as a boy. I grew up, I, I grew up playing around that rock art. We know that that area should be declared a world heritage area, yet here it is. Uh, the EPA have just given them a licence. No, 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 uh, no restrictions on their near, near million tonnes of emissions uh, into an area that is so precious and globally recognised as one of the biggest art, natural art galleries uh, on the planet. To a lot of people, it just doesn't make sense why the government is giving even more uh, favours to the big end of town, to big polluters. Well, I'd like to talk about why that may be the case. As I said before, I don't believe in coincidences in politics. Right now, we have a COVID commission in this country looking at many things, but including a recovery task force, an ec economic recovery task force. And we've seen some very strong statements from uh, Australia's Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, uh, Mr Angus Taylor, from the other place, who's openly suggested that the recovery from COVID-19 crisis will be, quote unquote, gas-fired, a gas-fired recovery, a fossil fuel recovery uh, in Australia. That's right. Our Minister for Emissions Reduction is advocating for more emissions. And if you believe uh, the media reports, 
many of the people appointed to the uh, National COVID-19 Coordinated Commission, and I'll get to that detail in a second, the NCCC, represent fossil fuel interests. And if you look at the manufacturing task force that they've appointed, totally stacked with fossil fuel interests, gas lobbyists and climate deniers. So, on one hand, we have all these new areas being opened up for fossil fuel, especially gas exploration. And on the other hand, we have a hand-picked task force by the government who are going to make recommendations direct to the Prime Minister and Cabinet about how we can pull ourselves out of this COVID downturn. And clearly it's been set up. The cards have been stacked in the favour of the fossil fuel industry. The ducks have been lined up. And no doubt the government will act on the recommendation of this task force to recommend more gas development in Australia, both onshore and offshore. Now, uh, I understand uh, the COVID uh, committee, uh, which Senator Seawitt uh, is the Greens' representative for, will be calling, uh, will be hoping to call the, um, the CEO of this uh, national COVID-19 National Coordination Commission, Nev Power, to talk more about the processes around the recommendations to the government. But it has been noted, and I, uh, I do want to put on record uh, the acknowledge the excellent sleuthing by uh, a media outlet called Medium uh, and Dan Gosher, who's managed to pull together some of the detail around the people that have been appointed to this task force. And he makes note uh, that uh, Nev Power, um, of course, is known as being a bit of a doer uh, in uh, in circles, uh, having worked with uh, Twiggy Forest, is uh, Fortescue Metal Groups, and getting that up and running as a global iron ore powerhouse. But of course, both him and uh, Mr. Forest also have uh, energy interests, uh, interests in uh, gas exploration companies. And I understand Nev Power while retired from Fortescue Metal Group in 2018, is now a non-executive director of Strike Energy, which is planning to develop gas reserves in the Perth Basin in Western Australia. On that uh, National Coordination Task Force is also Energy Australia CEO Catherine Tanner. Uh, and Energy Australia owns two coal-fired power stations, Mount Piper in New South Wales and Yalorn in Victoria, and is Australia's second largest carbon polluter emitting 22 million tonnes of CO2 in 2018. And the CEO, Catherine Tanner, also sits on the board of the Business Council of Australia. So no doubt this is part of the game of mates that this government has set up to facilitate a gas-led recovery that uh, Minister Taylor has been so, so open about. Um, but let's have a closer look at the, uh, at least in face value, of the Manufacturing Task Force, which is led by former Dow Chemicals boss Andrew Liveris. Now, while he's a director of IBM and ASX listed Worsley uh, and Novanix, he's also on the board of Saudi Ar Aramaco. Yes, Saudi Aramaco, and has long advocated for natural gas as a silver bullet for Australian energy woes. Now, this has been reported uh, in this article, Medium. Um, he's also uh, joined on this task force by AI Group CEO Innes Will 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 Willox. Manufacturing Australia CEO Ben Ede and Manufacturing Australia Chair and former Invitec, Incitec Pivot CEO and current Director of APA Group James Fazzino. Now, Inex Wilcox has a long history of opposing uh, climate policy in Australia, according to Medium. Clive Hamilton named Wilcox as one of his so called dirty dozen in 2014, the 12 Australians most responsible for blocking climate action. The AI Group Members include AGL Energy, Blue Sky Steel, Borrell and Woolworths campaigned against the carbon price openly in 2012 to 2014 and support the development of new thermal coal mines in the Galilee Basin. They have also lobbied against moratorium on onshore gas developments. And UK based NGO influence MAP ranked AI Group amongst the most highly climate oppositional industry associations in the world. Similarly, Manufacturing Australia 
has routinely opposed and campaigned against climate action, most notably Manufacturing Australia opposed the closure of the Liddell coal-fired power station and supported Alinta Energy's bid to acquire the clunker from AGL in order to keep it opening indefinitely, and it has also called for a domestic gas reservation policy. And, uh, as also uh, reported by Medium, former Incitec Pivot CEO and APA Group Director James Fazzino is, unsurprisingly, also a big fan of gas. And anyone can read that article for themselves. It goes into a lot more detail about why that is the case. But just look at some of the public comments that have been made. I've talked about uh, Minister Taylor. But last week, uh, the NCCC Chair, Nev Power, was more explicit in his statement saying to the Sydney Morning Herald, we need competitive energy prices, particularly gas, to attract large-scale manufacturing like fertiliser and petrochemicals. Now, that was also reported in The Australian and The Guardian. He went further. We have significant reserves of gas up on the east coast that are not connected up. We have significant reserves in Central Australia and significant reserves in Western Australia. There are options to connect our major demand centres with our major supply centres, and so on and so forth. We've seen our Environment Minister talk about weakening green tape, so-called green tape. We know the deregulation uh, commission has been rolled into the COVID commission. And what this is a recipe for is pushing more fossil fuels. At a time in history, at a time in history when we should be doing the exact opposite. We should be putting in place a Green New Deal, investing in renewable energy, investing in our communities, fixing the planet while providing the jobs and industries of the future, not going down this road of continuing to pollute and cook our planet. It is simply unacceptable, and the Greens will continue to expose this and will continue to put up alternative options for the future of this country. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Minister. Oh, Thank Senator you. Patrick. Thank you. Um, I apologise. No, no, no problems. Um, basically, it's time to end the uncertainty in the Great Australian Bight in relation to, uh, in relation to oil and gas exploration. Uh, this, uh, this is a bill that Centre Alliance will support, but what we want to do is we want to uh, basically bring some certainty to the fishing industry and to the uh, tourism industry uh, in South Australia. For decades, those industries have had to operate in the shadows of exploration, including seismic testing and the prospect of drilling in the Great Australian Bight. The uncertainty has stifled investment. Now, offshore oil and gas exploration in the Great Australian Bight has occurred in three major phases. In the late uh, 1960s and early 70s, the early 1990s and from 2000 through to current exploration. More than 40 oil and gas exploration permits have been granted in the Great Australian Bight and 13 exploration wells were drilled between 1972 and 2003. Since that time, only seismic testing has been conducted. We've seen BP come and go. We've seen Chevron come and go. We've seen Kuron Gas come and go and we've seen Equinor come and go. These large companies all pulled out because, quite simply, drilling for oil in the Bight is not economically viable. Meanwhile, the presence of the remaining oil companies and the ongoing prospect of drilling has adversely affected uh, investment in the fishing and, touring in and tourism industry. The fishing industry on the Eyre Peninsula alone is worth $500 million and 400 million of that goes to export. Air Peninsula tourism is worth more than $300 million. Combined, both of those industries uh, directly and indirectly employ some 5,000 South Australians. And these smaller industries pay tax, which is in great contrast to the oil and gas industry. Uh, I've looked at the tax transparency data uh, that the tax office now releases for companies that have a revenue of greater than $100 million, and we can see that Chevron Australia Holdings, Proprietary Limited, earned over the last five tax transparency years 
$15.7 billion. And to the minister, do you know how much corporate tax they've paid on that $15.7 billion of, of revenue? Absolutely zero. But if you think that's bad, let's go to ExxonMobil. $42 billion of uh, revenue over five years and not a brass razu paid in corporate tax. Uh, Kufpec Australia, another one, $1.2 billion of revenue, zero tax paid. Kuwait Petroleum Aviation Australia Proprietary Limited, $1.4 billion of revenue, zero tax paid. Uh, PP, PTTEP Australia, uh, Perth, $2 billion, zero corporate tax paid. Tokyo Gas Australia, $1.7 billion, zero corporate tax paid. So we've got a contrast. We've got the tourism industry in South Australia. We've got the, uh, uh, the, the fishing industry in South Australia, hard-working mums and dads, various different sizes of companies, all paying tax. And they're, they're unfortunately overshadowed uh, by the oil and gas companies who are uh, basically dithering around in the Great Australian Bight. Now, let's look at uh, a couple of those companies, or uh, uh, one of them at least, uh, Chevron. And I'm grateful for the ATO. The ATO has done a fantastic job here. I'm not always complimentary towards them, um, but uh, they pursued uh, Chevron. Chevron uh, borrowed money from its corporate parent at 9%. Its corporate parent, of course, got it at 1%. And they got caught out. And the, you know what, how much the tax office got back? $866 million. That was in a, uh, in a lawsuit uh, that, uh, that the tax office won. Now, anyone who's in business knows that you have to have arm's length transactions. You have to have uh, uh, a proper accounting between uh, a daughter company and a parent company. It's not rocket science, it's basic, basic business. And yet uh, Chevron didn't know this somehow. And I say they did, and I say that they stole from the tax office, and that means they stole from the Australian public. We've got a lot of companies uh, running around uh, right now looking for, for handouts, for help. And I don't mind giving people help, but please, I hope none of these oil companies come to us for help because they haven't paid any tax. And they'll say, but we pay PRRT. Firstly, uh, that has been shown to be totally inadequate, and we always also need to understand that that is a separate tax that is uh, provided uh, to the Australian public because they take our oil and gas out from underneath the sea. So, I will be moving an amendment uh, to this bill that will limit exploration leases in the Greater Australian Bight to 10 years. Bight Petroleum is currently in the, uh, in the Greater Australian Bight. As an example, they have sought and received six exploration permit extensions since 2011 um, for each of their permits, uh, so it's for both of them, EPP 41 and 42. These permit areas are close to Port Lincoln and Kangaroo Island. Uh, so we're not trying to say to these companies, uh, stop immediately, uh, you've lost your investment. Uh, we're just saying you need to, uh, that you need to commit or leave. Use it or lose it is the uh, is the common term. See, what these companies do is they hold on to the asset, and the lease uh, conditions by, uh, uh, that, that NOPTA impose upon them is that they're not required to develop uh, any uh, particular resource if it's not commercially viable. But commercially viable to them might mean that in order to, uh, to drill, they have to go and get an asset that's actually being used productively somewhere else, and that, so therefore it's not commercially suitable. And uh, they, they use 
uh, this system to just keep renewing and renewing and renewing, and we let them do that. And in the meantime, that, that oil and gas that, that uh, could have been extracted to assist us here in Australia is not extracted. And in the case of the Great Australian Bight, we all recall Equinor, they simply would have extracted that, that oil and exported it. And again, with, uh, without tax being paid. So we've got to stop this. We've got to give certainty to South Australian industries, to fi the fisheries industry, uh, to the tourism industry uh, on the Eyre Peninsula, uh, ne across near Victor Harbour, uh, all the way down to Mount Gambier. We've got to give certainty uh, that they can make investments and know what, what uh, lies ahead in terms of their future. So during, uh, 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 after the second uh, reading vote, I will be moving uh, an amendment. Sorry, Senator Patrick, you moving a second reader amendment or? Uh, sorry, in, at, at uh, committee at stage. Committee stage. Thank you, um, Minister. I believe. Oh no, we've got a second reading amendment first. Okay, sorry, big pardon. So I'm jumping no, the no, gun. No, it's fine. I should have jumped. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Deputy President, and uh, I thank, thank senators for their contributions uh, to uh, to this debate. Uh, contributions which ranged uh, far and wide from what's a relatively narrow package of amendments uh, to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006. Um, this bill uh, enables the title administration and regulation of offshore greenhouse gas storage formations straddling state and Commonwealth jurisdiction. This will facilitate, for example, the carbon nets pro proposed project storage site, uh, which is investigating the feasibility for a commercial-scale multi-user carbon capture and storage network in Gippsland of Victoria. This, in turn, is a, is a crucial element of support for the Hydrogen Energy Supply Chain Project, which has attracted uh, Commonwealth Government, Victorian Government uh, and international partners, which relies on suitable CCS as part of uh, its trial around effective hydrogen generation in, uh, in that space. The package also contains a measure to strengthen and clarify the monitoring, inspection and enforcement powers of the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority NOPSEMA, and within state and northern territory jurisdictions in the unlikely event of an oil pollution emergency originating in Commonwealth waters. The amendments will enable NOPSEMA to monitor whether a title holder is in compliance with its oil spill response obligations and take enforcement action in the event of non-compliance. They also extend the operation of polluter pays obligations uh, and uh, application of significant incident directions to areas of state and Northern Territory jurisdiction. Acknowledging the recommendation made by the Senate Committee on Economic Legislation uh, report on this bill, the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources has advised that APIA was consulted on an exposure draft of the bill and they raised related or similar concerns at the time. And in a response, the department undertook to share and discuss those concerns with NOPSEMA to ensure that the matters were canvassed in relevant guidance and protocols as appropriate. And the APS submission to the Senate committee will also be given due consideration during the development of the guidance and protocols that will follow these legislative changes. The government acknowledges the concerns expressed by APIA but considers that the matters are more appropriately dealt with in those guidance terms rather than legislation. And the guidance and protocols will assist to ensure clarity and procedural certainty in the unlikely event that the provisions need to be activated. I thank senators for uh, their contributions uh, to the debate and uh, commend the bill with those specific uh, amendments to it to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. We'll now deal with the second reading amendment. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Thank you. So we'll make sure that the Greens' votes be recorded. Um, I call the minister. Yes. So beg your pardon. So um, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. So those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures, Bill 2019. Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment Miscellaneous, Matters, uh, Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2019. Thank 
queue. We'll just move into committee stage. Oh, staying up here. <laughs> These new arrangements. Senator Patrick. With the chair's indulgence, I'd like to record Senator Alliance's support for the second reader that the Greens moved. Okay. So, so second reader. Right, so we sorry. just backtrack a bit. All right. Yeah. And just before I apologise for that. That's okay. Thank so you. is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? There being no objection is so ordered. So the question is that the bills be agreed. Uh, Senator Hanson, yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam um, Deputy President. Uh, I've circulated an amendment in the chamber today uh, relating to this bill, which would put a moratorium on oil drilling in the Great Australian Bight. We all know that the debate over oil drilling in the Great Australian Bight and has been um, hard fought. The majority of South Australians want to protect the Great Australian Bight. They want to protect our beaches. They want to keep our marine uh, wonder world pristine. And the last thing they want is to see the Great Australian Bight turned into an oil and a gas field. This would, given the decision uh, some months ago by Equinor of withdrawing their proposal to drill in the Great Australian Bight, this amendment is now very well timed because there is no current proposal before government, uh, before uh, NOPSEMA, the agency for drilling in the bite. So this is the wonderful opportunity we now have to realise the hopes and dreams of South Australians and many other Australians right across this country to protect the Great Australian Bite for good, to make sure uh, that uh, we don't uh, allow um, any big corporation to come in and think that they can trash what is a pristine, internationally important area, a whale sanctuary, an area where there is 80 per cent of the species who live in the Great Australian Bight are found nowhere else on earth. This is a very, very special place. and um, People were fearful of what would happen if Equinor had been given the tick of approval and had gone ahead with turning the Great Australian Bight into an oil field. Let's make sure we do what South Australians want, and that is to protect the bite for good. Putting in place a moratorium on drilling is a really good way to send a signal to industry, to overseas companies and to the Australian people that the government has listened to the wills and the desires of the community. Make no mistake, it was the community campaign particularly out of South Australia, but it spread right across the country of people wanting to protect this area. They wanted to protect the Great Australian Bight because it is so unique and it is so special. But they also know that turning the Great Australian Bight into an oil field would have made it very, very difficult for us to ever tackle climate change properly into the future. The enormous amount of carbon that would be emitted as a result of these drilling operations and the product coming out would make it near impossible for Australia to keep global warming below two degrees. And we know, Madam Deputy President, we've got a long way to go to reduce the carbon pollution we already have, let alone making the job even harder because uh, opening up the Great Australian Bight would put even more pollution uh, out there and into the atmosphere. So for two key reasons, the science and the will of the community, it is absolutely essential that this parliament today acknowledges that we need a moratorium on protecting the Great Australian Bight and a moratorium on any type of drilling uh, in that area. And to, the, and to that point, one of the best things we could do is celebrate how good the bite is by giving it world heritage protection, by making sure that the area that is now uh, able to be protected is given the full opportunity to have it celebrated as an area where people from all over the world will want to visit, where Australians will want to visit. We know that South Australia's tourism industry has been kicked hard over the last few months. First, the bushfires, the devastation on Kangaroo Island and the Adelaide Hills, and now, of course, with coronavirus and COVID-19, South Australia's tourism has been decimated. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if this government made an investment in our state and our state's tourism by protecting the bite and celebrating it as a place to be visited and, set and, uh, and rejoiced? This is what South Australians want, and I implore this government. I know that it was going to always be difficult to make a change while there was an application on foot. We don't have that problem anymore. Equinor, that Norwegian company, pulled out. They've gone. Let's now step in and do what is right. Say no to oil and gas drilling in the bite and yes to world heritage protection. That's what this amendment does, and I encourage my fellow senators to support it. So, Senator um, Hanson Young, you alluded to the amendment. Did you wish to move that way? I do wish to move that amendment, and I'm sure there's some other senators in this yep. uh, chamber who'd wish to you have seeking their say. leave to move them together. Thank you. Thank you. So that is um, sheet eight 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 six one and two together by leave. Um, Senator Farrell. Thank you. Uh, I rise to uh, speak on the amendment to the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, cross boundary. Greenhouse Gas Titles and Other Measures Bill 2019. The amendment is moved by Senator Hanson Young of the Australian Green. The amendment is also referred to as the moratorium Great Australian Bite Drilling. That's an accurate summary of what the amendment does. The Greens effectively require that this bill only commence if it contains a moratorium on a exploring for petroleum in the Commonwealth uh, Great Australian Bite area b recovering uh, petroleum in the, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Great Australian Bight area, and c <coughs> carrying on the operations uh, in the uh, Commonwealth Great Australian Bight for those purposes. Uh, we oppose this uh, moratorium for several reasons. Firstly, this bill um, is concerned with greenhouse gas storage. It makes changes to petroleum title so that the Commonwealth regulator for the offshore petroleum at, at activities at uh, NOPSEMA can have oversight of offshore greenhouse gas storage activities that straddle both state and Commonwealth waters. It means one regulator has oversight of greenhouse gas storage activities in different jurisdictions. This is being done for improved environmental management and improved workplace safety in the greenhouse gas storage industry of the future. The bill is also, <coughs> according to the explanatory memorandum, concerned with the proposed greenhouse gas storage operations in the Bass Strait regarding uh, the carbon net and hydrogen, hydrogen energy strategy in Victoria. This bill is not concerned with the Great Australian Bight and is not specifically concerned with petroleum exploration, recovery or petroleum operations. These amendments from the Greens detract from a bill that is attempting to improve environmental and workplace uh, safety outcomes in greenhouse gas storage a technology that will help Australia reduce its greenhouse gas emissions into the future. We therefore oppose the amendments. So the question is that the um, amendment has moved, the amendments <coughs> have moved by uh, Minister. Thanks, um, thanks Chair. Uh, the government, uh, government opposes uh, this amendment, uh, this amendment uh, uh, in singling out uh, the Great Australian Bight uh, will uh, or would exclude um, a significant area of, uh, of potential uh, for Australia's oil and gas sector uh, from possibly being realised in the future. Uh, the government remains committed to encouraging the safe and sustainable development uh, of Australia's offshore petroleum resources, overseen by world-class regulator and regulatory standards uh, through the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority, or NOPSEMA. Uh, as senators are well aware, uh, to provide additional assurances around NOPSEMA's processes, their robustness uh, and their foundation upon science and evidence, uh, last year the government commissioned an independent audit of NOPSEMA's assessment of exploration activities in the Great Australian Bight. This was conducted by the chief scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, together with experts in community engagement, geoscience, marine science and offshore exploratory drilling and regulation. The audit found that NOPSEMA is a highly skilled professional and competent regulator, has appropriate processes and practices to ensure environment plans are assessed against relevant, sufficient and complete scientific and technical information and against the requirements of relevant legislation. 
Communities around the Bight should be assured that oil and gas exploration where undertaken is undertaken safely. Uh, I note the interjections from Senator Hanson Young there, uh, and I would equally note that in other parts of Australia uh, where we have seen uh, oil or gas drilling undertaken for decades, uh, there is successful coexistence of industries like tourism, like fisheries, like other agricultural industries within those same regions. This, uh, this proposed amendment uh, is not proposed on the basis of science or rigorous assessment processes, but is simply opposition to resource development. And indeed, I think everybody uh, in this chamber, if they were being honest, would acknowledge that if the Greens thought they could propose an amendment uh, that banned all drilling exploration in any Australian waters, they would cheerily put that forward as well. The Bight has strong and appropriate protections with 14 marine parks covering some 508,371 square kilometres and stretching from Kangaroo Island to the Abrahos Islands uh, in Western Australia, uh, all part of the South West Marine Park Network. Uh, the Bight Basin does remain one of Australia's frontier basins and any proposals for new oil and gas fields in this area will be assessed fairly and independently by NOPSEMA, uh, whose uh, powers and authorities uh, are expanded as a result of the bill that we are putting forward in terms of protections provided. Uh, and uh, For those reasons, the government opposes the amendment. So the question is, the amendment is moved by Senator Hanson Young on sheet 8886, one and two by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. I, Deputy President, I would have called a division, but given um, the social distance uh, practice we're taking, I would ask that the Greens, um, that I would ask that every party's vote be recorded in Hansard. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. We'll make sure that the uh, the Greens' opposition is agreed to. I'm just seeking the advice of the clerk whether all parties can. So, um, Senator Hanson Young, you can record your support for your amendment. So, so um, Madam Chair, I would like some clarification on this because sure. I, I understood that the Labor Party voted against this amendment. I also understood that the Liberal Party yes, votes against correct. this amendment. Um, the Greens are voting for it. I think mm -hmm. Senator Alliance is going to vote for it and support it. Um, I would like that recorded in Hansard because otherwise I may as well call a division mm -hmm. so it's very clear as to where the parties stand. Okay, so may I suggest you seek leave and if leave is agreed to that's how we, it can mm -hmm. be recorded. So can we take it that you've sought leave? Thank you. Is leave granted? Sure. Leave is granted. So it will be recorded as you outlined with, the, with your support for the amendment and we only have we only have in this place the acknowledgement of the government and the Labor opposition that they're not supporting the amendment. Uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, it, it might be helpful um, um, if, uh, if both the government and opposition just simply stood up and stated their position. Uh, um, then Senator it's, then Patrick, it's, then it's we've had the debate. Sure. The parties have stood okay. up. Um, I would like we've now got leave, so it will be recorded as I've just outlined. So that's unless you're now contributing to something else. I'd like to actively uh, Record on the record that Senator Alliance would support. The, would Thank you. Support this. So uh, we will do that as well. This motion. Thank you. All right. I'm in the hands of the chamber. We've dealt with um, that amendment, Senator Patrick. Um, Madam Chair, I um, um, move um, amendment one and two uh, on by leave on together on uh, sheet eight eight uh, nine seven. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And I did cover this in my uh, in my second reader, but just to uh, uh, um, make the chamber alert to what this is about. This is a an amendment that seeks to uh, place a time limit on exploration uh, in the Great Australian Bight, basically saying that you cannot perpetually get extensions upon extensions upon extensions that uh, stifle investment in. Uh, uh, the tourist industry uh, and indeed uh, the, f the, f the f um, fishing industry, uh, particularly on the Eyre Peninsula, but uh, right along the South Australian coastline. Uh, 
I, I will make the point uh, that uh, I, I know uh, Minister Birmingham did stand, rise and, and talked about the need uh, for energy. Uh, his position would be more uh, palatable if, for example, um, and I say this uh, with Centre Alliance, uh, uh, quite supportive of things like gas as a transitional uh, energy source. We're not seeking to stop uh, things, but at the same time, we are seeking uh, government direction <coughs> and leadership in relation to things like electric vehicles that can reduce our dependencies on oil and gas. And nothing seems to be happening in that space. And we know that electric vehicles, for example, uh, not only do they uh, assist in terms of uh, reducing reliance on uh, oils. Uh, but they also uh, improve productivity. Uh, uh, electric vehicles uh, involve less maintenance. They have less moving parts than, uh, than regular vehicles. They uh, don't emit poisonous gases in the same way that uh, internal combustion engine cars do. Uh, it, it, it is the future, and most people, most countries around the world have adopted electric vehicles. They are encouraging electric vehicles and indeed have placed limits upon uh, the time frame in which it will be possible to purchase an internal combustion engine uh, vehicle. And uh, so I just, uh, uh, as, as I move this, indicates the government that there are things that you can do where there's a win-win, uh, and unfortunately not uh, showing leadership in those sorts of areas. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the amendment to the uh, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Cross-Boundary Greenhouse Gas Titles and Other Measures Bill 2019. This amendment is moved by uh, Senator uh, Rex Patrick from the uh, Centre Alliance. <clears throat> it primarily concerns the duration of petroleum exploration permits. And the amendment only applies to offshore exploration permits in the Great Australian Bight. The amendment uh, would limit the extension of the Commonwealth Offshore Petroleum Exploration Permit so that no exploration permit can be granted for more than 10 years in the Great Australian Bight. The 10-year limit also applies to transitional provisions and to permits already in force. Uh, there are problems with Senator Patrick's uh, amendments. Um, firstly, it has little to do with the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendments, cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other uh, measures bill. The bill ensures that where there are offshore greenhouse gas storage areas that straddle Commonwealth and state um, and territory titles, uh, that the Commonwealth's offshore petroleum regulators have authority. The bill is intended to ensure that the strongest safety and environmental protections are in place for offshore greenhouse gas storage operations and that a Commonwealth regulator, such as NOPSEMA, can enforce them. The bill is not concerned with limiting the duration of exploration permits. Secondly, Senator Patrick's amendment. Um, with due respect, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, I was quiet while Senator uh, Patrick uh, produced his drivel. Um, could you please um, request the same courtesy? I'll just remind senators. I mean, we are in committee of the whole, and there's usually a little bit of leeway given. But I remind senators that um, it is the um, requirement that you are uh, you refrain from heckling during someone else's contribution. Thank you, Senator thank Farrell. You, thank you for that protection, Chair. Um, secondly, Senator Patrick's uh, amendment limits the duration of offshore exploration permits, but only in the Great Australian Bight. No reasons are given. Uh, this is the effect of treating one operator differently to others, based not on their actions or misdeeds, but on where they are exploring. This goes to the third point. There are already established ways to create protected marine areas. To properly protect marine areas, we don't have to introduce anomalies to bills that are concerned with quite separate matters. The offshore greenhouse gas storage, cross-boundary gas and other titles bills strengthens environmental and safety regulation of greenhouse gas storage, an important technology to help Australia reduce its future carbon emissions. The bill is not concerned with the duration of exploration permits on one part of Australia's coast. For this reason, 
Those uh, <coughs> listed above, we oppose Senator Patrick's amendment. Thank you, Senator <coughs> Farrell. Um, are you seeking the call, Minister? There are no other contributions. So, thanks, um, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, the government, uh, the government uh, also opposes this amendment uh, for many of the same reasons that I outlined in relation to the earlier amendment, which, uh, which I won't repeat. This amendment is uh, uh, slightly different uh, in, that, uh, in that it seeks to create a new and separate class of petroleum title uh, for the specific geographic area uh, that, uh, that encompasses the Great Australian Bight in Commonwealth offshore waters. Um, so rather than it being the, uh, the blanket ban as, uh, as proposed uh, by the Greens, uh, it instead creates uh, a new and different uh, title. Uh, the government has concerns that, uh, that this uh, would certainly leave um, investors um, uh, questioning the viability of such investment, that it would create uh, considerable additional financial risk uh, in frontier areas like the Great Australian Bight uh, relative to, uh, to other parts. It's an area that obviously already, as a frontier area, comes with significant risk and the proposed amendment would compound those uncertainties, heighten sovereign risk and make investors look elsewhere for safer projects and more certain uh, regulation. Uh, I note Senator Patrick's comments in relation to, uh, to other matters, uh, electric vehicles and, uh, and the like. Uh, whilst I don't have a comprehensive list of, uh, of actions um, in the chamber with me on, uh, on those unrelated topics, uh, the, uh, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, for example, has uh, uh, engaged in a number of co-finance programs with major banks and non-bank lenders in relation to EVs, uh, and, uh, and I know the CEFC and ARENA continue to, uh, to engage in other work to enhance and promote the adoption of EVs. So the question is, the amendment, uh, Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just uh, rise to offer the green support of this amendment um, and make that clear. And I'd like that recorded when we um, uh, move the motion. Move the amendment. Okay. Right. right. So the question is that the um, amendment, as moved by Senator Patrick, on sheet eight eight nine seven one and two, by leave together, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it, and as requested by Senator Hanson Young, if we show that the Greens uh, supported that amendment. So uh, that now deals with the amendment. So the uh, the question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it that the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures bill 2019 um, be agreed to uh, as amended be agreed to and the offshore <laughs> my mistake so um, the next question is that the bills be reported those of that opinion say aye, aye. against i believe the ayes have it so I'll now report from Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Cross-Boundary Greenhouse Gas Titles and Other Measures Bill 2019, together with Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill of 2019, and agreed to them without amendments. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Call the minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Cross-Boundary Greenhouse Gas Titles and Other Measures Bill 2019. Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2019. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill and the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill. This is a bill the government 
could have passed in late 2017. It is a bill they could have passed in late 2018. And it is a bill they could have passed in March 2020. We are glad that after three years of strange delays, it is being brought to a vote in the Senate here today. According to reports in The Australian this morning, we read that NBN Co will take up on up to a further $4 billion in debt to fund the network. This curiously timed announcement comes on the same day the government seeks to progress a broadband tax in the Senate. These twin events are symptoms of a $51 billion multi-technology mix that has reduced the cash flows available to the NBN by $500 million per year. The reduction in long-term cash flows arises from a reliance on older technologies that cost much more to operate, generate less revenue and incur billions in upgrade costs that would not have been occurred under the original NBN plan. The fact NBN are already saying that they need to take on more debt is a vindication that doing it once with fibre and doing it right was economically superior all along. I will return to this point later. In the previous term of parliament, Labor introduced several amendments that sought to reduce the impact of the levy on greenfield networks built before 1 July 2020, cap the levy charge so it could not rise to $10 a month, and make rollout data publicly available on the nationalmap.gov.au website. Those amendments lapsed because the government did not bring its bill to a vote. I want to thank the Senate crossbench for their in principle support for these amendments at the time and acknowledge those ALP amendments that have been incorporated by the government into this bill. Labor supports the establishment of a statutory infrastructure provider regime outlined in this bill. The proposed framework will provide additional certainty that as we move beyond the initial rollout, newly constructed premises can access high-speed broadband. This is, of course, a natural extension of the arrangements Labor put in place nearly 10 years ago through a statement of expectations issued to the NBN board. The statement of expectations required the NBN company to make high-speed broadband available to all Australians, regardless of where they live or work. That has happened, will continue to happen, and this bill provides certainty that it will continue. After more than a decade in power through the 1990s and 2000s, the Liberal Party had left Australia with broadband infrastructure that was incompatible with our aspirations as a nation. It was Labor who carved out the principle that all Australians should have access to modern telecommunications infrastructure. It was Labor who stood up for the regions, not with rhetoric, but with a considered policy to deliver universal access to high-speed broadband universal pricing and investment to make that a reality. The Liberals opposed the NBN. The Liberals opposed the NBN satellite. They did not promote meaningful competition in the regions. They did nothing to promote broadband investment in the regions. It was the Liberals who privatised Telstra as a vertically integrated monopoly. So let us be clear. After 10 years, the legacy of those opposite when it came to regional communications was te technological stagnation and higher prices. The Labor Party put an end to that mediocrity, mediocrity with its plan for the national broadband network. Here today, the government is claiming it is putting in place a framework for regional broadband funding. Let's, through, let's run through some of the facts and put this into context. At inception, Labor designed the NBN to provide universal access in the cities and the regions. This plan provided for 7 per cent of Australian premises to be served through a combination of fixed wireless and satellite technology. Because these networks run at a financial loss, an internal cross-subsidy was implemented to fund these regional networks. As of today, the internal cross-subsidy implemented under Labor is already generating $580 million per annum. By 2022, it will generate $800 million per annum. The broadband tax devised by this government raises barely one twentieth of revenue from the regional funding mechanism Labor put in place a decade ago. One twentieth. As I noted earlier, 
the multi-technology mix has reduced the cash flows of NBN by $500 million per annum compared to the original fibre plan. This means the capacity of NBN to invest or return dividends has been reduced by $500 million per annum. This is a consequence of the older technologies, namely copper and HFC, that are costing hundreds of millions a year more to operate. They generate less revenue over the medium term and they re require hundreds of millions more per annum in maintenance capital. These are not Labor's figures. This is based on the NBN Co's own figures. The proposed levy recovers less than one-tenth of the cash flow that has been lost due to the change in technologies. To give one last example, the cost of the NBN rollout increased by $2 billion in the corporate plan before last. The interest um, bill just a moment, Senator Kitching. Um, it's not, staff are not to come onto the floor of the chamber. Thank you, Senator Kitching. The interest bill alone from that increase is nearly double what this levy raises. Lastly, we recently learned that in the 2020 corporate plan, regional investment was quietly reduced by $200 million. This is despite the government incorporating revenues from this unlegislated levy into the NBN corporate plan. What this means is that even after the government took into account the revenues, this levy would raise they went ahead, the revenues this levy would raise, they went ahead and agreed to reduce funding for the regional fixed wireless network anyway. It raises a legitimate question. Why is the government progressing a $7 per month broadband tax in the name of regional funding while reducing regional NBN investment at the same time? And why did they try to conceal this funding reduction in the 2020 NBN corporate plan? The tempered reality is the levy before this parliament will not have a material impact on the regional NBN funding profile. It adds $40 million to cross-subsidy revenues against an existing baseline of $800 million per annum. Further, it does not come close to offsetting the reduction in NBN cash flows resulting from the switch to an economically compromised multi-technology mix. So you may be wondering. What is the primary purpose of the levy? Well, when you strip away all of the rhetoric, the minister wants to reduce competition with NBN by placing a tax on companies that compete with NBN. Reducing competition will, in turn, help protect the current revenues that NBN generates. Deterring unnecessary and counterproductive duplication of fixed line infrastructure is important, given the considerable investment taxpayers have made. Labor has been upfront and consistent about its position on this. We do not want to see fixed line networks overbuilding each other. However, the government doesn't have the decency to admit that this is what this bill is actually about. On the 28th of November 2019, the Senate referred the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019 to the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee for inquiry. Before I go to the bill, it's important to cover some of the history. Prior to the 2013 election, Mr Turnbull, the former Prime Minister, and others were running around encouraging private companies to compete directly with the government-owned entity. They didn't do this out of principle. They did this because they wanted to wreck the NBN. They wanted it to fail because it was a Labor concept. Then 10 days after the 2013 election, TPG announced it wanted to expand a fibre to the basement network in inner city areas to up to half a million homes. As you would expect, this created some alarm, both within NBN Co and within the government. They understood, as anyone with common sense would understand, that if TPG began cherry-picking profitable parts of the fixed line NBN footprint, then the economics of the project would become unstuck. This was not in the interest of taxpayers, and it was not in the public interest, given that the NBN was, at that point, a reality. The concept of what was to become the proposed broadband levy was considered as part of a government-initiated Vertigan review in 2014, which examined different options to offset NBN's losses in fixed wireless and satellite networks. 
The minister has claimed that the government adopted this levy because it was a recommendation of the Vertigan Review. That is not true. Allow me to quote what the Vertican Review report actually said. By far the best option for funding any ongoing subsidy would be through consolidated revenue. Among other advantages, that would allow Parliament and the public to assess in an ongoing way the benefits of using taxpayer funds for this purpose rather than others. However, should that option not be adopted, the panel recommends that, if an ongoing subsidy is required and its minimum, minimum amount can be reliably determined, a single annual broad-based industry levy covering both voice and broadband services be imposed to fund that subsidy. This would be similar to the current arrangements for the universal service obligation, which are outlined in Appendix 3. So let us make two things clear. First, the Vertican, report, the Vertican Review did not recommend a levy on the industry and consumers as its first preference. Its preference was funding from consolidated revenue. Second, the levy recommended by the review was a broad-based levy. The bill before us does not propose a broad-based levy. What the government has done is design a levy with a narrow base in order to produce a high charge. The reason they've done that is for the purpose of, of, the purpose of preventing competition. The public then has to put up with the spectacle of the minister writing an op-ed pretending the bill is about boosting competition. And this brings me to an important point, Madam Deputy President. The coalition have built an inferior NBN for $51 billion. This has cost taxpayers more than the original fibre network. It costs more to operate. The older technologies also require more future funding for upgrades that would not have been necessary under the original plan. At a speech to CEDA last year, the minister said, we are going to need to rely on and boost competition to make sure that our fixed networks continue to upgrade and stay in tune with world developments. Yet the legislation being proposed by the minister directly contradicts this statement. This bill is designed to achieve the exact opposite. With due respect, this is the sort of doublespeak you would expect to hear at a marketing seminar. What this government is asking the telecommunications industry to believe is a legislative package headlined by a broadband tax should be seen as a gift to improve competition. While it may be inconvenient to concede, the primary reason the government instigated the levy was to deter TPG from cherry-picking inner-city basements given the negative impact this would have on the economics of the NBN. Most of the industry, including Labor, support that objective. Labor has always been upfront about that. We do believe it is in both in the interests of taxpayers and in the public interest. Yet from the outset, the government has been too insecure to acknowledge this as an objective of their policy. Instead, to give the appearance of having a more neutral purpose, the levy was expanded into greenfield networks. The greenfield networks don't cause revenue leakage to NBN Co. And if it wasn't for oper operators such as Opticom, peak funding for the NBN build would be higher. Think about it. If private operators were not building fibre networks in these areas, NBN would have had to draw on more taxpayer funding to do so. How does a supposed pro-market, pro-investment Liberal Party reward these operators? They reward them with a tax on their operations and on their customers. This levy was also extended to enterprise markets. Not only is there no rev revenue leakage to NBN Co, but we have a situation where NBN Co often causes revenue leakage to the incumbent. This was captured very well in a submission by Optus, which noted, the provision of services to enterprise and government customers over non-NBN networks does not displace any NBN Co protected revenue or preclude NBN Co from making sufficient revenue from its metro connections to internally cross-subsidise the fixed wireless and satellite networks. Notwithstanding various concerns, Labor focused on introducing a legislative amendment to help grandfather existing greenfield networks built before 1 July 2019 until the policy could be revisited at a later time. We did not consider the retrospective application of the levy to be fair, as greenfield networks in new development estates did not pass the test of causing revenue leakage to the NBN Co. So, I will just go firstly to secondly. We, I want to run through Labor's positions on the bills. We're going to support the Competition and Consumer Bill. Um, it's a sensible piece of legislation, and we're also um, going to support. Um, 
we're going to introduce an amendment to require the levy modelling to be updated and a report produced within 150 days. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Your time days. has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. Uh, I rise to speak on these two bills, and um, I, I just want to correct Senator Kitching um, in her claim that the coalition does not support the NBN. Uh, I totally reject that claim. In fact, <coughs> the coalition, uh, when we came into government in 2013, we inherited, uh, inherited an absolute shambles. A, a, a shambles that any government should hang their head in shame of. We inherited an NBN that was full of promise but very, very light on actual action and implementation. In fact, since it was first devised in 2007, only 51,000 premises had been connected by the time we came into government in 2013. And since then, we have completely overhauled the NBN such that we are now on track to deliver the NBN on time across Australia to, to premises throughout the nation by a range of technologies, not just one size fits all, but a range suited to the area, the region and certainly indeed and the purpose for this bill in regional Australia, which is where I'm most focused and where my personal experience lies. I support these bills for three key reasons. They make changes to the regulatory framework for telecommunications that will strengthen the provision of superfast broadband infrastructure across Australia, but particularly in our regions. They increase competition in both wholesale and retail markets and will lead to better outcomes for consumers. And they provide sustainable funding for essential broadband services in regional, rural and remote Australia. Now, I think we've all experienced in the last few months what it truly means to need to be connected. We're working from home, we have children who are doing school from home, and it is really coming to the fore of how important it is in this modern world and if we want to, going forward and post-COVID-19, uh, to recognise and really provide facilities for flexible working arrangements and, uh, and, and make it, uh, provide more opportunity to Australians and to consumers. I live in the bush. I've had my two children at home, schooling from home, and I access the NBN through satellite. Without that service, there is no way that my children could be doing their schooling sufficiently and that I would be able to access and service my constituents and continue to work for my community in regional New South Wales. That is why it is so important that we recognise that we need to be fair across all parts of Australia. We need to finish the NBN. We need to get it in place. It is not just ensuring that our children can go to school, however, because hopefully very soon, if we continue to flatten the curve, our children can go back to school and we can go back to work in whichever capacity is suitable for us. But regional, rural and remote Australia has its own challenges, and mental health is a significant issue right now. We have seen reports where drastically modelling shows that there is potential for increased suicides in the months and years going forward post-COVID. Telehealth for mental health is so important and provides people access to services that they may not otherwise be able to, to reach out for. And that is why having good NBN with good internet services, uh, supported by voice services, which these bills also require, are so important for our regional communities. And with our farms becoming more and more technologically advanced and our regional communities benefiting from be able, being able to access information, market their 
their commodities and their products online. I mean, I now know of farmers who, who don't go to the sale yards anymore. They actually auction their cattle from the paddock so, and, and some, someone else buys it straight from the paddock. It's cutting the stress for the animals, it's more efficient in marketing and it's utilising modern technology to its fore. That wouldn't be available without some of the NBN services that we have put in place since we came into government in 2013. And it, it supports and builds on our other investments in rural and regional communications, including the Mobile Black Spots program, all of which our government is committed to, to ensure our regions are not left behind. So how do these bills assist regional Australia? Well, firstly, it improves the regulatory framework for telecommunications companies, so it will strengthen the provision of superfast broadband infrastructure in our regions. Schedule 3 of this bill does this by setting out a new statutory, statutory infrastructure provider regime. Currently, there is no existing requirement for MBN to have to connect premises to the national broadband network and to service them on an ongoing basis into the future. This bill establishes explicit statutory requirements for NBN Co or another service provider in certain circumstances to have to connect premises to the national broadband network. NBN Co will be the default provider. However, there is now capacity for other service providers to become a statutory infrastructure provider or an SIP where there is a contract that can provide for this. The Australian Communications and Media Authority, an independent authority, will enforce the SIP regime and will do so by maintaining a register of SIP areas and registered SIPs. So regardless of whether it's NBN Co or another SIP, that is the statutory infrastructure provider, they must, on reasonable request, connect a premise to either a fixed line network or a fixed wireless network or a satellite network. Another requirement is that the wholesale services must allow retailers to provide broadband services at peak download transmission speeds of at least 25 megabits per second and a peak upload transmission speed of at least 5 megabits per second. Now that is higher than the ALP's 2007 election commitment of a peak download of 12 megabits per second. So we have delivered on the NBN, we are committed to completing the NBN and we are committed to putting in place the structures needed to ensure the NBN will be delivered and maintained into the future. In addition, SIPs must also supply wholesale services that allow voice services to end users. Now, this addresses concerns that we've had as a government and feedback that when the copper, copper network goes, when the copper wires go, the landlines go and there won't be voice services to people uh, in the regions. That will no longer be the case because this bill requires that those services must be provided to end users. It gives a flexibility for the minister to make standards with regard to timeframes for premises connection and rules for handling customer complaints and the ability to address issues such as complaints between providers that more often than not harm consumers. So we are addressing the concerns that have been brought to our government that were not addressed before, that were not addressed under the Labor model <coughs> and that now put in place a framework to help protect consumers. It gives industry and consumers confidence and certainty 
and it also deals with the significant issue of dealing with complaints in a structured way. As a member of the Joint Committee on the National Broadband Network, I have seen many of these issues about service come to us reported from all the range of small business to local governments, private families and other consumers. This legislation gives the minister that ability to make those, the determinations that will give these consumers and customers better outcomes. So this, also, this legislation also increases competition in both wholesale and retail markets, and we all know competition benefits consumers. Schedules 1 and 2 specifically deal with Schedule 1 repeals Part 7 of the Telecommunications Act and associated provisions of the Competition and Consumer Act, which exempted certain large-scale networks from some access and non-discrimination obligations by the, imposed by the ACCC. Furthermore, it created unnecessary complexity that made it difficult for the ACCC to intervene when required. Repealing Part 7 gives the ACCC more flexibility to promote competition in the market. Schedule 2 of this package amends the carrier separation rules in Part 8 of the Telecommunications Act. Because Part 8 requires networks to be wholesale only, but with a number of exemptions. The existing exemptions were for networks that existed prior to 2011, or those networks um, by up to extended those networks by up to a kilometre, and the possibility of exemptions by ministerial instruments. It was confusing. It was introduced in 2011. However, since then, the range of exemptions that are available has meant competition in the marketplace has been distorted. Incumbents with larger networks that predated 2011 clearly benefited as investment by new entrants was restricted. The amendments to Part 8 seek to redress this lack of balance. There are six main changes to this part. Networks servicing small businesses will no longer be subject to the separation rules. This will promote the entry of new network providers into this market. Carriers can operate residential superfast networks on a functionally separated basis if approved by the ACCC, and this will promote investment in such networks. The ACCC will also be able to make class exemptions for small providers of up to 2,000 services. This will facilitate market entry and encourage the use of network technology most appropriate to the consumer's requirements. Services that are supplied on networks that are wholesale only or functionally separated will be subject to non-discrimination obligations to limit network providers' ability to favour their own retail operations. The enforcement regime will be made more effective by making the obligations civil penalty provisions rather than criminal penalties, which is currently the case, which gives the ACCC more enforce enforcement options and allows for third-party enforcement. And finally, the one kilometre exemption will be limited to networks that are being transferred to NBN Co under contract. This will remove carriers' ability to roll out large network extensions that are not subject to wholesale-only requirements and thereby form local access bottlenecks that restrict consumer choice. This measure will remove certain measures that limit market entry for smaller network providers and it will thus bring more competition to benefit consumers. So, as I said at the outset, the coalition is absolutely committed to the NBN. We will roll it out, we will complete its build, and then we will have a company in the NBN Co that is supported by the right legislation so that it can carry on into the future to maintain and service the network that we have built. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Griff. Acting uh, Deputy President. At the end of next month, the rollout of the National Broadband Network will, in theory, be complete. 
It's the end of a very long road, one which supposedly began with a sketch on the back of a napkin in 2009, with a destination that looks now very different to what we first imagined. The long road was marked by a number of potholes, wrong turns and breakdowns. And you might expect policymakers have learned from this experience. Unfortunately, looking at these bills, I suspect many of the lessons have gone unlearned. The bill makes a range of changes and Centre Alliance is happy to support the majority of these. The superfast network rules, the statutory infrastructure provider regime and the transparency measures are sensible changes. My concerns are with the regional broadband scheme. As with the MBN itself, I support the policy goal of the RBS. Too often, and with too many issues, Australians and regional areas are left behind. It is entirely appropriate that the government ensures all Australians can benefit from the superfast broadband. But I have concerns with how the government has decided to fund these services. The scheme will be funded by a levy on broadband users amounting to $84 per year. This will add significantly and unnecessarily to the costs faced by low and middle income households. My first concern is with the amount. The amount comes from modelling undertaken in 2015, five years ago, which relied on cost estimates and market assumptions that were true at the time. A lot has changed in five years. The department assures us that nothing much has changed since then. But if the original bill had passed in 2017, the charge would have been reviewed by the ACCC prior to implementation and we would now be approaching its second review. Now, I understand the Labor Party intend to move an amendment which would require the ACCC to update the modelling. If they do indeed move such an amendment, Central Alliance will certainly support it. I just do not understand why the government has not already done this or why it requires legislation to force them to do so. My second concern is that the tax is targeted at users of fixed line superfast broadband. NBN Co says the customers are already paying the tax, so this new tax will only affect the half a million households using other networks. But why does the government want to target these users? My third concern is how technological change could undermine the funding base of the RBS. The modelling assumed few users would move from the fixed line to wireless services because wireless couldn't offer the same data allowances. But if you look at what's available now, it's clear wireless is already competitive with fixed line services. Once the tax is introduced, it will make fixed line broadband more expensive and some users will move to wireless services. There is absolutely no doubt. As customers go wireless, the RBS funding pool will shrink and eventually the government will have to recognise this funding method is not sustainable. So I support the goal of the regional broadband scheme but not the funding mechanism. I'm not alone in this. It is also the position of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the Productivity Commission, Telstra, Optus, Vodafone and Vocus. But unfortunately, it is not the position of this government. When the RBS policy first appeared and when it was revived last year, there were hopes the government would take the opportunity to reform the universal service obligation. The USO was last reformed in 2012 and now provides Telstra with almost $300 million a year with practically no strings attached. This money is paid to Telstra to maintain the copper network which we know is becoming increasingly redundant with no transparency or accountability. A few years ago, the Australian National Audit Office issued a scathing report about the USO agreement and the Productivity Commission called for the scheme to be wound up. In an ideal world, the government would have listened to these concerns as well. They would have designed the RBS to replace the USO and reduce the burdens that weigh on the industry. Instead, we have a scheme which makes broadband more complex 
and more expensive. At best, the regional broadband scheme is a missed opportunity to ensure that Australians in regional areas have affordable access to telecommunication services. At worst, it is another last-minute patch job that will need to be fixed in due course. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Reliable, affordable communications are not a luxury or something that should just be afforded to people living in major population centres. The response to COVID-19 has demonstrated, like nothing else, our reliance on effective telecommunications networks and infrastructure. People have effectively worked from home, and I expect many will continue to do so for some time. This will be part of a different way of life as we adjust to a post COVID world. To ensure all Australians are able to do this, we must overcome the digital divide between the cities and the bush. I note with concern, Madam Acting Deputy President, there is no guarantee that this legislation will do that. I have these concerns because regional NBN investment was reduced by $200 million in the 2020 NBN corporate plan over the period from 2018 to 2022, despite the government's broadband tax being proposed in the name of regional funding. NBN Co sought to conceal this regional funding reduction, with the company subsequently offering contradictory explanations about what had occurred and why it had occurred. There is seemingly no mechanism that requires a surplus revenue from the government's $800 million annual broadband tax to be spent on regional networks. <clears throat> in practice, there remain legitimate concerns that once the tax revenues flow into NBN Co, the company management can effectively direct surplus tax revenue towards anything they wish once it is washed through an offset account, regardless of whether the expenditure relates to a regional outcome or not. The government is introducing a broadband tax in the name of regional funding while cutting regional NBN investment at the same time. A new tax that will not fix the problem this government created. Remember, the Liberal Party voted against universal broadband access in Australia. They voted against broadband in the regions. And the Liberals stood by and did nothing as NBN Co overloaded its fixed wireless towers in regional areas, leading to slow speeds and congestion. This poor decision is costing more in the long run, and it's costing consumers in the regions most of all. For example, people who live in Alice Springs, rural area, less than 10 kilometres from the Smith Street Mall in the main area, have to rely on satellite services for their digital access. These are people who run businesses, they're people who study, they're people who are students. They cannot access the same levels of service as other residents of Alice Springs. And ironically, a new subdivision in the same area of town gets fibre to the premises to all homes. Yet people living across the road don't. Well, go figure. And the digital divide is widening in the bush. Wi-Fi use is increasing in remote communities, often exceeding data allowances but the lack of access to good basic digital infrastructure in the bush continues to be a roadblock to development. Community-led innovative and creative projects and ideas are being developed and utilised by First Nations organisations, media and creatives. Community-based content creation projects are strengthening language, culture and providing training and work opportunities. Programs that provide digital mentors to improve skills and awareness, such as in Digimob, are having really, really positive outcomes. Improved internet can lead to better opportunities for enterprise development and access to more affordable products and services. Better telecommunication services out bush can lead to jobs and economic development. Employment opportunities could open up in so many sectors with improved access. Telehealth, I've heard it spoken about here in the Senate. Well, let me tell you, we desperately need better services and access to that. And medicine, education, training, essential services, 
infrastructure support and media out in our regional and remote areas. First Nations Media Australia has long advocated for the urgent need to upgrade telecommunications services and infrastructure. First Nations media organisations are an essential service underlined by the vital role they've been playing in crafting and broadcasting relevant and appropriate messages and content to their audiences during the response to COVID-19. We have used First Nations media to assist us in the over 100 Aboriginal languages to turn the messages of the COVID-19 health messages to get that out there. This is job creation. This is essential communication. I have no doubt our First Nations media organisations across the country have played a major role in keeping our communities healthy and safe. I'd like to extend to them actually my thanks for their hard work, often not remunerated, uh, certainly during this very challenging time across our country. And if you haven't seen or heard some of the outstanding work First Nations media workers have recently been doing, jump online and take a look. There's health-related messages in a wealth of languages, uh, songs urging mob to wash their hands in the, in the languages. We had about 18 uh, languages uh, put together very quickly in a short space of time, uh, just about the washing of hands, animations and, and short skits. And the range of creativity and innovation is amazing and, in this instance, absolutely life-saving. The regional and remote First Nations broadcasters and media producers are being hampered by lack of affordable and appropriate broadband. First Nations broadcasters need access to adequate and reliable broadband. Without it, the sector will not be able to realise its full potential in the new media landscapes. Digital technologies provide the opportunity for regional and remote broadcasters and media producers to significantly enhance their operations, creating jobs and supporting economic opportunity in regions uh, where both are often limited. Contemporary broadcasting studio and transmission equipment is internet compatible, but broadband speeds in most regional and remote communities are currently frustratingly slow preventing access to even basic online services, let alone allowing for sharing of large media files. Some of the main strengths of our First Nations media organisations is that they are connected and that they are local. And we need to ensure they keep this connectivity. Labor is committed to a sustainable funding arrangement to support and improve NBN services in regional Australia. There is no substitute for a first-class fibre NBN with sound long-term economics to support a sustainable funding mechanism. Policy makers need to achieve a connected and inclusive digital future for remote regions. This includes improving issues of affordability, digital literacy and cyber safety, as well as overcoming the infrastructure deficit. What is evident is the need for better mobile coverage and internet access. Labor considers NBN should be able to compete on a level playing field. NBN has a unique obligation to service parts of the country that are unprofitable to serve. If it competes on an uneven playing field, it makes that task harder. We just need to be clear about what that playing field is. The amount of cross-subsidy available is to some extent dependent on how much revenue NBN generates in the fixed line footprint. When you switch from fibre, which can guarantee minimum speeds, to copper, which can't, you make that task more challenging, particularly over the medium to long term. It was disappointing that prior to the 2013 election, the Liberals encouraged other companies to deploy networks and compete directly against the NBN with full knowledge this would undercut the NBN business model. They set out to make it incredibly difficult for the NBN and now want to introduce a tax to protect themselves against what they instigated. Universal broadband in Australia is an achievement of the Labor Party and the will of the Australian people. As we have done for over a decade, we will continue to put consumers and the regions front and centre of our policy making. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator McKim. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to speak uh, to uh, the two bills before the Senate, the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 and the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019, and can indicate that the Australian Greens will um, support the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019, <clears throat> but that we do not support the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019. In general terms, the Australian Greens uh, are absolutely committed to tech equity uh, and have uh, also a commitment to ensuring that all Australians have equal access to broadband, particularly those in regional and rural areas. We support the Competition and Consumer Bill because we welcome the introduction of the statutory infrastructure provider obligations that will ensure minimum speed requirements of 25 megabits per second for broadband users, irrespective of where they live. And of course, we also strongly support the funding of and rollout of the NBN to regional and rural Australia, but not as proposed by Schedule 4 of the Bill and the Regional Broadband Scheme Bill. We, there's been a bit of politics played in the speeches that we've heard in here this evening. Um, it's absolutely fair to say that although there were some issues with um, the Labor rollout of the MBN in, in terms of its vision and in terms of its capacity uh, with significant redundancy to provide for um, the needs of Australians in relation to broadband well into the future, uh, it was genuinely a nation-building project and one that the Labor Party should be congratulated for initiating, even though, as I indicated, there were some issues uh, with the rollout and things were going slower than many of us had hoped. And I want to say in my home state of Tasmania, uh, there uh, we uh, ended up, thanks to the foresight of um, former Premier David Bartlett, uh, in bidding Tasmania in to be an early mover and an early adopter of the NBN rollout under a federal Labor government, that we've ended uh, up in uh, a better place than much of the rest of the country. I also want to say that the current um, pandemic and the associated restrictions that have been put in place in Australia do show how uh, broadband and broadband at a reasonable speed should be um, regarded as a critical and genuine public utility. And I think uh, many of us in this place uh, have been working from home of course, a large number of Australians have been working from home, and uh, to do that without um, broadband that is reliable and uh, has a reasonable speed uh, is difficult. And as we have moved towards a physical distancing regime in this country, it's actually broadband that has allowed uh, many Australians to um, keep socially close to people, even though they can't be physically close to them. Uh, as I said, we do not support the Regional Broadband Scheme Bill because it's too, too narrowly targeted, it's too uh, technology specific and it's not robust to changing telecommunications technologies. Uh, the scheme proposed in the Regional Broadband uh, Scheme Charge Bill unfairly targets um, people building new homes in outer suburban greenfield housing areas, many of which would be young families. Uh, it is technology specific, which may drive customers to alternative technologies, thereby further reducing the taxable pool of broadband consumers, and will unfortunately for many turn uh, what should be uh, a free or low cost information superhighway into an information tollway or toll road. Now, Australia has the most expensive broadband of all OECD countries, and we should be seeking to improve affordability, not reduce it, especially now, with more people unemployed, people seeking alternative work or study options, and more people working from home 
as a result of the restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator McKim, pandemic. it being 20 minutes past seven, I might ask you to take your seat. I understand that we have broad agreement that there is one motion to be moved before we adjourn. Thank you, uh, thank you Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek, to leave, I seek leave to table a statement made by the Manager of Government Business regards General Business Notice of Motion 527 and, seek, and, and have it incorporated into Hansard and can confirm to the Senate that agreement had been reached uh, with the Opposition Manager of Business and other whips across the chamber earlier today. I will ask the question, is leave granted to table that statement and have it incorporated into Hansard? Yes, yes, yes leave is granted. It therefore being 7.20 p.m., I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Antic, I believe, is first on my list and then Senator Lyons. So thank you, Senator Antic. Deputy President, I rise tonight to speak regarding the future of this country the future of my home state of South Australia and the urgent need to address this country's economic and strategic future in the post-COVID-19 world. In the last two months, the Australian people have been forced to isolate from their family and friends, stand down from their employment and scramble to save their businesses and investments. Sadly, Australians have also died or become gravely ill. Fortunately, in conjunction with the early action and strong leadership of the Morrison government, the diligence of Australians has saved lives and saved livelihoods. But the Prime Minister is quite correct to want an independent inquiry in relation to the outbreak. Australia will not be a piece of chewing gum stuck on the sole of China's shoes. COVID-19 started in China. It was covered up by the Chinese Communist Party and, alarmingly, the Chinese Communist Party has now dictated terms in relation to the supply of critical goods such as personal, protective and medical equipment. The CCP's efforts in arranging for companies linked to the regime to ship tonnes of medical and personal protective equipment back to China sounded the alarm bells for many. It's trained a spotlight on the need to return manufacturing to Australia and the need to shore up our national security and sovereign interests in the process. Australia must learn to manufacture again. It must retrain its economy to become self-sufficient. My home state of South Australia was once a thriving hub of industry, yet most of that industry has since disappeared due to high taxes, an inflexible labour market, green costs, high energy prices, the advent of low-cost manufacturing in Asia and union-led standover tactics. South Australia is still a prime location for manufacturing due to our abundant natural resources, skilled workforce and low cost of living. The defence sector has filled some of the gaps, but it's also guided the way for the future of South Australian advanced and flexible manufacturing. And we've already seen examples of South Australian businesses adapting with the likes of the Detmold Group transforming its paper goods production into manufacturing face masks and Bickford's shifting the lines from cordial production into manufacturing hand sanitizer. But in 2020, Australia is far too heavily reliant on Chinese supply chains. And this would be concerning enough if those products were manufactured in a country which shared our values. However, the CCP's authoritarian control over critical goods hangs over our heads like the sword of Damocles. It was Lenin who once said that the capitalists would sell the revolutionaries the rope which they themselves would be hanged. We must be mindful of this. Our reliance on the critical mining and agricultural uh, exports has left Australia's economic complexity ranking at 93, wedged directly between Senegal and Pakistan. And an economy with a complex manufacturing base will generate its own growth with a natural skills effect, those industries becoming complementary. Now, we must seek answers and we must seek compensation. But importantly, we must bring as much of our manufacturing work back as we can. It is one way we can obtain compensation from the Chinese Communist Party, but it also addresses our national security holes. Bringing manufacturing back to this nation is not just about jobs. It's also about protecting our sovereign interests. And in this place, 
it's critical that we get the policy settings right. We need to continue to drive the price of energy into the ground. We need to deregulate, review environmental laws, and we need economic reform in the area of industrial relations. The green and red tape wrapped around our economy must be loosened to allow it to prosper. The Australian people will no longer tolerate post-COVID-19 issues of this calendar become the victims of party politics and posturing. We must work together. The spotlight of COVID-19 has provided a timely reminder of the importance of self-reliance and it's reminded the people of South Australia of the great things they can achieve for this nation. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Madam Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President. Tonight I want to talk about the real harm the denial of the job seeker payment to international students is having on their well-being and ability to continue to survive the pandemic. Two international students, Chai, Sky and Ja Kuhn, both worked in the hospitality industry to support themselves whilst they studied. But the overnight shutdown of the industry has meant they've been out of work since mid-March. Sky is 28 years old from Shenzhen City in China. She's currently on a skilled graduate visa and was working as a cook at a restaurant after going to a commercial cookery school. Sky first came to Australia in 2016 on a working holiday visa and wanted to stay in the country she had come to love. Before coming to Australia, Sky saved for three years working as an accountant. Now Sky is struggling to get by. Her expenses are about $1,100 per month. She used to earn about $1,000 per week before tax and is now having to live off her small savings. Sky has applied for permanent residency. If accepted, she'll have to pay $4,000 but will have little of her savings left to pay that fee. She told me that she still wants to stay in Australia and is grateful to the Australian people, even understanding that some are scared of what is happening and taking it out on people like her. Sky thanks WA Premier Mark McGowan for supporting the Chinese community, encouraging people to buy Chinese takeaway and condemning the, the uh, cases of deplorable racism that we've seen and the discrimination. But she says she's disappointed in the Australian government because she has contributed to Australian society and paid taxes but gets nothing. Let me read some of Sky's words. I feel lonely. Australians at least have family here. If they can't go to work, they have family. But we have no one. When you've left everything behind in your home country and something like this happens, you have nobody at home to keep you company. My entire life is back in China, and the only thing we have, the only thing we can depend on, is income. Now there's no income. Sky does not want to be a burden on Australia. She came here to work, and she continues to try and find work, even though the crisis is ongoing. I also spoke to Jia Xun. He's a 19-year-old man from Liaoning province in eastern China, in northeastern China. Jia Xun first came to Australia as a 16-year-old to study English. He's now studying a pre-uni course at TAFE to be able to enrol in a mining engineering course at Curtin University. He was told that Curtin was one of the best universities in the world at which to study engineering, and he wants to follow in his father's footsteps as a mining engineer. To support himself, Jia Xun was working as a chef and waiter at a Chinese restaurant in Perth. He grew up helping in his family's restaurant back home. Since the restaurant closed in mid-March, he's been out of a job. He is also struggling to make ends meet. His family in China are also not making as much income as before, so he can't rely on much financial support from them. Jia Xun loves Australia and wants to make his home here. He says he would still recommend other Chinese people to come here and study, and he still thinks Australians are friendly and helpful people. Xia Xun also feels disappointed in the Australian government. He says, I feel like they've told us, can't pay your rent? That's your problem. Xia Xun's monthly expenses are around 2,800, which his job just covered before the crisis. He now owes his landlord rent. 
His family saved for a long time to afford the visa enrolment fees when Jashun first came. He pays $40,000 to study here every year. He needs to pay for his study, his rent and his ongoing living costs. But he does that because one day he knows he will have a good job. Both Sky and Shajun want to make a life for themselves in Australia and contribute to our community. As a country, we just cannot discount their current welfare because we are only looking after Australians. These are just two stories of the hundreds of thousands uh, of international students who are forming poverty lines, who are relying on charities to be fed, and with a flick of a pen, the Treasurer could fix this situation overnight. Senator Furugi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the pandemic, its impact and our future. The coronavirus pandemic is having some of its greatest impacts on people on low incomes, temporary migrants and women. It has exposed the vast gap between the wealthiest in our society and people barely making ends meet. It has exposed the crushing weight of inequalities that many in our community bear. COVID-19 has laid bare the systemic racism we suffer from in Australia, with the government choosing to exclude nearly one million temporary migrants from their support packages. This is how systemic racism works. When designing the wage subsidy, the government said they had to draw a line somewhere, and this is where they drew it. Our country, our other countries have gladly included migrant workers in their wage subsidy schemes, but shamefully not Australia. For this government, it didn't matter whether you were working and paying taxes in Australia before the pandemic hit. The government said, now you're on your own. The message was clear. We don't care if you become homeless. We don't care if you don't eat. We don't care if your mental health suffers. Australia is not responsible for you, even though you live here. A $130 billion wage subsidy package, but not a cent for temporary migrants and international students, the vast majority of whom are people of colour. We have also seen the depth and breadth of the housing crisis in Australia during this pandemic. We know millions of people are living in housing stress and are just one rent payment away from being turfed out on the street by a system that put investor profits ahead of all else. Saying the housing system is broken is an understatement. Housing is a human right. It's time for the federal government to lead from the front with big investment to build public and community housing as part of its economic stimulus. Women have been hit harder than men when it comes to job losses during the crisis. And we know that women bear the brunt of the work when it comes to caring for children. Thankfully, the introduction of free and universal childcare has been a huge step forward for access to childcare. It should be made permanent. The government has finally recognized childcare and early learning for what it is, an essential service that we all rely on and everyone can access, not only those who can afford to pay. We are looking at the highest unemployment rate in decades. The recent raising of job seeker and other income support payments is the most significant change to social security we have had for decades, and it is a change that needs to stay. We need a safety net that is not punitive, but fair and equal for everyone that lives in Australia. We need to retain the rate and increase and expand other social security payments like the disability support and carers payments. Higher education is an absolutely critical element of our recovery from this crisis. Yet this government has gone out of its way to ensure universities do not have the support they need to survive. It's an ideological attack on universities motivated by the same contempt for education that has driven their ceaseless attacks on public TAFE. Despite its devastating impacts, the COVID-19 crisis has provided us with an opening to reset, to reshape our society and our economy for the better. Nothing would be worse than going back to what we had come to expect as normal. We need universal and permanent changes. Universal free childcare, fee-free higher education, a social safety net that doesn't leave anyone behind a housing system that ensures a secure home for everyone and an economy that values the spirit of our community and puts people before profit. 
a society where everyone has the opportunity to engage in fulfilling and secure work with good wages and where care and community work is valued, where rampant profit-making and endless growth are faint memories and the true measures of a good society are our well-being and how we care for each other, our country and our planet. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Can I first say uh, it's good to see you uh, in this chamber and uh, um, good to see you back. I'd like to say a few words uh, in relation to the great response from the Queensland community in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it has been absolutely inspiring. First, and I think it's apt on this day, which is International Nurses Day, we should pay tribute. I would like to pay tribute to all of the frontline health workers in Queensland, our great nurses, our doctors, our allied health professionals, but also the receptionists, the cleaners, the kitchen staff, everyone working in our, in our hospitals and also in our medical centres. They have been under unbelievable pressure over the last few months, and I pay tribute to each and every one of them. It takes a special, special person to put yourself in harm's way in order to help your fellow man and woman, and that is what they do every day. So I pay special tribute to each and every one of them. I also pay tribute to all the other essential workers in our economy, and that includes everyone who's been working at the forefront of dealing with the public at this difficult time. We've all seen those issues of the supermarket workers dealing with the shortages and also the long queues. And I pay tribute to all of those people working in our supermarkets and in our retail sector, which has kept operating. Thirdly, I want to talk about some of the special community groups in my home state of Queensland. Government can only do so much. Government can only do so much. And this government has done a great deal to assist all Australians to get through this terrible crisis. And we, we're getting through it. We're building that bridge to recovery. But we wouldn't be able to respond as a nation without the response of our small community groups, those churches and other community groups who are out there helping people as volunteers. They don't need the government to tell them to go out and help their fellow Australians. They just do it because that's who they are. And I want to pay tribute to a few organisations here this evening. First, Wounded Heroes. Wounded Heroes is a special non-profit organisation that helps our veterans. And they capture veterans who fall between the cracks. And quite often, they're the first responders. They'll get a call late at night from a veteran who's about to become homeless when the formal processes, the institutions which are there to provide assistance, aren't able to help, they're there a phone call away and their volunteers will get in a car and go to the veteran that very same evening. And speaking to some of those volunteers, they'll do it at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, and they'll provide sustenance to those veterans in their most dire need, their time of their most dire need. I pay tribute to them. I pay tribute to Ipswich Assist which is a not-for-profit organisation which has provided assistance in the Ipswich region of South East Queensland for over 20 years. And Jason Budden, their program and pastoral manager, wrote to me and said this, in those 20 years we have never seen a crisis affect our community in so many ways as much as COVID-19 has put our marginalised people most at risk at this time. And they provide hampers, they pay for prescriptions, they pay for bills. As does the five and two ministry, five and two, five loaves and two fishes, who assist in the Ipswich region, assisting communities and families in need. I'd also like to pay tribute to a range of multicultural organisations in my home state who have specifically helped international students. And in particular, I'd like to pay tribute to the Federation of Indian Communities of Queensland and to another organisation quite aptly called Simply Humans Inc superheroes without capes. Well, indeed you are in the way you've been supporting our inter international student population. I'd like to pay tribute to our Australians of Chinese heritage. As our Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said, our Chinese community 
has been absolutely outstanding. They are the ones who, when the travel restrictions were first brought in, had to bear the brunt, and they did it superbly. I'd like to pay tribute to the Islamic Council of Queensland, which at this time of Ramadan has been providing food hampers and also assistance, a special program to provide assistance to New Zealanders who haven't been provided due to their visa status, haven't been provided government assistance. <laughs> the University of Southern Queensland has helped its students. And I could go on and on, Mr Acting Deputy President, but my time has, has elapsed. elapsed. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I join with Senator Scar in welcoming you back to the chamber. I'm sure you're glad to be back as well. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to touch on tonight. The first uh, was the devastating scenes we saw in Morambar in central Queensland through the week uh, when we saw yet another mine safety disaster. I'm talking about the explosion at Anglo-Americans Grosvenor mine just outside Morambar, which saw five mining workers injured. And unfortunately, even today, days later, we see four of those workers still in a critical condition in hospital. Uh, I send my very best wishes to the mining workers themselves their families, but also to everyone in the Moranbar community. Having spent a bit of time in Moranbar, I know what a closely knit uh, community it is, and when these kind of accidents occur, they have an impact on the entire community. Unfortunately, we've too seen too many accidents like this in the mining industry in Queensland, even just in the last couple of years. And it was very concerning to see a number of reports emerge that there had been leaks gas leaks reported at this particular mine in the weeks and months leading up to this accident. I commend the Queensland Government for commissioning a full inquiry, and I hope we get to the bottom of it. But I do think we need to call on all mining companies to really lift their game when it comes to workers' safety. It's not good enough to see people continually injured and killed at work in Queensland mines. Speaking of workers, uh, there are many group, uh, the, the Federal Labor leader yesterday, uh, Mr Albanese, made a fantastic speech in which he noted uh, that we need to thank the working people of Australia who have really led the way in, in helping all of us respond. Uh, and I want to particularly focus tonight on aged care workers. Uh, aged care workers are literally on the front line, caring for some of the most vulnerable people when it comes to coronavirus. We've all known that one of the worst things that could have happened with coronavirus in Australia would have been to see mass outbreaks in aged care homes among elderly people who are particularly at risk. And it's aged care workers who've been on the front line uh, caring for and protecting older Australians from coronavirus. Uh, aged care workers have a particular issue, though, when it comes to uh, the amount of sick leave that they have. Naturally, because of the kind of work that they do and the at-risk group that they work with, they have to be particularly vigilant about not going to work when they do experience symptoms which may be coronavirus. And what that means is that, unlike most groups in the community, they have to draw on their sick leave and other forms of leave uh, to stay away from work. Uh, in order to, to put the residents of aged care uh, facilities and, uh, aged care, uh, and elderly people that they care for first. Uh, now we've seen from the government uh, the, the, the directive essentially that people should stay home from work if they're showing symptoms and that, that is a natural uh, thing for governments to be saying. It's an important way to contain the virus. But it's not so simple for everyone in the workforce to stay home from work. If you don't qualify for sick leave because you're a casual worker or if you're in an occupation like aged care, which means that you're going to have to draw on your leave entitlements more than most because you need to stay home at the merest sign of symptoms, um, then your sick leave and your other forms of leave may not be enough to cover you. So that's why I'm calling on the government to step up and help fund additional leave for aged care workers to ensure that they are able to stay home, that they are able to still pay their bills, but they are able to stay home and make sure that they look after their own health and the, and the health of the residents that they care for. Finally, uh, I just want to mention uh, where we're at in terms of the bushfires that we saw this summer. All of us remember the horrifying scenes that we saw through this summer, the bushfires that hit so much of Australia and the devastation that they wreaked. But unfortunately, for too many bushfire victims across the country, this horror continues. Too many people are still waiting for debris to be removed, their burnt down houses 
uh, to be removed so that they can get on with rebuilding. There are too many people who are living in tents and living in caravans and living in temporary accommodation as winter approaches in very cold parts of this country. And of course, there are too many businesses that we've seen destroyed uh, as a result of the bushfires. Now, bushfire victims expected action from the Prime Minister, especially when in January uh, he established a $2 billion bushfire recovery fund, fund and promised that that money would be spent immediately. But now, five months on, he, we have seen that promise broken. In answers to question on notice tabled yesterday, we've learned that only $250 million of the Prime Minister's $2 billion fund has actually been spent. That's only one in every $8 that he's promised. It's enough of the marketing. We need action from the Prime Minister. Senator Abetz. Last week, a full bench of the Federal Court heard the appeal in the matter of the Australian Workers' Union's long-running attempt to shut down an investigation by the Registered Organisations Commission into alleged unauthorised use of members' money by its former National Secretary, Mr Shorten. When I last spoke on this matter, I noted the similarities between the allegations facing Mr Shorten and the AWU and Mr Thompson and the HSU. In both cases, they used their union's funds as springboards for their political careers. Mr Thompson was found to have breached sections 285, 286 and 287 of the Registered Organisations legislation. The very same sections Mr Shorten and the AWU stand accused of breaching. Every substantive, albeit spurious, claim made by the AWU was comprehensively rejected by the Federal Court. First, the AWU sought to assert collusion between the government and the Commission. It lost. It asserted collusion between the government and the AFP. It lost. It asserted collusion between government and journalist Brad Norrington. It lost. On the questions of law, the AWU asserted that the Commission had no jurisdiction over matters prior to its establishment. It lost. It asserted that the Commission had acted at the direction of the government. It lost. It asserted the Commission's investigation was made for an improper political purpose. It lost. It tried to challenge the decision of the court to grant the search warrants. It lost. It asserted that the AFP's decision to execute the search warrants was invalid. It lost. Finally, it sought an order of prohibition that would prevent the Commission from, overlooking, from ever looking into these matters at all. And, of course, it lost. Its only minor victory was that the court ruled that the Commission's attempt to investigate breaches of the union's rules was statute barred because of a limitation period. This point has now been appealed. If the full court decides in the Commission's favour, then the AWU will have lost on every single ground it has raised in its two years of lawfare, smears and distractions at great expense to its members. This matter could in fact be settled very easily by the voluntary release of the documents. When asked on 25 October 2017 if he would release all the documentation, Mr Walton, the AWU secretary, replied, absolutely, we will most definitely participate fully. We will provide all the documents. Mr Walton needs to be true to his word, and Mr Shorten should insist that he is. But based on the assumption that Mr Walton does not intend to release the documents, we still won't know what he and Mr Shorten were so desperate to hide. If the Commission wins the appeal, then the documents are handed over to it and it gets to conduct the investigation. If the Commission loses on appeal, two things may happen. The first is that it may continue its investigation as breaches of the Act, as the Court has ruled it is free to do. The AFP will hand over the documents and we will then see whether it believes Mr Shorten has a case to answer or not. The second possibility is that the court rules that the existing investigation is quashed because it includes allegations of breaches of the rules as well as the Act. This would mean that the Commission is free to commence a fr fresh investigation of breaches of the Act. 
But the interesting point in this scenario is that the documents currently held by the AFP must be returned to the AWU. If the Commission commences a fresh investigation into breaches of the Act, it could once again request that the AWU hand over the very same documents, something the AWU promised to do in any event. It thus begs the question, given the professed willingness to hand over the documents, combined with a declaration that there is nothing to hide, why has so much of members' money been spent on seeking to hide the documents? The ruling of the Federal Court will soon tell us. Senator Pratt. And it's very pleasing to see you uh, in the chair this evening as our um, acting president. In this very brief adjournment tonight on the impact of COVID-19 on Australian manufacturing, it is very important to be, uh, to be holding the government to account for their rhetoric on support for uh, industry and to match that to the reality of their actions. In the speech from the Treasurer today, uh, we did not see a plan to rebuild the Australian economy. Uh, instead, we got uh, hollow rhetoric on, uh, with no real plan to, to do this essential work. The ABS earlier this month reported on the impact of COVID-19 on business. It showed that Australian manufacturers expect to get, get hit harder than firms in other industries by the consequences of this outbreak. Some 82 per cent of manufacturers expect reduced demand for goods and services compared to the economy-wide average of some 69 per cent of firms. For every question except staff shortages, manufacturing expects to get hit harder than other sectors. The Australian Bureau of Statistics confirms what we learned with the release of the Australian Industry Group PMI uh, uh, index, which shows manufacturing firms were losing new orders for business as both export demand and domestic demand slumped the most in one month in the 28-year history of this survey. The ABS survey also shows 80 per cent of manufacturing firms expect 50 to 100 per cent of their employees will be eligible for the JobKeeper payment, while some 65 per cent of manufacturing firms surveyed registered their interest or intend to register uh, for the JobKeeper payment. But as Anthony Albanese recognised yesterday in his fifth vision statement, the damage to the economy has been severe and the threat of a prolonged impact is very real. Businesses and peak bodies have expressed a number of serious concerns, as has Labor, about the government's lack of vision uh, to get us out of this mess and indeed their snapback approach. Snapback uh, in the timeline expressed by the government will leave manufacturing businesses without support when they expect to be bearing the brunt of these impacts. Snapback as foreshadowed uh, by the Liberals a return to their traditional economic agenda uh, is a return to the policy settings for an economy that was already slow. As Anthony Albanese said, the pandemic may have arrived without warning, but the weakness in the Australian economy did not. The JobKeeper payment will be available only according to the government's plan until uh, the end of September, not even quite the end, and now they say they may pull it back even before then. Meanwhile, every informed commentator expects that recovery will be patchy and long and that different industries will come back slower than others. So this will not be over quickly for Australia's manufacturers. And instead, companies might not be around at the next election if that's the government's attitude. Not be around for uh, Labor's much more comprehensive set of policies. I have to say, in a small window of hope, I note that the COVID Commission has been working with manufacturers to ensure the supply of essential products, personal protection equipment and solve supply chain issues to keep critical goods flowing to Australian communities. And I'd really like to thank these companies for stepping up. 
but it would have been nice if the government had recognised the need for a plan to respond to these kinds of crises and to support Australian manufacturing before this hit. We are still feeling the impact of these shortages of PPE. For example, elective surgery in WA is being slowed down and closing the gap on the surgery that was dropped because it doesn't have enough PPE. So, in closing these brief remarks, uh, I see no sign of a government prepared to harness the power of government to support Australian manufacturing, as Anthony Albanese has argued for. One of the things we must learn from this crisis is that Australian manufacturing can and should be part of a way forward uh, towards a strong economy that works Senator for Pratt, Australian time people. Has elapsed. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. The global pandemic. I'll start again. It's been a long day. This global pandemic has shown us that we're all in the same storm, but we're definitely not in the same boat. Despite the government mantra that we're all in this together, too many people are being left behind, and the majority of them are women. We already know that more women than men work in casual, poorly paid, and precarious roles uh, in industries like hospitality, retail, and the arts. These sectors have been some of the hardest hit by COVID restrictions, and many of the affected workers are ineligible for JobKeeper because they're short-term casuals. Women are also more likely to work in the industries that we are asking so much of during this crisis, like our healthcare and aged care workers, educators and cleaning and sanitation workers. Again, despite how essential these roles always were and have been again proven to be, they remain amongst the poorest paid. Women in Australia also do the bulk of caring work, um, which is clearly so essential in our society, but much of which is unpaid. 72 per cent of primary caregivers are women. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency has reported that women spend approximately two-thirds of an average workday on unpaid work, compared with about one-third for men. And whilst it's too early for data about the division of domestic labour during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's safe to assume that increased demands for childcare, for supervising schoolwork, for caring for sick relatives has also fallen predominantly to women. The persistent gender pay gap above 13 per cent has meant that women were less prepared for a drop in income. Their wages are already stretched to capacity. Analysis of how the first COVID supplement was spent makes clear that most women spent the additional funds on food, clothing and rent. And this money helps them and their family to weather the crisis. The government scheme for early access to superannuation is also concerning. Women already retire with, on average, half the superannuation of men. And withdrawing $20,000 now will have significant implications for the amount women have to support them post-retirement. Closing the gender pay gap and the retirement income gap that follows is unfinished business that must be addressed in the recovery. Two of the significant advances of the COVID response, doubling JobSeeker and free childcare, should continue once the pandemic eases. There are issues to resolve in relation to family daycare and in-house care, but the Greens want to see early childhood education remain universal, public and free for good. The COVID crisis has also highlighted how precarious access to reproductive health care can be, particularly in rural and regional areas, um, and compounded, of course, when travel restrictions were imposed upon doctors. Assuring affordable and accessible access to reproductive health care across Australia must be a priority. Some of the hardest decisions being made in the pandemic are those made by women with abusive partners, seeking to protect themselves and their children. These women have been placed at a heightened risk of domestic violence, with women's safety organisations, crisis accommodation and legal services all experiencing much higher demand. Many women, particularly those on visas um, and who are unable to access JobSeeker or JobKeeper, have been forced to decide whether to stay in an abusive home or escape into poverty and homelessness. Federal and state governments have recognised these risks and invested some additional funds, but after years of funding cuts and ongoing funding uncertainty, much more is needed to ensure that women and children seeking safety can access the services that they need. 
The government's financial response to the COVID crisis demonstrates that investment in social infrastructure is less about having the resources to do it and more about spending priorities, and too often those priorities are gendered. There are clear ways forward to ensure that we move from this crisis towards gender equality and gender equity by addressing the gender pay gap, valuing unpaid care work, investing in housing, adequately funding domestic and family violence services, continuing free early childhood education and investing in a strong social safety net. The women of Australia deserve no less. Senator McGraw. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. If a week is a long time in politics, in my home state of Queensland, it seems a weekend can be even longer. In just over 48 hours, we had three treasurers in the Queensland Labor government during one of the biggest economic downturns our state has ever faced. When the music stopped, Cameron Dick found himself in the treasurer's seat. He's going to be faced with a lot of big numbers as the analysts in the Queensland Treasury brief their new boss. But there's one number I need Mr Dick and his Labor colleagues to hear loud and clear, and that's $2.4 billion. That's the projected negative economic impact to the Bundaberg region over the next 30 years, not due to the fallout of a virus, not due to the, the lockdown, but due to the largest infrastructure fail in Australia's history, and that is the failure of Paradise Dam. I'm going to keep raising this issue because farmers in that region need water security, because people in the Wide Bay Burnett need certainty and, more than ever, they need jobs. This sorry saga began last year when the Palaszczuk Labor government released 105,000 megalitres of water from this dam during one of the worst droughts on record. And after much campaigning by Deb Frecklington and the LNP, the Palaszczuk Labor government was finally dragged kicking and screaming to establish an inquiry into how this failure occurred. During the last two months, the Commission of Inquiry has heard that crucial construction reports have gone missing, just disappeared. Perhaps even more concerning, the Commission also heard evidence that no shear strength testing was carried out after construction to determine whether layers of roller compacted concrete had bonded. These are extraordinary revelations which need much greater scrutiny. And a final report from the Commission was delivered to the Palaszczuk government almost two weeks ago. I'm calling upon Premier Palaszczuk to release that report to the public before any works are started to reduce the dam wall. Concerned members of the Bundaberg Fruit and Vegetable Growers Cooperative commissioned Adept Economics to investigate the 30-year impact of permanently lowering the dam by five metres, which is what Labor are proposing. They found the hit to the Queensland economy would be $2.4 billion. I appreciate the safety of the Bundaberg community must be the first priority. And no one, no one is arguing that the dam should not be safe, but it must be returned to full capacity. So I say to the Queensland Cabinet 3.0, now is not the time to risk thousands of jobs. Now is not the time to deliver a $2.4 billion hit to the Wide Bay Burnett region. Now is not the time to put hundreds of businesses at risk. Now is the time to listen to an international expert with more than 50 years' experience in geotechnical and civil engineering like Dr Paul Rizzo and consider his report, a report that was commissioned by locals. Now is the time to listen to Deb Frecklington, Colin Boyce, the member for Calide, the member for Bundaberg, David Batt, the member for Burnett, Stephen Bennett, the member for Hinkler, Keith Pitt, and people like Bree Greemer from the Bundaberg Fruit and Vegetable Growers, to listen to the locals who understand what needs to happen with Paradise Dam, and to those exasperated Queenslanders who are sick of the political games being played in George Street by the factions in the Labor Party, my message is clear. You can stop the musical chairs and stop the games that have been played in government by supporting Deb Frecklington and the LNP on October 31 and you can help rebuild and make sure that Paradise Dam acts as any dam should be, full of water and helping the economy grow. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Acting Deputy President, well, the COVID-19 crisis has made it clear who our essential workers really are, and I want to thank them. 
thank them for so often putting their own health at risk to keep Australia running and to help their fellow Australians. So thank you to the health professionals, cleaners, early childhood educators, truck drivers, shop assistants, public transport workers, emergency services workers, security officers, warehouse workers, aged care workers, hospo workers, farm workers, teachers, manufacturing workers, disability support workers, delivery drivers, telco workers and so many more. Our greatest resource during this crisis has been our people, but so many of the people I've listed are also so often undervalued. These workers don't just deserve our thanks, they deserve a better deal. They deserve to be valued in their pay packets. They deserve decent and secure jobs. These workers have put the nation's interests first. These workers have had our backs. And on this side of the chamber, we will always have theirs. But over the last seven years, what has this third term Liberal government actually delivered for these working people and for working people in our country? They've delivered a wages system that is completely unable to deliver a living wage for so many of these essential jobs. They've delivered wage theft that is rampant and out of control jobs that are insecure, casual and short-term gigs, and attacks on the very people working to protect jobs and protect wages, our country's unions. That is this government's record for the essential workers of this country. And what I want to know, and what I think many of these essential workers want to know, is whether or not the thanks and appreciation that the government is showing them right now will translate into actual action once this crisis is over. Because many of these workers need a pay rise. They need to earn enough to live. And the fact that in one of the richest countries in the world, so many of the essential workers that I'm recognising today earn around half the average wage, half, well, we can do better than that. Surely we can do better than that. Even before the COVID-19 crisis hit, this government had the worst record on wage growth from any government since records began. And it is a core responsibility of any government to ensure that people have good, secure jobs with decent wages. And now, before this crisis is even over, the government is talking about cuts to workers' rights and a snapback of support while people are still in crisis today. And we have to ask, a snapback to what? A snapback, a snapback to low wages, to insecure jobs, to casual jobs? A snapback to a tax on working people and their unions? Is that what the government has in store for us? We owe it to those workers who've worked so hard to keep their fellow Australians safe and to keep our country running, to plan for a recovery that genuinely lives up to the phrase, we're all in this together, a phrase that Prime Minister Morrison is using so often today. We need an economy that works for people, not an economy that forces many of the essential skilled workers that I'm recognising today into these insecure and low paid jobs. There is an opportunity during this recovery to build an Australia where workers get a better deal, where no one is left behind and where everyone has the opportunity of a good life in this country. So let's take it. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I remind the government of a word whose meaning they have forgotten, democracy essential for accountability. Yesterday, a group of 10 former judges, leading lawyers and integrity experts sent an open letter to Prime Minister Morrison voicing their concern at the gutting of the parliament. These leading Australians include former Justice of the High Court, Mary Gordon, who described the Prime Minister's actions as unprecedented and undemocratic. One Nation represents the interests of people who raise issues directly with us. We can't do our jobs if the Senate sits a day or two every now and then. This is the House of Review. It may suit the government to never have their work reviewed, but that's not how our democracy works. 
The Morrison government is not entitled to the Senate's support on every matter. My remarks are not just criticism of the government, but of the opposition as well. The Senate could have stopped or amended the gutting of our role if we were given the opportunity. We were not given the opportunity because the ALP rolled over and went along with the government. What kind of opposition are they? Since my return to this place, I have watched the opposition crowd in together with the government on benches that were never designed for the government and the opposition to be cosy. The crossbench are now the opposition. Sadly, we're rendered ineffective while the opposition and the government form this unholy alliance. What should we call it, Madam Acting Deputy President? The Uni Party? The Lib Lab duopoly? Lib Labs. The Lib Labs combined to vote down a One Nation initiative to provide water to our farmers. The Lib Labs combined to suppress action on our motion providing remediation, like for like relocation and compensation for the government's PFAS disaster across the country. After each in turn, when an opposition promised to take up the PFAS cause, the Lib Labs combined to vote down the One Nation motion to provide banking customers with a code of banking practice that actually gave banking customers some basic rights. It's no wonder that the opposition has decided it's just easier to have no parliament than to, have to keep cozying up with the government to vote down great work from One Nation and the crossbench. This is not a recent event. The decision to sign away Australian sovereignty to the United Nations was a joint venture accelerated under Labor Prime Minister Gough Whitlam and Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, who appeared to be bitter enemies, yet implemented UN policies. All these years later, the partnership continues. No baseload power stations built in Queensland since Cogan Creek in 2007 is on both of you. No dams in 30 years is on both of you. An unemployment rate that has gone from 1.5 per cent in 1972 to 5.5 per cent before COVID hit is on both of you. The highest electricity prices in the world are on both of you. Well may Labor make fun of the phrase snapping back as you have done today. The economy cannot snap back. Economic resilience is provided by middle class enterprise. Yet small business was belted hard well before the virus. Water, electricity, government charges, commercial rental, red, green and blue UN tape have gone up while the incomes of their customers, everyday Australians, have gone down faster than opposition leader Anthony Albanese's approval numbers. Australia does lead the world in one thing. We have the largest decline in the number of small business startups in the Western world, down 40 per cent over 20 years, despite our population growing 50 per cent in that period. 50 per cent, yet business startups down. Oh, and that 50 per cent increase in population has caused Australia to have the highest real estate prices in the world, and that is on both of you as well. What person in their right mind would start a business in such a hostile environment? The Liberals and, Labor and Nationals seem perfectly happy transferring wealth from small business to global corporations whose interests they represent so well. It is a fundamental of Labor's brand of socialism that a population reliant on big government is a population incapable of resisting big government op oppression. The same oppression premiers Andrews and Palaszczuk are now trialling in Victoria and Queensland. The LNP and the ALP seek different outcomes from the same actions. They are joined at the hip in the pursuit of elimination of middle class enterprise. This does not serve the interests of the Australian people. We must bring back democracy. We must bring back democracy and accountability. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Tonight I rise to speak about the economic recovery from the coronavirus challenge. As a senator for Western Australia, I've spent much of my time since we were last in this place speaking to businesses right across my state. There's no doubt that as a whole, they're hurting, particularly those in service-focused industries and their supply chains. I've heard stories of innovation, ingenuity and reinvention, the real spirit of Australia, Western Australia in particular. I've also heard from businesses that have been hit with the full force of this economic shock. With the Prime Minister's release of the three-step plan, Western Australia is putting in place our roadmap back to businesses reopening and our quality way of life. With this comes the long road to economic recovery. 
it remains true that we are all in this together. Now, this isn't some trivial term or cliche phrase uh, to brush off, just as, and just as it has during the health preservation phase, it now holds the key to our economic recovery. Acting Deputy President, everyone in some way has been hit by the economic consequences of coronavirus. It might not be you directly, but your partner, your wife, your children, friends or family. And over the coming weeks, and months, there is something that we all can do. And I would argue it will be the single most important thing after the health considerations, and that is to support local small businesses by big, if you can. Start thinking about exploring our great state, whether it's a weekend drive or something longer. Every purchase you make and dollar you spend in a local business is another step back to seeing our economy return to full steam ahead. So if you've been thinking about visiting a winery to check out the latest vintage or even getting a tow bar put on your car by the local mechanic or taking the kids on a road trip, now is the time to do it. Every dollar spent in WA will support a local business and the West Australians that it employs. And the same is true for every state and region represented in this place. So go on a road trip, a Sunday drive or something longer. The June long weekend is just, a few, is just over two weeks away in Western Australia, and my family and a few of our friends are heading down to Manjimup for the weekend. So why don't you consider, if you're in Western Australia, taking that opportunity to get away with your family and your friends, obviously in a safe way, in a socially distant way, and spend locally in these businesses. Stop into that cafe on the way and buy a few coffees or a cake and a meat pie. Go in and check out that winery, a boutique distillery you've been thinking about for a while. Have a shop small barbecue with local produce. Make the next present you buy for someone from a local artist, an artisan or crafter, or get them a voucher for a local experience. And when the time is right, even encourage your significant other to go and pamper themselves. Every bit helps. I commend the support from the Commonwealth Government and the measures to support businesses put in place by the State Government through the National Co uh, Government Cabinet. Beg your pardon. Our nation would be a vastly different place without them. Millions of Australians have remained connected to their jobs because of the JobKeeper payment. And the discussions of the National Cabinet, which have resulted in concessions for businesses, utility bill credits, payroll tax exemptions, and measures to support arrangements with landlords, among others, has and will provide the support that so many businesses need and have needed to keep their doors open. But it's important to recognise that this is the first phase of a broader economic recovery. The second phase starts with the purchasing power of Australians. Your dollar, whether it's one or many, or where you decide to put it, is incredibly powerful. So when, it come, when the time comes, and it's almost upon us, a lot of the restrictions that we're seeing are released this coming Monday in Western Australia, and it's, a, it's almost upon us, and it's time for us, all Australians, to build the road to recovery. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And there's no doubt that we've had some very difficult months get on top of the coronavirus pandemic in Australia and that there will be more challenging times ahead as we reopen our economy and manage any uh, clusters where they occur. As the reopening gets underway, we have an opportunity to imagine what we want post-pandemic economy and, to, and what that may look like across Australia. That economy should be built on a bedrock of secure, well-paid jobs across a broad range of industries, with workers and small businesses having options to build careers so that they can care for their families and make a life well into the future. It should also include a strong manufacturing industry. And to achieve this, governments must arrest the contraction of manufacturing. That has sadly been occurring in Australia over the past seven years under the Conservative government and develop a new plan 
to make our manufacturing a growing and vibrant part of our economy. Between 2011 and 2016, the ABS census data shows that over 200,000 manufacturing jobs have disappeared. What was once an industry that we were all very proud of that contributed to 14 per cent to our gross domestic product in 1996, manufacturing now makes just around 5.5 per cent of GDP. Yet at the same time, Australians have been buying more manufactured goods than ever. Our demand for them is growing, but the products that we want to buy are increasingly not being made here in Australia or by Australians. Manufacturing can and must be part of Australia's future economic security. And this point has been well made by experts around our country. As the coronavirus has well illustrated, our definition of sovereign capability must be expanded to include all manner of areas of the Australian economy, many of them centering on domestic manufacturing capacity. When we make what we need to get through a crisis, just like the coronavirus, that puts us a step ahead strategically and makes it easier to get through difficult times. It's a simple equation. The more we make here, the more self-reliant we are, the better we will be able to face another crisis in the future. This isn't about being anti-trade, far from it. Australia is a very proud nation that trades with many countries around the world, and in particular in the Asia region. But if we can make something here, why shouldn't we? And further, if we can diversify our trade relations to ensure that we're not overly dependent on one single trade partner for our prosperity, then why aren't we? As the recent events concerning many of our farmers, with barley growers and meat producers, has shown this is just prudent economic management. But arresting the decline in manufacturing will require careful and considered policy making and implementation by government. We will need to, to carefully map our current skills and capabilities in manufacturing and make new investments in industries that are performing well, like agriculture. We should use government procurement processes to lead the way in buying and using Australian-made goods. Getting the taxation settings right will also be part of this important part of the discussion that we need to have in this place. And that means, as Jim Stanford points out in a recent paper for the Australian Institute, looking at tax incentives, just to name one example. Our future commitment to innovation will need to be fair must be sorry, far greater than just political slogans. We will need to make real investment in research and development. It should be carefully targeted to encourage small and medium enterprises in supply chains, and not just making life easier for big multinational companies, as unfortunately this government seems to prefer. Strong local manufacturing offers employment, creates opportunities and helps add to the country's prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chacon. Senator Wish Wilson. Over the past two decades, the Australian Antarctic Division, CSIRO, Oceans and Atmosphere, and the University of Tasmania, with the support of successive Tasmanian and federal governments, have established Hobart as the Australian hub for critical research into the Antarctic and Southern Ocean, particularly into the impacts of climate change. This established research ecosystem has also ensured that Hobart is recognised as a global centre for Antarctic and Southern Ocean research all around the world. Uh, we call this the Antarctic Gateway. A recent Australian Research Council funding decision means that funding to maintain the current levels of Antarctic research and Southern Ocean research in Hobart is not available beyond 2023 and puts our critical science community, which is an integral part of the Hobart broader community and our economy at risk. Through IMAS, 
UTAS has hosted a $32 million Antarctic Gateway Partnership from 2015 to 2020. However, that research funding has now finished. Total funding for uh, Antarctic research hosted at IMS, including other grant, progr grant programs and UTAS contributions, has been in excess of $15 million per year over the last five years. Now, over the last 10 years, the science community has been fighting for long-term continuity in its science funding. A number of the critical programs that are conducted by our science community in Hobart are long-term and collaborative in nature. Um, the Australian government implemented two reviews into long-term funding to underpin certainty for these collaborative long-term scientific programs. The first was Australia's Antarctic Strategy and 20-Year Action Plan, which called for a revitalisation of Antarctic science, including through the implementation of a coordinated and effective Antarctic science funding model to increase Antarctic research by leading Australian institutions. And then in 2017, the government implemented the uh, Clark Review, uh, or the Antarctic Science Program Governance Review, which recommended institutionalising long-term collaborative science and ensuring coherent science leadership. Uh, now, the ARC decision, uh, which was announced uh, uh, nearly two weeks ago, has dudded Tasmania and left Tasmania out in the cold. Uh, the Tasmanian institutions uh, submitted a proposal to the ARC, uh, along with, in collaboration with 41 national and uh, international university and government partnerships. However, it was only able to attract $20 million of the $56 million in funding. Uh, the UTAS, um, the UTAS uh, Vice Chancellor Rufus Black has said that this announcement fragments rather than strengthens Australia's Antarctic science capability and undermines the existing Australian Antarctic Southern Ocean Science Program. This program is critical to monitoring and tackling our climate emergency, and this announcement presents significant cause of concern to the Tasmanian science community. Um, as I mentioned, these programs are long-term and collaborative in nature and need a funding arrangement that is also long-term and gives continuity and certainty to the Antarctic science community. Um, the Australian government must immediately review Antarctic and Southern Ocean science funding. This includes taking into account the recent findings of these reviews, such as the Clark Review, and it provides certainty and support for an integrated approach that restores Tasmania as the hub of this nation's Southern Ocean, Antarctic and client, climate research efforts. Uh, in my last minute, um, Acting Deputy President, um, it was only four years ago that I chaired the Select Committee into Science Jobs Cuts at CSIRO, and we managed to reverse a number of nearly 300 job, potential job cuts to the science community in Hobart. Um, while we have been building the gateway to the Antarctic in Hobart, and the government has been forthcoming with significant infrastructure spending for the AAD, it's no good spending money on infrastructure if you don't invest in the science and the personnel that are going to use the Australian Antarctic base, use the new ice breaker, use the new runway that's been extended in Hobart. We need to have long-term funding for these science programs, and it's absolutely critical if we want to keep the thousands of research jobs and families in Tasmania and Hobart, which is so critical to our identity, that we need to up the ante and significantly fund these research efforts. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Billy. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and thank you for doing five minutes of duty for me up there so I can do my speech. I rise to speak on the government's changes to the childcare system due to the outbreak of COVID-19. As a former early childhood educator, it's an issue that I'm passionate about. It's vital at this difficult time that people have access to the early childhood education that they need and that early childhood educators are given the support they need to provide this education. Access to early childhood education allows essential workers to continue to provide the services the public needs at this very trying time. I thank early childhood educators for their efforts to provide education and support for families throughout the COVID-19 crisis. As the government seeks to reopen the economy, there will be a greater need for early childhood education. And while I hope the government's changes were done with the best of intentions, they have once again failed to work through to, 
the details to ensure that all families and educators aren't unintentionally disadvantaged by them. I've been contacted by numerous early childhood educators who have been disadvantaged or have concerns and have raised those concerns with Minister Tian. They've been extremely distressed by some of the changes, both how the changes affect their business and how they, they will impact uh, the amount of care that they are able to provide. These are caring, highly professional people who are concerned about the businesses that have been built up over many years. Reports continue to emerge of families that are now locked out of the childcare system due to COVID-19. Many workers have found that their childcare needs have changed. This can be due to the fact that they feel they can no longer ask grandparents for care or the days or hours they work may also have been changed. Families outside the system are effectively locked out. Services will receive no funding for them. Now, it's vital our childcare system is flexible and can support this change in demand for their services to ensure that parents can go to work. Despite the Prime Minister stating that every Australian with a job is an essential worker, the reality for many families is that their lack of access to childcare is now a barrier to participating in work. The government is trying to shift the blame onto providers, completely failing to understand that providers across Australia are desperately crunching the numbers to try and provide as much care as possible. To keep their doors open with such a reduction in revenue, some early learning providers are left with no choice but to reduce staff, cut opening hours, deny care to new families or cancel existing enrolments. The government's changes restrict providers to 50 per cent of their revenue as of the beginning of March, providing them with no incentive or capacity to accept new enrolments or allow parents to increase their hours. Services that had maintained enrolments over the previous few weeks, particularly family day care and in-home services, were stripped of significant income. These businesses should not have to work harder for less and wear the costs of the government's policy changes. While some providers are also eligible to apply for JobKeeper or a top-up fund, many are still unable to access JobKeeper and there appears to be very limited circumstances in which providers can access the additional funds. It is absolutely vital that every early learning service will be able to access the JobKeeper payment. Labor welcomed the government's announcement to provide fee relief for families and urgent support to providers. It has provided some financial security to providers that are in danger of closing due to collapsing enrolments. But without properly funding free childcare, the Morrison government's childcare changes have created winners and losers, with some families receiving free childcare and others receiving no care at all. If those opposite would just take the time to talk to the people affected by their policy changes before they announce them, they would end up implementing better policy. Labor will continue to ensure families, early educators and providers are adequately supported during and after this crisis. And Labor urges the Morrison government to properly fund our early education and care system to support parents and ensure every Australian family who requires childcare can access it. If this is not done properly, it will be devastating for families, early educators and our economy. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, Throughout the uh, COVID-19 crisis, we've seen many heroes in our workforce. Nurses, doctors, emergency services and many others. But one group that I'd particularly like to thank is those unsung heroes working in retail, fast food and warehousing. While most Australians have stayed safe, hundreds of thousands of essential workers have gone to work each day to help keep our country running. At a time when so many sectors of our economy have been shut down to protect public health, workers in these industries have continued to go to work every single day. <clears throat> Retail workers in supermarkets and stores have ensured that we can get what we need to feed our families and get essential items. Those in pharmacies have continued to work through this unprecedented health crisis so Australians can access important medical supplies. Fast food employees have adopted, uh, adapted to the uh, changing ways of work so we can grab a meal when we need to. And warehouse workers have worked around the clock to make sure that every supermarket and store has enough goods to go around. 
I'd like to say thank you to every one of these essential workers who are working through this incredibly difficult period, especially those in stores who faced unacceptable abuse and violence from shoppers uh, when all you're trying to do is do your job. You deserve to be treated with respect and dignity at work, not just during this crisis, but all of the time. These workers face the same fears and anxieties as everyone else trying to manage during this time. They have their own families, but have bravely and diligently shown up for work each day. They deserve not only be, to be thanked, but to be provided with a safe workplace, with paid leave if they are sick, or to have uh, self-isolate, uh, and with a job and financial security if they are stood down. These are all the things that their union, the SDA, has been working tirelessly to secure for their more than 200,000 members across this country. I know that the SDA has taken every effort to ensure that the safety of every worker is their first priority during this crisis. Thanks to this uh, great union, these workers can continue to serve the community, knowing that no matter what changes or what is next, their union will continue to be there to represent and to support them. Thank you to every essential worker across retail, fast food and warehousing industry. As more and more stores begin to reopen, I'd ask every Australian to treat them with respect and, when you're shopping, to understand that their safety is important too. We do not want to see any more of the panic buying, which has sometimes led to hoarding and, even worse, profiteering. The SDA has been calling for a range of protections to ensure retail workers' safety during this pandemic. They have relaunched the No One Deserves a Serve campaign and called for all Australians, when they get to the shelves or to the checkout, to be patient, kind and thankful towards the staff and treat them with re the respect that they deserve. No one deserves a serve for just trying to do their job. It's only a few weeks ago that we were seeing scenes on our television screens of retail workers on the receiving end of verbal and even physical abuse over low stock levels and purchasing limits. Retail workers have been sworn at, yelled at and in some cases physically assaulted. There's never, never an excuse for abuse. And now uh, retail workers are faced with a new threat. Thousands of Australians are ignoring ongoing distancing measures and packing into shops as restrictions on movement and gathering are eased. Uh, that is not OK. As we start to see a stage easing of restrictions in some jurisdiction, it can't be simply left <coughs> to the hard-working shop assistants to police the socially <coughs> distancing rules. Governments must lead the way in shaping public behaviour and ensure the message is being received and distance adhered to. We need our shops to um, open to suppliers to keep our economy going and to get more than a million workers back to work. Uh, we can't allow our retail sector to become the epicentre of new outbreaks simply because customers can't control themselves. That's not fair on retail workers and it's not fair on shop assistants. We can start by showing workers who kept us going in the toughest of time courtesy, gratitude and the, res and the respect that they deserve. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, I um, would like to associate myself too with uh, Senator Farrell's remarks. Not enough praise uh, and thanks and gratitude can be sent in the direction of, uh, of workers who work through this, uh, particularly, particularly retail workers. Um, I, uh, I want to make a couple of comments about the passing uh, over the last uh, 48 hours of Jack Mundy. Um, I was driving to Canberra very early uh, yesterday morning when I got a phone call from a colleague in the Labor movement to say that Jack Mundy had died uh, over the course of the evening. I had a long talk with uh, Meredith Bergman, a former president of the New South Wales Legislative Council and the author of the definitive book, one of Australia's leading Labor history books about the history of the Builders Labourers Federation uh, and Jack Mundy's Green Bands, Green Bands Red Union. And it caused me to reflect that some of our greatest political leaders actually never serve in this parliament or in our state parliaments. Jack Mundy was a remarkable union leader, regarded as the father uh, of urban environmentalism. He was a globally significant figure. 
today he's owned by the whole of the labour movement, the environmentalist movement, heritage protection activists, progressives broadly and indeed uh, well loved amongst uh, people right across the political spectrum who care about, uh, who care about Sydney, uh, its architecture and its heritage. But very few of those were there supporting him when he was active. In fact, many of them uh, directly opposed him at the time. Many of them violently opposed him at the time. There should be a state funeral for Jack Mundy if we knew what we were doing and could work across the political divisions. He's a living national treasure who is now dead. He came through in a much less <coughs> sanitised era. The son of a Queensland cane cutting family, he came to Sydney to try out for first grade rugby league and as a boxer. His career with Parramatta was short, was rugby league's loss and Sydney's gain. He became a builder's labourer at a time when the Builders Labourers Federation in Sydney was a weak and supine union. His battle for democratic control of that union, funded by collections from members, and I looked at one of the $2 tickets that you could buy, was a titanic struggle for control of that union. He left a remarkable industrial legacy, but it's what he did with that and with the confidence of the members who he represented in a democratic way. Green bands in the Rocks, Woolloomooloo, Glebe, Centennial Park, King's Cross, Ultimo, the Opera House Precinct, Kelly's Bush in Hunter Hill, the State Theatre, the Pitt Street Uniting Church, <clears throat> all of the heritage buildings in Martin Place are there because of Jack Mundy and the Builders Labourers Federation. He was opposed by developers, a corrupt Askin government, by violent police. He conducted pickets and sit-ins and strikes, all democratically, all done with the support of building workers. Uh, and Sydney, in a large extent, has been saved. Kids will be born tomorrow who will grow up in a Sydney that has so much amenity and is so much more beautiful and such a great place to live and they will not know that this bloke made such an enormous contribution. Monday and the BLF's achievement was to sustain those victories, to hold the line until the election of Whitlam and the activism of Tom Uren in 1972, and then the Rand government being elected in 1976, initiating the necessary reforms to make the BL's victories permanent. Of course, if it happened now, if Jack Mundy led those struggles now, the developers would win. <clears throat> the union would be fined, deregistered, BLF members fined or imprisoned, Mundy locked up. Uh, that would be the consequence of struggling the way that Jack Mundy and the Green Bands Union did. The current hyper-regulation of industrial relations stifles our democracy. He's done more remarkable things in his career. The first pink ban in support of gay and lesbian rights at Macquarie University uh, was a world first uh, union activity in that area. Uh, forcing, women, uh, forcing employers to employ women on building sites, all with the democratic endorsement of the members and a world first in the building industry. I want to pass on my condolences to Jack's wife, Judy, uh, to all his friends and comrades in the labour movement He's a great Australian who will be laid to rest shortly. Uh, vale. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Favanti Rose. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, post Wuhan coronavirus, Australians do not want business as usual with the communist regime in China. The billions of dollars being expended to counter the pandemic is borrowed money, which we, the taxpayers, must repay. These costs are a direct consequence of the CCP's wrongful acts and, accordingly, Australians expect reparations. As I have been advocating since early April, it is important for Australia to act upon those things which are within its control, namely a plan for reparations and a plan to decouple from China. This will require a great deal of political fortitude. Regrettably, I suspect we have a long way to go in this regard. Let's not forget that only a year ago our government allowed three Chinese warships to sail into Sydney Harbour on the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre.
This was at a time when the CCP was harassing Royal Australian Navy vessels innocently transiting on a visit to Vietnam and against the background of China's bellicose and illegal actions in the South China Sea and the CCP's constant harassment of those exercising freedom of navigation operations. On reparations, it is incumbent on the government to investigate all possible ways to recover damages for health costs and damage to our economy. It is most likely we will go into recession with enormous loss of jobs and livelihoods. The culpability of the CCP has been articulated in a recent report by leading UK think tank, the Henry Jackson Society, entitled Coronavirus Compensation. It states that had China provided accurate information at an early juncture, the infection would not have left China. Instead, the CCP covered up and punished the doctors who sought to tell the truth. The massive underreporting of cases, the attempts to rewrite the narrative, the lies and the cover-up all support culpability of the CCP. The Henry Jackson report canvasses a breach of the WHO international health regulations and suing China for $6.5 trillion. WHO regulations were adopted in 1969 to prevent the international spread of disease by placing obligation on states to prevent highly transmittable diseases. They were revised in 2005 after SARS, but the CCP did not learn the lessons from SARS and repeated previous blunders. On 31 December 2019, Taiwan's Centre for Disease Control notified the WHO of human-to-human -human transmission of the virus. Because of the One China policy, Taiwan's warnings were ignored. On 14 January, the WHO instead tweeted there was no human-to-human -human transmission based on information from the CCP. Indeed, WHO Director General Tadros stated China is actually setting a new standard for outbreak response. The absurdity of the WHO's conduct was seen when its Assistant Director General Alwood wouldn't even acknowledge Taiwan's existence in an interview. And this demonstrated the failure of the WHO in tandem with China to stop the epidemic. But then let us not forget that China has been the source of numerous pandemics. An article entitled BRI Modern Day Silk Road Black Plague by Rebecca Weiser in The Spectator on 7 March traces this history. The Black Death, like coronavirus, was made in China. It is no coincidence that the worst outbreaks in the Middle East and Europe have been Iran and Italy. Each is the anchor of the Belt and Road Initiative, the 21st century version of the Silk Road. The article outlines China as the source of other outbreaks, the Plague of Justinian in 541, the Spanish Flu 1919, the Asian Flu, the Hong Kong Flu, the Avian Flu, SARS and now coronavirus. Why? One theory is that the virus started in a Wuhan wet market, a cross between a zoo and a slaughterhouse. After each outbreak, China says it will crack down on the illegal trade of wildlife, but it doesn't. The CCP places higher priority on suppression of criticism against it than on food safety regulations. Perhaps if China spent more on revamping its scandal-ridden healthcare sector and less on pursuing its illegal and bellicose actions in the South China Sea, its people would enjoy a far better quality of life. Another theory is it originated in a laboratory. Recent media stories have highlighted the possible role of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Recently, I read a translation of a speech given to a select group of high-level CCP officials by Qi Haoshan, China's defence minister from 1993 to 2003 and vice chairman of its Central Military Commission. His chilling reference to using non-destructive weapons that can kill many people and rapid development of modern biological technology and new bioweapons puts the recent outbreak into a more sinister light. Irrespective of the theories, the origins of the virus was in China, and China remains responsible for the outbreak. Post-pandemic, we need to overhaul our critical infrastructure and foreign investment framework. Critical infrastructure legislation needs to be extended beyond ports and utilities of gas, water and electricity to include other key sectors such as banking and finance, food, grocery and agriculture, health and medical, transport, communications and IT and airports. 
In so doing, we must expand restrictions to ensure practical ways to protect our sovereignty. This includes revisiting the decision to lease the Port of Darwin, especially given the change to security circumstances. It should never have been leased to Landbridge, given its close ties to the CCP. I started questioning defence officials about this at estimates last year. The recent FERB changes announced by the Treasurer are only a start, with examination of further limitations and broader interpretation of the national interest required. Reciprocity of acquisition is also important. If Australians or Australian entities are restricted from acquiring assets in China, then why should the CCP or its state-owned entities be given free reign to acquire even more strategic assets in Australia? In January 2018, I drew attention to China's activities, especially in the Pacific. My prescient warnings have been fully vindicated. Following this, an international debate ensued about debt trap diplomacy and the strategy used by the CCP to lure countries to borrow large amounts for infrastructure projects, usually on a debt for equity basis. When the loan can't be repaid, the CCP takes the equity, ending up owning the asset. I am concerned that the CCP is taking advantage of the pandemic to further its insidious debt trap diplomacy by taking advantage of economically stressed nation states through the Belt and Road Initiative. BRI is code for debt trap diplomacy, a warning that Premier Andrews has failed to heed. There is concern that when companies are financially stressed, like Virgin Airlines, we must guard against predatory behaviour and bargain hunting by totalitarian regimes like CCP and their state-owned entities. Our security and sovereignty are at risk, and we should be reducing, not increasing, such controls over key assets. Over a quarter of our two-way trade is with the CCP. Those resisting decoupling are, argue exports are at risk. The CCP may not like us or trust us, but it will continue to buy goods vital to China's economic growth and those which will help feed its 1.3 billion people, because we are a reliable source of high quality and well-priced goods. Our top imports from China include a whole raft of everyday items. We must reduce our dependency on China, become more self-reliant and diversify our trade. The pandemic has shown our overdependence on overseas supply chains, especially in medical supplies. The Bali dispute and today's delisting by China of four abattoirs is symptomatic of the predicament Australia now finds itself in, although some argue it has been brewing for some time. Those leading our fellow traveller foreign policy over many years including those doing business with the CCP, have preferred to turn a blind eye to its skullduggery so long as the rivers of gold continue to flow. These, this includes some of our major universities, overly dependent on overseas students and substantial funding from the presence of Confucius Institutes. They have clearly not followed the teachings of their own business schools in practising diversification. The recent threats by the Chinese ambassador are symptomatic of the predicament we have placed ourselves in, where we are vulnerable to economic coercion. In conclusion, Australians will now expect their government to demonstrate the necessary political fortitude to focus on those issues within our power to control, namely a plan for reparations and a plan to decouple from China. Senator Sheldon. Good. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rose to tell the stories of some of the hundreds of thousands of aviation workers across Australia who have been let down by the Prime Minister and this government. There is no doubt that the shutdown of flights was the right thing to do, a necessary thing to do, to save lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, no one disputes it. But it's important to note that a shutdown was not a market failure. It was and continues to be government policy, a policy the government must take responsibility for and must also take responsibility for the people affected by the shutdown. Firstly, there are more than 10,000 workers at Virgin Australia and their families right around this nation. As a company, it contributes $30 billion to the Australian economy through many avenues, especially tourism. Workers who lie awake from yet another night of broken sleep 
rolling over to check their phones to find out the latest on what's happening with their employer. These Australians who have a knot in their gut, who have to look into the eyes of their partners and their children and say again, there is no good news. Workers like Matt and Beck, who live in the Prime Minister's electorate in the Shire, with their three beautiful girls, Bella, Eva and Sophia, three triplets who turned two just last week. And I want to wish the girls a very happy birthday. They both flew internationally for Virgin Australia, so a sometimes difficult lifestyle, but one they made work. With JobKeeper payments set to end, they've had to move in with Beck's parents. Then there's Ellen, who has worked pretty much her whole career in the air. At 18, she started at Rex before coming over to Virgin. Ellen was one of the last flights was on one of the last flights back in the country from Los Angeles. For the safety of their, these, those loved ones, she self-quarantined, despite the government ridiculously exempting flight crews from this necessary action. This, however, meant that she missed out on the few Coles and Woolies jobs that were offered to aviation workers early on in the lockdown. Now she is unable to find work. For her, there is made worse by the memories of the suffering of her parents that, had endured, that they had endured during the ANSA collapse. Aviation runs in the blood of many families. Both of Ellen's parents worked at ANSET for decades. When the airline collapsed, it devastated her family like so many. Her dad moved overseas to continue to chase work, and her mum was left to hold the fort together back home. The financial struggle and the mental toll that came with the collapse led her family to breaking apart. Ellen's mum remained scarred, just like many others from the loss of so many friends to suicide. No family should have to watch this history repeat itself. But the families of the aviation industry have a friend in the Federal Labor Party, especially in our Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, who as Minister of the Infrastructure and Transport released a national aviation white paper whilst he, whilst he was the minister. This contrasts with the absence of policy from the Deputy Prime Minister, McCormick. Maybe he should have read it and he'd have something to, to base some policies on. And I might also suggest to him that if he hasn't got a copy, I'm more than happy to send it to him for so he could have a read. Because that policy paved a path for industry with certainty, maintaining and improving safety and security and creating jobs right across the country. Now, having just a single full-service airline in Australia will mean higher fares for passengers, lower wages for workers, and cost our tourism industry billions. I call on the federal government to ensure the Virgin emerges from the voluntary administration process a full-service airline and provides services across the country and to regional Australia. This is why I renew my personal call for the federal government to send a signal to the market by taking an equity stake in Virgin. This would tell the market and the potential new owners that the government supports a strong and viable aviation industry. Without this support, Virgin is likely to be stripped back to its bones. The Golden Triangle of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, which makes the lion's share of profits, would obviously stay. The regions, however, would suffer greatly. Hard-working families like Matt and Beck, with their three daughters like Ellen and potentially thousands more virgin workers. Now, there's also another debacle in aviation at Donata. We have a situation where Australian workers have worked in the Australian aviation industry their whole lives. Some of them for Qantas and other catering companies before the government approved its sale to Donata. These workers are now being denied access to the Australian JobKeeper scheme by our government because Donata is owned ultimately by the Dubai government. These workers do not choose who owns their company. Retrospectively excluding the workers of Donata from the JobKeeper scheme is a cruel strike of the pen that has left some 5,500 workers 
out of a scheme that was designed specifically to assist, assist workers like them. These workers have no control over who owns the company they work for, but what they do have is Australian passports and a lifetime of work in Australia. They paid taxes in Australia all their lives, and now they have been let down by their own government, which doesn't seem to care. I want to tell you the story of Natasha Croton, who emailed my office. She was born and lives in Redcliffe in Queensland, has been paying taxes since 16. She has been roughly at Donata for six years. Her partner and her two-year-old boy just a few days ago, who just a few days ago underwent a medical procedure. Medical supplies costing $20 to $30 a day. Natasha has now been without pay for eight weeks. The rent, the electricity, water, phone, internet and rego bills have not stopped coming in. Her son had a tin of pineapple and tin beetroot with ham for dinner again last night. That's how tight money is currently for her. She has no annual leave left due to taking a year off for maternity leave when her son was born. Her partner works, but his hours have been cut down. She is not eligible for JobKeeper, and because of the government has been excluded, she is also not eligible for job uh, for JobKeeper nor JobSeeker. Some of her colleagues have been caught in a terrible situation. Now, how many of them have cancelled their applications when they heard that Donata was originally entitled to JobKeeper? They were playing by the rules only to have the government move the goalposts on the mid-game. Cancelling their applications has cost them time and money they can ill afford. It will now be another four weeks before they can seek get job seeker, assuming that they can meet the requirements. Workers like Natasha need the government to step in and help. They need the government to work out a way to help Australian citizens that have been working and paying taxes their entire lives. It wasn't the workers who grounded the planes, it was the government. I'm calling on this government to change its regulations and grant companies like Donata access to JobKeeper to support these workers and to produce a national aviation plan without which we'll see no snapback for Matt, Beck, Ellen and Natasha and for many thousands more Australians and their families. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. In March this year, the government made one of the most significant changes to our social security system in Australia's history by doubling the rate of, jobs, of the job seeker payment by, by providing the co, um, coronavirus supplement. The temporary increase to the job seeker payment to $1,115 a fortnight was the first real increase in a long, long time, and the first time job, se job seeker payment, and before that, of course, Newstart, is above the poverty line for a long, long, long time. Unemployed Australians are finally able to afford um, ba basic daily expenses and essentials, like food utility bills, transport and clothing. That is a very, very important um, point to note. There are also other changes made, such as uh, dropping um, and, or suspending mutual obligations, uh, changing income thresholds for partners on a number of payments, waiting times and a number of other things were also dropped, highlighting the fact that the government knows these issues are these work barriers to people getting quick support. So in other times, waiting times for payment, when people need uh, ready access to an income, are also very important. But they highlight the fact that the government knew these were a problem and needed to be dealt with. My argument here is they're a problem when we aren't in crisis as well, when people lose their jobs and need to be able to access our income support system. I will also note here that there are a number of groups and cohorts of people that in fact have not been able to access enough supports. Those under 22 who don't live at home, who are in fact some of them alienated from their families, um, were not able, are not able to access income support. 
people on DSP and carers payment did not get or have not had access to the supplement and I will in fact talk about that uh, further at a later stage visa holders are not able to access um, either job seeker or job keeper the fact that job, the job seeker payment was increased by the government after years and years of resistance is an admission that people can't survive on $40 a day, especially during a recession. As we navigate our way out of a global pandemic, there are many things about the future that are uncertain. But one thing is crystal clear. We cannot go back to a world where people are forced to live and try and survive on $40 a day. We can't go back to the old rate because when income support payments are that low, people are trapped in poverty. It means they don't have the capacity to look for work because they are focused on where their next meal is coming from, how they will pay the rent, how they will pay the mortgage, how they will are able to afford to send their children to school, in fact. Low income support payments are leading to poverty and have, in fact, led to poverty. Poverty in and of itself is a barrier to employment. The Faces of Unemployment of 2020 report demonstrated that when someone has been unemployed for over a year, their chances of getting a job fall by 40 per cent. In 2018, one in four job seekers experienced long-term unemployment. We know that long-term unemployment has devastating consequences for people's well-being. Pushing job seekers below the poverty line can condemn people to a cycle of long-term unemployment. The twin health and economic crisis is not going to go away on the 25th of September this year, when the, the supplement, the uh, COVID, uh, the coronavirus supplement ends, so is due to end. There are over 1.4 million Australians on job seeker at the moment, and some experts are saying it could go higher. And that even the DSS at the uh, said at the COVID inquiry hearing on the 30th of um, April, that they were using estimates of 1.7 million by the end of September. In other words, we don't know if we're going to have more people um, on JobSeeker by September. We will certainly have a large number of people on JobSeeker come the 25th of September. The economy is not going to miraculously snap back in September. This is a crisis that will have an enduring impact on our economy and the jobs to, and the jobs for quite a long time to come. Many industries that are experiencing significant downturns will take time to recover. The coronavirus is already hurting those who are worst off, those in the gig economy, precarious work, were the first to lose out when, and first to lose their jobs um, when, the virus, when the virus hit and unemployment figures started rising. But they had nothing to fall back on. No sick leave. No annual leave. The young have lost more jobs than other cohorts. Low income workers are twice as likely to be out of work as high income earners. And in the week ending April 18, almost twice as many women lost their jobs than men. While we plan for the recovery phase, for recovery recovery phase of this crisis, our responsibility is to look after people, to ensure that those on low income payments are properly supported and to ensure that we do not leave people behind. An essential poll from last week indicated that 57 per cent of Australians um, believe that the job seeker payment should not be cut back down or should not be cut down to the old new start rate. So what does the keeping job seeker payment above the poverty line really mean for unemployed workers? Last week I asked those workers what doubling of the job seeker payment means for them. And here's a couple of their responses. Dental for me, maybe save for the braces for my boys, replace old broken furniture, one of my kids' beds, and yes, definitely not have to worry about food and bills for a while. Another person said, my son has been able to not worry about putting petrol in his car for casual employment, as well as eating better than cheap rubbish foods, buy shoes, socks and underwear, pay his car registration without foregoing food. Somebody else said, it means I don't have to choose between going to the dentist or going to the psychologist. 
These are the real lived experiences of people who are, who are now able to get that higher payment of JobSeeker. These are everyday essential costs for anyone, and anybody should be able to afford them, whether they are an income support or not, and I would argue are very critical if you are looking for work. I find it untenable that the government is already so committed to ending the, co the coronavirus supplement in September. While I don't know what the economy will look like in se September, I do know that cutting income support is simply not the answer. However, it is not only the rate of job seeker payment that's important. Employment services, which are, have always been so essential, are going to be even more essential with so many people looking for work. They are going to play an absolutely critical role in helping and supporting unemployed workers back into employment. Unfortunately, Australia has been massively underspending and underinvesting in employment services. And yes, I can hear people saying we already spend quite a bit of money on employment services. Unfortunately, we spend less than half the OECD average amount as a share of GDP on employment programs. We have a system that puts compliance and penalties ahead of genuine support and assistance. People are cut off from their payments, very often through no fault of their own. Providers are responsible under our current system for compliance at the same time as they are supposed to be helping people find work, building a trusting, relationship, supportive relationship with people in order to support them into work, to help them establish what their barriers are and help them address them with wraparound services that are individualised, not a stamped out job plan, which is what we are seeing. And we know that from the evidence. We know from the evidence that um, through the, for example, the, times, the targeted compliance framework that these and the, and the number of people that get um, penalty points um, because, and when they have a look at it, they find out their job plan is in error or doesn't meet their needs. It is time that we invested more in our employment services, that we provided that supportive wraparound individual, individualised support for people finding work. It has never been more important than now to make sure we get that right. But it's also absolutely critical that we don't go back to $40 a day, that we retain the rate for good for both job seeker and youth allowance. Retain the rate. Senator McCarthy. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to uh, speak uh, to the Senate and really to have an opportunity to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the people of the Northern Territory. Uh, thank you to uh, those who've worked so diligently right across our country, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, to keep all Australians safe. Uh, to the National Cabinet, to the Prime Minister and all the Premiers and uh, Territory Chief Ministers involved in coordinating uh, in a way that uh, our country, whilst we are looking at how we're going to come out of this, uh, this is a moment to, to just say thanks. You know, thank you. To the Chief Minister and the people of the Northern Territory, to his team, his staff, uh, to guide uh, the Territorians, in particular our remote and regional uh, communities, uh, to a safe point to where we are. We know that uh, we haven't beaten this COVID-19, Madam Acting Deputy President, but uh, we do know that uh, the incredible effort and united uh, effort by so many to, to ensure that we kept the virus at bay has helped us to get to where we are today, and we do still have to remain vigilant. To the Aboriginal Community Health Organisations, to Congress, to Donna Archie and Dr John Boffa in Alice Springs, to Barb Shaw at Ananungi Congress in Tennant Creek, to Sunrise and to Catherine West and to Whirly Whirlingjang and Catherine, uh, to Me Watch over in Arnhem Land and to Danila Dilba in Darwin. Uh, these Aboriginal community health organisations are just absolutely outstanding, Madam Acting Deputy President. And they know, they knew straight away uh, how and when to act and to move and calling for 
uh, the closure of the borders and calling for uh, the immediate uh, translation of over so many languages uh, to provide the health expertise and advice to our communities who were uh, very concerned uh, and trying to understand what was going on. To the land councils, to Central Land Council, to the Northern Land Council, to the Tiwi Land Council and the Anandiliakwa Land Council, to you and your board and chairmanships and also to your leadership uh, in this whole process in guiding not only the Northern Territory Government but the Federal Government uh, in what was needed for First Nations people across the Northern Territory. Uh, this is an opportunity in the Senate to just uh, be filled with gratitude uh, that all of these groups have come together uh, to ensure the safety of Territorians, but in particular the safety of all Australians, and certainly um, pay our respects to those who lost uh, many loved ones throughout this COVID-19 crisis, which we are still going through. The Territory was certainly called on uh, Madam Acting Deputy President uh, from the outset uh, to step up very, very early in this crisis in January. Uh, Christmas Island, which falls under the federal seat of Lingiari in the Northern Territory, housed Australians evacuated from Wuhan province. And with short notice, a team of Australians from the NT were dispatched to set up a field hospital on Christmas Island in case of a COVID-19 outbreak. And this included OSMAT staff sent from the National Critical Care and Trauma Response Centre in Darwin. And it was again OSMAT staff from that trauma response centre who looked after the 200 or so evacuees sent to the Howard Springs facility outside Darwin for 14 days of quarantine. All of these staff, all of these personnel have done the Northern Territory and Australia proud. Uh, and I want to put that on the parliamentary record, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, in a great time of uncertainty uh, for all Australians, but in particular in our regional remote areas of Australia. I especially pay tribute today on International uh, Day for nurses, uh, not only the nurses of obviously the Northern Territory, but around Australia and around the globe, Madam Deputy President. When we look at uh, our fellow human beings in all other countries around the world who are still struggling to, to get on top of this crisis, uh, we certainly know that we are incredibly fortunate here in our country and we must never lose sight of our ability to still reach out to others in some way to provide any kind of expertise that we can. And it is always good when we can see that no matter how difficult Australians find uh, their particular situation, uh, we are still generous enough as a country, I believe, uh, acting uh, Madam Deputy President, to remember those who still require a great deal of support in some way, shape or form. And in this case, uh, many of us have learned how to, uh, to use Zoom, something that I probably didn't do too much of, but now I, I'm kind of like an expert. Um, still learning, though. Uh, certainly so many teleconferences, uh, speaking to our communities in the Territory, speaking to uh, the many councils. I do want to pay tribute to our local government councils, the shires across the Northern Territory, uh, who did and are doing everything they can uh, to get our people safely through, but also to make sure a food supplies got through. Uh, the the fact that food security was a real concern, uh, second to the health of people, we had to ensure that food security was getting through uh, to the First Nations caucus of the Federal Labor Party. Uh, I'd like to certainly thank each and every member of the First Nations caucus uh, who have diligently worked uh, long days and hours on the phone as we've tried to make sure not only in the Northern Territory but right across Australia for First Nations people the particular policies were uh, being met on the ground and particular concerns that people were raising were able to be channelled back to uh, Minister Ken White. And I do commend uh, Ken White and the staff uh, at his agency with the briefings that we were able to receive. We were then able to provide direct uh, information of disparity, 
direct information of concerns that were impacting communities uh, that could be uh, uh, worked on immediately. And even uh, in, in the case of uh, the concerns around Centrelink and families who so desperately needed support, in particular in uh, Central Australia, when jobs, hundreds and hundreds of jobs, were lost at uh, Yalara. Uh, I do commend uh, Minister Rustin uh, for her efforts and the conversations that we were able to provide uh, in, in many of those conversations, the information to, to try and get support uh, for people. And this is the sort of thing that I think we look at in terms of our country and the values that we hold as a country. We must never diminish the values of stepping up and stepping strong together. But we are also, I think, one of the best things about our country is that we can also constructively criticise uh, where it is necessary to do so, not from the point of point scoring, Madam Acting Deputy President, but from the point of wanting to see things improve for the better in, in quite serious uh, circumstances that had been occurring over the last couple of months. So I would like to uh, certainly commend the Chief Minister Michael Gunner and Health Minister Natasha Files in particular in the Northern Territory. Uh, certainly we've seen the relaxation of uh, many of, uh, sort of the restrictions that have been on people, but uh, we still know that we're not 100 per cent out of this. And I'd say to the people of the Northern Territory in particular that we've got to continue to walk together, to work together and to ensure that uh, the safety of each other is paramount, but also the safety of uh, job security for all people. Uh, in particular in our remote regions of Australia, uh, so that we can work on the policies going forward post-COVID-19 to ensure that we do not go back to the way it was, uh, where penalties, harsh penalties, did impact and do impact uh, Australians who are on welfare. And I certainly encourage this Senate and fellow senators that as we do move forward, we have to uh, move towards a new paradigm, a new shift, where our fellow Australians can live with dignity and know and trust that the policies we provide through this Senate uh, is always about ensuring that every Australian has an opportunity to be the best that they can and have the choice to do the things that they wish to do with their lives, raise their families and their homes equally. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a surreal world for all of us, a life none of us imagined we would be living. When Australians finally come out of this crisis, many won't want to return to business as usual. Most of us want a fairer, more equitable, and just society. And that's a world that doesn't include poker machines. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused upheaval and heartache across the globe, but there have been silver linings as well. 194,000 poker machines were turned off in March as pokies venues and casinos shut down across the nation in response to the COVID-19 crisis. The flashing lights have dimmed, and the unmistakable, relentless chimes of the machines have finally fallen silent. And with the flick of the switch, the extreme harm caused by pokies has been stopped, stopped in its tracks, though not because state governments phase them out in recognition of the harm they cause our society. Such as the deep addiction of various state governments beholden to pokies' barons and being conflicted by being both the regulator of these insidious machines and the beneficiary of the tax revenue pocketed from them. We need to be reminded that our major parties are both content to continue receiving political donations from the gambling industry, which is nothing less than dirty money. Australia has far more pokey machines per person than any country in the world any country in the world, excluding casino tourism destinations like Macau and Monaco. New South Wales alone 
has nearly 10% of the world's poker machines. Collectively, Australia has 20% of the world's machines, and that's nothing to be proud of, especially when you think that uh, many are concentrated in areas that include some of the nation's poorest pockets. Australia ranks number one with the highest gambling losses per capita worldwide, around $1,400 per person, which literally makes us the biggest losers across the globe. Despite these alarming statistics, there has been a push to turn the pokies back on with reported secret plans to reopen venues to be presented to the National Cabinet. This is not a game. We must take stock of what they have cost our community and what we have gained with their shutdown. $24.9 billion was lost by Australians in the 2017-2018 year from gambling, with over half of these losses coming from pokies. That's $12.5 billion down the slot. The only winners are the rapacious pokies venues. Sports betting, by comparison, represents $1.2 billion of losses in the same year, a big number, but still dwarfed by pokies losses. Online gambling is on the rise since the pandemic hit, with opportunistic online gambling sites bombarding stay-at-home Australians with intrusive social media ads offering bets on everything imaginable. In the absence of competitive sports, you can still bet on the greyhounds and horse racing, not to mention the more obscure options such as darts, the weather, Belarusian soccer and MasterChef, just to name a small handful. However, online gambling is a very different cohort to those people who gamble on pokies. And the losses on pokies far and above outweigh online gambling losses. The social cost of gambling is also enormous, with direct connections in many cases between gambling, domestic violence and mental ill health. A 2017 study of the social costs of gambling harm, commissioned by the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation, found that the cost of gambling harm was a staggering $7 billion over just one year. And that is just in Victoria alone. Doing the sums, this adds up to $2.2 billion in family and relationship problems, $1.6 billion on emotional and psychological issues, including distress, depression, suicide and violence, $1.3 billion in financial losses through, for example, excessive spending on gambling, bankruptcy and illegal offshore gambling, $1.1 billion in other costs to the government, such as research, regulation and professional support services, including mental health and homelessness services. $600 million on lost productivity and other work-related costs. And $100 million on costs of crime, including to businesses and the justice system. Extrapolated across the nation, the costs would be many billions of dollars more. We can't afford to keep ignoring the facts associated with the harms caused by gambling. Overall, the forced closure of pokies is overwhelmingly good. Australians are collectively saving over $1 billion every month by having the pokies switched off. $1 billion every single month. That's money that can be instead used towards putting food on table, paying for medical bills and utilities, rent and mortgages. Lockdown has provided people harmed by gambling with a real chance to break their habit, with many reportedly contacting support agencies saying that forced closure has not only been good for their well-being, but also for that of their families. One woman was recently reported in the media as saying that she was finally able to afford to buy Easter eggs for her children for the very first time because pokey dens were shut. 
We have a unique opportunity to help people permanently break away from the hold of these despicable machines. State governments may love the tax revenue that pokies bring in, but they cannot ignore that the shutdown of pokies has had very much a public health benefit, well and truly beyond COVID-19, and that was once in the too hard basket. It has been a circuit breaker so many gambling addicts have needed. We cannot drop the ball now. No Australian should be put at risk of gambling harm by reopening these venues. To do so is unconscionable. Of course, we are concerned for workers at gambling venues, many of whom have lost their jobs in the fallout of the current shutdown. They are entitled to safe, stable and meaningful work. Realistically, that kind of work can be found outside of the gambling industry because despite what owners of pokey dens claim, research suggests it is far more productive to invest in hospitality than gambling. Where we know for every $1 million spent on food and meals, 20 jobs are created. Contrast that with a mere three jobs for the same amount lost to gambling. Gambling doesn't add up. On the other side of the crisis, Australians will need a safe place to uh, recreate our social networks. Hospitality staff and entertainers will need sustainable, productive work. Let's rebuild our pubs and clubs into vibrant and thriving social hubs we can be proud of. Places that put people and connections first. Offer government assistance that enables pokey pubs and clubs to pull their machines out and replace them with community facilities that will deliver more jobs in two of the hardest hit sectors, hospitality and the arts. This is a once in a generation opportunity for Australia to change course on gambling harm. It's an opportunity that should not be wasted. We know that prevention is better than a cure. It's time to socially, economically and permanently distance ourselves from these vile machines once and for all. It will be a crime to do otherwise and a tragedy imprinted in Australia's history forever. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. COVID-19 has been a once-in-a-generation shock to our political and economic system. But some institutions entered this crisis nowhere near as well equipped as they should be for events like this, despite the warnings. One thing made clear already is the over-reliance of our higher education institutions on the international student market and the Chinese student market in particular. Over the last few decades, our universities have bet big on the international student dollar. Their institutions have boomed from what has been a very lucrative business, but they have become badly overexposed. It's why, after the government banned travel from non-citizens coming from China from 1 February, universities lobbied for the ban to be eased. It's why many paid students from China to assist them to circumvent that ban by spending time in third countries before arriving in Australia. It's why they've been lobbying for extra support from taxpayers above and beyond their guaranteed funding of $18 billion per year. They even asked to be treated the same as welfare relief charities like the Salvation Army and the Red Cross for the purpose of qualifying for JobKeeper. Universities argue that they've pursued this market by necessity. They argue insufficient government funding pushed them down this path. It's a convenient story that attempts to absolve universities from the responsibility for the decisions that they have made, and it is a false one. As Professor Salvatore Babones has pointed out in his excellent report last year for the Centre for Independent Studies, some of the largest recent increases in international student numbers in fact came at a time when taxpayer funding for universities was surging. According to data from the Parliamentary Library, international student numbers grew from 250,000 in 2011 to 300,000 in 2014, a period which coincided with the uncapped demand-driven funding mechanism which saw record growth in taxpayer support for universities. Chinese students have represented a very big proportion of these increases, particularly at some of our most elite universities. As Pro Professor Babones noted, 
At seven of our major universities, Chinese students represent more than 50 per cent of all international students. Some institutions, such as Sydney University, derive as much as a quarter of their revenue from international students from China alone. Let me be clear. I am supportive of Australian universities welcoming international students to their campuses. It is a good thing for our higher education sector to have a source of income that is not taxpayers or domestic student fees. International students can enrich student life on campus. They do deepen our people-to-people -people links with our trading partners. And those who come from authoritarian societies will hopefully encounter perspectives here they might not have otherwise and return home more liberal-minded than if they had not studied here. All of those things are profoundly positive for Australia and I look forward to it resuming as soon as it is safe to do so. However, pursuit of this market should be done cautiously and prudently and with a view to managing the risks involved. Those risks are not just financial, but to crucial aspects that go to the core of universities and free societies like academic freedom and sensitive research cooperation. Not all of our universities have managed this well in recent years. Even before the coronavirus, there were good reasons to be concerned about this dependence, particularly on students from China. There was always a risk of a downturn in this market, whether due to natural economic events or as a result of deliberate policy measures introduced by a foreign government we have limited influence over. Professor Babone's warning last year was very prescient. Sadly, it was not heeded by universities who mostly greeted it with, science, with silence. One university singled out in that CIS report was the University of Queensland. The report noted it, along with a handful of other universities, quote, enrol extraordinary and unsustainably risky numbers of Chinese students. So I was very intrigued to receive confidential documents from a whistleblower at the University of Queensland, which shed some light on how UK, UQ has found itself in this position. It is a copy of the remuneration report for senior staff at the University of Queensland for 2019. It sets out the performance indicators for the Vice-Chancellor, Peter Hoy, and the assessment of the Senior Remuneration Committee of his achievements against those KPIs. One of those KPIs attracted my particular attention. Number 12 reads, continue to work towards a sound and strategic positioning in China, given its potential rise towards becoming the predominant provider of research globally, and that it will continue to be a very important source of international students over at least the next five years, and likely more, barring geopolitical barriers being erected. The assessment of the committee of the vice chancellor's performance against the criteria was, quote, VC visited China four times in 2018 and twice in 2019, invited to be the closing plenary speaker at the prestigious annual Beijing Forum in November 2020. The demand for UQ courses from China has continued to grow strongly, and we will likely end up with 63 per cent of commencing international students coming from China in semester one 2020. There is one other relevant KPI. Number four states, as part of ensuring the resilience of UQ's financials and greater diversity of our international student body, make sure that we have made demonstrable progress towards ensuring stronger student flows from Southeast Asia, India, as well as one or more selected Latin American countries. With input from the VC, a strategy needs to be developed by the DVCEE for this. Alas, there was less progress towards this goal, as noted by the committee. Whilst the DVCEE has been ramping up activity to, to diversify the international student intake with increased market presence from the above mentioned geographies, we are yet to see this materialise in greater diversity in our international student cohort. Still, strong Chinese student demand. UQ increased G8 market share by 1.3 per cent to 13.5 per cent. UQ's growth was entirely due to growth in commencing Chinese students. Nationally, Chinese commencements dropped 788, comparable to UQ's growth. Despite his failure to achieve this KPI, the Vice-Chancellor was awarded a bonus of $200,000, a significant sum in anyone's language. Perhaps this is because the Remuneration Committee regarded the achievement of the China KPI as more significant. But far from an achievement warranting a bonus paid from student fees and taxpayer dollars, the prospect of 63 per cent of universities' foreign students coming from only one country should have been an alarm bell for the Chancellor, Peter Varghese, and the governing body of the university, the UQ Senate. They should have been demanding an explanation from the Vice-Chancellor about why UQ is being placed in such a risky and precarious situation and a strategy to get out of it quickly. Of course, relying on students from China disproportionately is not the same as being reliant on any other country. The Chinese Communist Party rules China in an authoritarian way and its values are very different to ours. In the university context, it does not uphold free speech, the principle of free of open academic inquiry or the right of protest for students. 
These non-financial risks are readily apparent at UQ. Right now, they are threatening a student, Drew Pavlou, with expulsion. He has been a prominent activist on campus on human rights issues and is in his own legal dispute with an honorary professor of the university who also happens to be the Consul General for the People's Republic of China in Brisbane. In July last year, the hopelessly inadequate agreement between UQ and Hanban, the CCC body responsible for Confucius Institutes abroad, was revealed by Fergus Hunter in the Sydney Morning Herald. The agreement contained no protections for academic freedom and handed incredible power to Hanban over teaching at UQ. The ABC later showed four separate courses at UQ were Chinese government funded, including extraordinarily one on China's role in strengthening responses to global security challenges such as human rights, mass atrocities prevention and counterterrorism. Following these revelations, the university belatedly promised to renegotiate its arrangements with the Confucius Institute in order to protect its autonomy. We are entitled to wonder why this weak agreement was ever put in place in the first place and whether it would have been renegotiated without this public scrutiny. We are also entitled to ask who at the university thought it was a good idea to allow a foreign government to directly fund courses for Australian university students. I note that Mr Hoy uh, is a former senior consultant to Hanban. Given that we now know that the Vice-Chancellor was financially incentivised to deliver closer relations with the CCP, it is no wonder that the University of Queensland has found itself in such a predicament. It begs the question, is he the only VC in Australia to receive a bonus for exposing his university to financial and reputational risk by actively seeking dependence on the Chinese student market? One final note for UQ. University management may believe they know who the whistleblower is who provided these documents to me. I advise them to exercise great caution in taking any adverse action against any person they suspect of doing so. I have sought the advice of the Clerk of the Senate, who confirms that as these documents were provided to me for the purposes of delivering this speech, they are attract the protection of parliamentary privilege. The Senate has in the past taken a very dim view of anyone who seeks to hinder a senator in the free performance of their duties, including providing them confidential documents in the public interest. Retribution against someone for doing so can in fact be a contempt of the Senate. I hope that UQ and all our universities are learning the right lessons of this crisis. The strategy that they willingly pursued against the warnings of people like Salvatore Babones has gravely damaged their institutions, both financially and reputationally. They will only emerge stronger from this period if they change their approach. Senator Lambie. Madam Acting Deputy, Deputy President. Do you know what the Chinese ambassador did when our government called for an inquiry into the coronavirus? He threatened us. If Australia pushes too hard on this inquiry idea, he said, China will stop buying our meat and drinking our wine. He told us that international students will think twice about coming here to study, that the tourists will stop coming. And he knew he could make those sorts of threats. And why? Because he knew our economic dependence on China is like a vein. And if they turn it off, the heart of our economy stops beating. For far too long, we've let the mantra of free trade blind us to the fact that we're selling our country right from under our very own feet. We've fallen into this false sense of security that whenever we need something, we'll always be able to buy it from somewhere else. But our supply chains are so fragile. And this crisis has definitely shown us that those supply chains break. When they break, we are less safe than we thought. We've placed all our eggs in one basket and that basket's been made in China. Self-sufficiency is never going to be possible in all areas, but it should be in a few critical ones. The rest, we just need to make sure we're getting our goods from a diverse range of sellers. Because when you're so reliant on a single country to sustain our own living standards, we are vulnerable to diplomatic or economic shocks that we cannot control. Shocks that could come just by running the country in a way that's consistent with our own values. Here, we value the rule of law. We value free and fair elections. We believe in privacy. We believe in presumption of innocence. We believe in freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of political expression, freedom of thought and movement. This is what we're proud of, because this is the Australian way. But our way of life is being propped up by a country that is hostile to it. It is a recipe for disaster. This is the lesson we have to learn from the coronavirus crisis. Our reliance on other countries for our own economic survival has gone way too far. That ideology that sees free trade as being more important than protecting people's wellbeing and livelihoods 
That too has gone way too far. Australia has to become self-sufficient again. We have to start making things again, because our complacency is putting our country at risk. But here's the good news. What we make, we can control. What we make, we know we can rely on. And I have a plan to get us there. There are five things that need to happen before Australia can start making things again. Number one, Australia's governments need to get active in supporting industries that are important for our economic health. We need industry policy that puts money into businesses that can increase competition, support local communities and boost new industries. The federal government should remember that supporting Australian industry means helping local communities to thrive. What we get from that isn't just about jobs. It's about giving people a self of self-worth. It gives them something to work, work towards. It gets them out of bed in the mornings. Now, the government can't subsidise industry forever, and I'm not saying that we have to be throwing endless amounts of cash at companies that can never turn a profit. What I'm talking about is making finance available to companies that are doing groundbreaking, important and significant work and providing that support on a competitive basis. This is the government's job. The fact is there are some things that are just too important to leave up to the whims of the market. Number two, the government should be buying Australian made. Every Australian that attends for a government contract should be given preferential consideration relative to its foreign alternatives. If that means the government has to pay a little bit more, well, I'm comfortable, and I'm sure millions of other Australians are comfortable with that as well. Paying that 10 per cent more to keep jobs and investment in Australia, it results in all sorts of benefits to companies that support our communities. That little bit extra is a smart investment, it certainly is in my books. It isn't rocket science. Government spending comes from Australian taxpayers. That money is coming from the people who live here and work here. So why would we send it overseas? If we put that money back into the Australian economy, we'll be supporting more jobs here. We'll be, support, we'll be supporting more businesses to stay open, hire more staff and grow bigger. It's good for business and it's good for workers. It's a win-win for everyone. Number three, we have to restructure our education system. Universities have been propped up by government policies that encourage foreign students to come to Australia to study courses they have no particular interest in because they know that it is a pathway to permanent residency and eventually citizenship. It is the great unspoken truth of our current university business model, and that is the truth. There were nearly 92,000 temporary graduate visa holders in Australia as of June 2019. That's a 30 per cent increase since July 2018. There's nothing wrong with international students coming here. The concern is that this river of gold has left universities too keen to look to the other way and support the interests of their customers instead of the interests of their own customers in their own country. And while universities become more and more dependent on Chinese money, they're inviting the influence of the CCP's surveillance state into domestic campuses. Australian universities are actively co collaborating with Chinese firms that have been implicated in a wide range of human rights abuses in China. Our universities are actively co co collaborating with firms that are designing surveillance and monitoring systems. Chinese students who protest the actions of the CCP on Australian university campuses have received threatening phone calls to the families warning them to not engage in anti-China rhetoric while the universities were raking in all this money. For years now, we've had a systematic underinvestment in our TAFE system for years. TAFE is where people go to get skills they need to make and build things that we need to keep this, running, this country running. They're the backbone of many regional communities. But the buildings are crumbling and their equipment is so old it's from the Cold War era. Somewhere along the way, we've gotten our priorities mixed up. And tastes of the cannery in the gold mine showing that something just isn't right. Backing them is going to be essential if we want to get it on the right track. Put them on equal footing. Required skilled apprentices on government projects. We're losing our trades in the name of free trade. And there's nothing free about that, especially for our kids. 
Number four, we've got, to renegotiate, we've got to renegotiate the crappy deals that both major parties have signed us into in the mistaken belief that all trade is good trade, which is absolute rubbish. For decades, successive governments have given away our national sovereignty on the promise that free trade will improve our lives. I don't think so. We have been told that trade should be our priority and everything else should come second. We have been signed up to trade agreements that allow foreign companies to sue the Australian government if they pass a law that undercuts company profits. That's what the major parties have done, all in the name of free trade. You and the Liberal Party, you and the Nats and you and the Labor Party, you've all done it. You've all been signing it up for years. You've sold us off, which is even worse, a bargain price, and you didn't even get us a decent deal. Instead, you allowed those agreements to supersede the laws that we set here in Parliament. Laws that protect Australia's national interests can be undermined by foreign multinationals who only care about protecting their bottom line. That should never be allowed to happen, and those agreements should have been rolled back. I get that it's hard, but it needs to be done, and that's the sad truth of it. Number five, we have to tighten the rules of foreign investment. A foreign investment review board acts like a rubber stamp. Everything gets approved, nothing gets knocked back. Take the case of Bellamy's Organic in my home state. They sell milk formula. National food security, I call it. They had been ham hamstrung for years because they couldn't get approval to sell their product in Chinese stores. They put in an application for this approval to the Chinese government in 2017. They never got it. Instead, our government let the company, an Australian icon, get sold off to a large Chinese business for $1.5 billion. Why can't we get domestic investment for this stuff? It is our food security. Why isn't the government stepping in to support these firms? Because once we sell off the farm gate, we can't get it back. It's gone forever, and there's nothing worse than knowing we've lost another. These are the steps the government should be take. But here's the thing. This is not just up to the government. This sort of change just doesn't come from the top. It's up to all of us to get Australian industries booming again. The reality is that the public needs to understand that. We can't go back to business as usual. Those days are over. I know a lot of people out there are doing it tough at the moment, and I get that. I know that. But if you have the capacity, if you can, then please support your neighbours and buy Australian Made. We'll all need to pull together and do everything we can to get through this crisis. Because when we stand together as a community, we can rebuild our country and get to the other side of this. We have to take back the will. Take back our economic sovereignty. Australia needs to start making things right again. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tonight, amidst the uncertainty of the COVID-19 crisis, I rise to speak about a different health condition, multiple sclerosis, or more commonly referred to as MS. Senator Deborah O'Neill and I are the co-chairs of the Parliamentary Friends of MS Group, and together we hosted the launch of this group for the 46th Parliament in February this year. When I became a senator just over a year ago, I replaced Senator David Bushby, and prior to his resignation, Senator Bushby had co-chaired the Parliamentary Friends Group with Senator O'Neill for several years. As you know, Madam Acting Deputy President, David is also my brother, and together we've had a shared interest in MS since 1979. This was when our eldest brother, Peter, was diagnosed with MS, a neurological disorder that interferes with the transmission of nerve impulses throughout the brain spinal cord and optic nerves. Peter was a young, recently married man when he received the diagnosis. Many things certainly changed as a result, but he's still living life to the full and enjoying his three beautiful grandchildren, Jack, Oliver and Lucy. Peter retired only recently after a 45-year career in real estate in Launceston. Tasmania has the highest rate of multiple sclerosis prevalence in Australia, at around double the rate of Queensland. The further away from the equator people live, the higher the prevalence of MS. And as the southernmost state, Tasmania certainly fits that bill. This is a concern for my state's health service, but this disorder has far-reaching impacts, affecting thousands throughout our country. There are more than 25,600 Australians living with MS. More than 10 people are diagnosed with this disorder each week, with most people finding out they have MS between the ages of 20 and 40. MS Research Australia's health economic impact of multiple sclerosis in Australia in 2017 study found this disorder costs $1.75 billion annually in Australia. Worldwide, 2.5 million people are living with MS, and three out of every four of those are women. 
One of the first places I visited last year as a new senator was the Menzies Institute for Medical Research in Hobart, a facility that has been at the forefront of research into MS for the past 20 years. Menzies scientists, in collaboration with other researchers around the world, were responsible for one of the biggest breakthroughs in MS research in recent years, the link between UV exposure and vitamin D and a reduced risk of MS. Taking on the co-chair position of the Parliamentary Friends of Multiple Sclerosis has given me the opportunity to learn even more about MS. At the Parliamentary Friends launch, I was very pleased to be able to share with attendees that the Morrison government was continuing its support into MS research. Last year, our government gave a $30 million grant to the MS Medical Research Future Fund and $10 million to Menzies Research for the MS flagship program. Since 2010, the National Health and Medical Research Council has provided $67 million towards MS research grants. This is something we will continue to work with MS representatives on, and I look forward to research providing a cure for this disorder in years to come. And in addition to government support, MS, MS Australia recently announced a $1 million funding boost from four state and territory MS organisations, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and the ACT, to support MS research in Australia. This funding will be used to investigate myelin repair and neuroprotective research that will pave the way to end MS forever. The launch at Parliament House was also a fantastic opportunity for Senator O'Neill and I to acknowledge the work done by the staff and volunteers of MS Australia through their CEO, Deirdre McKechnie, and to meet a number of people living with MS. One of those with lived experience was Brioni Hinu, who spoke eloquently about her MS diagnosis and her hopes for a cure. Now in her mid-30s, Brioni was diagnosed with a form of relapsing remitting MS at the age of 30. While Brioni said her age of diagnosis, no, diagnosis was right on cue for the disorder, her first symptoms actually occurred when she was 19. She told us about sitting in a lecture theatre for her university course. Every time she glanced over to the right, her eyes would uncontrollably jerk back to the left and she couldn't work out why. Symptoms continued in the form of intolerable nausea and head spins that were so bad she could not stay on a bus for longer than 10 minutes at a time and she frequently misbalanced while walking in familiar surroundings at homes, walking into door frames instead of through the door. By the time Brioni saw a neurologist to discuss the results of her MRI, her symptoms had resolved but the doctor still told her. If it happens again, it's probably MS. Until then, live your life. That was 2005 and the treatment for relapsing remitting MS required self-injections, something Brioni did not really want to do. Just over a decade later though, in 2016, Brioni received confirmation she had the condition. But more evidence had been found by that stage with another four treatment options available for the form of MS she had. Brioni told the launch guests that the single reason these massive improvements happened in just 10 years was research. Research that's been done by scientists and doctors and clinicians, which could only be achieved by the commitment of the staff and resources dedicated to this cause. It is this research that the Morrison government is supporting. Living with MS is a lesson in living with uncertainty. There is no one symptom that indicates someone has MS and no single test that can establish an accurate diagnosis. Common symptoms include changes in memory, concentration or reasoning, slurred or slow speech, extreme fatigue, tingling, numbness or pins and needles, muscle weakness, tremors, stiffness or spasms, difficulty with walking, balance and coordination, blurred or double vision, dizziness or vertigo, emotional and mood change, and sensitivity to heat and or cold. This list includes both visible and invisible symptoms and those with MS can experience a handful or many at different times in their lives. Many with the disorder have no idea when their symptoms will resolve or if they will resolve at all. They don't know if they will get more symptoms or when or if their disorder will progress. But they, and we, are hopeful there will one day be a cure. Already our researchers are investigating treatments that can reverse the damage caused by brain lesions, New research makes the hope of a cure more possible all the time, with new treatments and management plans making it easier to live with MS in the meantime. Brioni told us that someone once described MS to her as a spectacular collision between two of the most complex and mysterious systems of the body, the central nervous system and the immune system. Trying to solve the cause of such a collision is an incredibly daunting prospect, 
but the return on investment is a good one. And as Brioni points out, if we can solve some of the mysteries around something that affects these two systems, what other discoveries might you make along the way in other neurological conditions? To raise money and awareness of this disorder, MS Research Australia is again running their Kiss Goodbye to MS campaign throughout May. Participants will run or walk 50 kilometres this month to help raise funds for Australian research targeting prevention, treatment and or cure for MS. It doesn't matter where a participant lives or their fitness level because they decide how they complete their 50 kilometres. The MS Research Australia Facebook page shows two participants who ran their whole 50 kilometres in one go. Others, I am sure, will spread it out and do just a few kilometres a day. The 2019 Kiss Goodbye to MS campaign raised $2.5 million, so let's see what we can achieve this year. In closing, I'd like to go back to Brioni again. Before her world changed with her MS diagnosis, Brioni was a Bachelor of Science student. To celebrate the start of her degree, her sister brought her a book by Dr Carl, asking him to sign it for her sister. On the front page of the book, Dr Carl wrote a special message for the young science student. He told Brioni, the Nobel Prize isn't awarded for the answer, it's awarded for the question, so ask the right questions. While we might not yet have an answer for multiple sclerosis, what we do have are a lot of questions and many, many people who are willing to ask and hopefully answer those questions. Already we've answered questions about the environmental factors that impact MS. We know about the link between vitamin D and a reduced risk of MS. We know that the brain and spinal cord can repair itself. And we now know about rhymelination, where nerve fibres are recoded with myelin and how this could reverse some of the effects of MS. These are just some of the questions our researchers have investigated when studying prevention and treatment of MS. How many questions are we away from a cure? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to remember and pay tribute to my friend, colleague and quintessential Green, doc Dr Deb Foskey. Deb passed away on the 1st of May, age 70. She leaves two daughters, Samara and Eleni, and a mountain of achievements and inspiration. In the words of her friend, Shelley Nundra, Deb was a writer, poet, philosopher, politician, mother, agitator for change and thinker. Her life was lived to the full, selflessly, generously, inspirationally. Deb grew up in Bacchus Marsh and attended Melbourne University, studying English and philosophy and doing a dip ed. In 1972, though, Deb headed Bush. She was 22 when she, husband Bob and baby daughter Samara, settled in Cabinandra in the mountain forests of far East Gippsland and built an A-frame cottage on the Jingalala River. Son Brandon was born the next year. Deb said, we wanted a house that was built out of materials from the earth. We didn't want electricity in those days. We were forerunners of the alternative lifestyle people, trying to build self-sufficiency and community in a cold, challenging place. We came here because we could afford the land, and the property at Cabinandra had a river, a small area of cleared land and bush. I really don't think we thought through the impacts of the isolation, distance from shops, post-primary education and jobs. Partly to counter the social isolation, I was very keen on building a self-sufficient community at Cabinandra and we set up the Warm Corners Cooperative, which still thrives today. Deb Foskey was one of the pioneers of the campaign to protect the magnificent forests of East Gippsland that continues today almost 50 years on. She was a founder of the Concerned Residents of East Gippsland, which also continues on today as Environment East Gippsland, the longest running forest conservation organisation in the country. I first met Deb in the early 80s, after she'd been living at Cabinandra for a decade. She was part of the small group of amazingly brave locals that we Melbourne-based forest campaigners worked alongside in our quest for protection of some of the best forests in the country, and indeed the world. In the mid-80s, when it came time for Sam and Brandon to attend high school, Deb made the decision to shift to Canberra. Tragically, in 1986, Brandon drowned at Casuarina Sands, a popular swimming spot on the Murrumbidgee River. How do you cope with the loss of a child like this? 
Deb lived with an aching hole for the rest of her life, but she journeyed on with her grief and with extraordinary strength. In Canberra, Deb taught and undertook study, undertaking a master's in human ecology and then a PhD that looked at the role of community movements in the framing of the program of action for the United Nations Conference on Population and Development. And she brought up her young daughter, Eleni, who was born in 1989. Deb also worked with the International Women's Development Agency during this time, and Sue Finucane, a former IWDA program manager, recalls Deb representing IWDA in their Canberra chapter. It really was a thrilling time to be involved in global women's activism, and Deb really lived the values of think globally and act locally, ahead of her time in many respects, making and living the links between gender, women's rights, or lack thereof, and climate care. Deb was, Deb was active in the formation of the Greens in the ACT, and she stood for the Senate in 1998 and the AC Legislative Assembly in 2001. And then she was elected to the Assembly in 2004 as the only Green in the Parliament at that time. Now, her four years in the ACT Assembly featured a huge amount of work on sustainability, on climate and on social issues. And one of her lasting legacies was to ensure that the residents of the Narrabunda Longstay Caravan Park were not evicted when the private owner sold the land. And that caravan park still provides affordable homes to more than 100 people today. It was in 2008 that I travelled with Deb and her daughter Eleni to the Global Greens Congress in Brazil and to undertake a study tour looking at participatory budgeting, where local communities are actively involved in setting priorities about where they want their taxes to be spent. And this trip, combining the global and the local, was quintessentially Deb, covering the breadth of her interests and perspectives. Deb moved back to Cabinandra after she finished up in the Assembly in 2008. And after having been a high flyer as an elected representative, she threw herself back into her local community and her local but globally significant environment. She recalled a few years ago that she was more self-sufficient than she ever had been in the 70s and 80s. She worked with the Centre for Rural Communities. She was the coordinator of the Tubbett Neighbourhood House and was highly respected within the statewide neighbourhood houses community. She worked with the local community to help develop an ecotourism strategy for East Gippsland and was chairperson of the Orbost Exhibition Centre. And she continued her tireless campaigning for forest protection. In her house and she survived the huge fires of 2014, burning to within metres of the house. And in recent years, Deb connected community activism and electoral politics together as only someone with Deb's life experience can do. Deb Foskey was living personification of the four pillars of the Greens, ecological sustainability, social justice, peace and nonviolence, and grassroots democracy. Deb stood for council in 2016, she stood at the state election in 2018, and then threw her hat in the ring for the federal seat of Gippsland last year, campaigning powerfully on our interconnected crises, climate, nature, inequality and democracy, and on the local solutions to these national and global problems. Deb was determined to use the election as a platform to amplify our Greens' messages and to build the Greens in rural and regional communities. Plus, I am so grateful personally. She knew that her work in Gippsland would help re-elect me to the Senate. And I have such treasured memories of campaigning with Deb just over a year ago. We ran a green stall at the Yarram Show. We caught up with forest campaigners in Merbu North and recorded video clips about the climate emergency and the importance of investment in renewable energy to rural and regional communities. Sadly, that election campaigning was the last time I saw Deb. Shortly after the election, she became unwell, was admitted to hospital and diagnosed with lung cancer. She moved to Orbost to live with Eleni and to be closer to treatment. And then more tragedy struck. Her beloved house at Cabinandra burnt to the ground in July last year, destroying almost everything she owned. But Deb survived this blow too. She talked of rebuilding. She remained passionate about living at Cabinandra, even after last summer's bushfire inferno in East Gippsland's forests. She, she survived the fires too, by the way, in Orbost, with blanketing smoke and flames 
coming close to the town over multiple days. In the months before she died, Deb had been quite well. She'd had a holiday in Tasmania and had even found herself a small cottage to retreat to at Cabinandra. And to the end, Deb continued her activism, reflecting and sharing her thoughts on the COVID-19 pandemic, about social inequality, about the need for art and support for science. Her Facebook posts kept us all up to date. She was open and honest, confronting her mortality head on. She knew she had limited time left. She asked the day before she died, what is a life? I'll leave you with Eleni's words on Facebook the day she died. This morning, our wonderful powerhouse mother, Deb Foskey, abruptly left her body and us behind for another place. Samara and I are left reeling, but a comforter to know that she had a nurse with her and that she was conscious, aware and very ready. After being helped back into bed, she calmly told the nurse, I'm just about ready now, before taking her final breath. We are so proud and grateful to have been your lucky daughters and know that you had to say goodbye to us to be with your beloved son, Bran, who you have been separated from these 34 years. We know the two of you are having a beautiful reunion and that he will look after you. We love and remember you always and forever. Thanks, Deb, for your contribution to this world, for your powerful and feisty presence. You leave a legacy of love and care and respect and deep relationships with people and the earth. The world is a better place because of you. What does a life mean? You couldn't ask for any more than that. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to discuss my Collins class submarine motion in the chamber today, a motion calling on the government to retain all Collins full cycle docking uh, activities in South Australia. The Collins class submarines are a vital capability for Australia, but they've had a chequered history. In 2010, the Royal Australian Navy was not sufficiently confident to deploy a submarine to Hawaii for a multinational exercise one with which it had never missed before. In June 2011, we had a situation where we could not put even one of our six Collins-class submarines to sea. It was then that the then uh, def uh, Defence Minister, uh, Stephen Smith, announced a review into the availability of the Collins-class submarines. The review, colloquially known as the Coles Review, was led by Mr John Coles and delivered a series of reports to government from November 2011 through to 2016. It took more than half a decade and a significant amount of taxpayers' money to get submarine sustainment to world's benchmark where it sits today. By doing submarine intermediate work and mid-cycle dockings in Western Australia and submarine full-cycle dockings in South Australia. Despite this success, despite the fact that, on, uh, that an ASC worker on average has 11 and a half years uh, of experience in Collins-class submarines, despite the fact that only 10 per cent, perhaps less, of the workforce in Adelaide has uh, expressed an interest in moving to WA, the government is considering moving full cycle dockings to Western Australia. If this shift is announced, ASC at Osborne will immediately see experienced staff leave for higher security employment around the state, which will have uh, an almost immediate effect on our submarine availability. If this goes ahead, only a small percentage of the workforce will move, resulting in about six and a half thousand years of, uh, of corporate knowledge uh, being taken from the uh, Collins submarine enterprise. No other entity in their right mind would give up that sort of corporate experience in a core capability. Submarine availability will suffer and, as a result, it will damage national security. 
All Collins class submarine sustainment activities will be situated in one location, creating a strategic vulnerability. All of our Collins submarine eggs will be in a WA basket. The loss of expertise will affect the planned life of type extension of Collins, which is the only real risk mitigation strategy Defence has for the almost certain further project delays with the future submarine project. So let's get back to today's motion. The motion was introduced into the Senate on, on uh, Tuesday, the 25th of February, precisely 11 weeks ago. During the 11 weeks since the motion was introduced, the government, uh, coalition government, made no attempt to engage on this issue. Nothing was said by the Minister for Defence, Senator Linda Reynolds, or the Minister for Defence Industry, Melissa Price, or Minister for Finance, Matthias Cormann, all representing Western Australia. All the while, government was, uh, has been keeping ASC workers at Osborne waiting on a decision that was foreshadowed many months ago and promised before Christmas. Western Australian political interests have been uh, pushing hard to poach the Collins class sustainment work from South Australia. The West Australian Labor government has been lobbying furiously. Federal Labor has been divided over this. It's clear that Western Australian interests, however, have the upper hand. Labor defence spokesperson uh, Mr Richard Miles uh, says it's a decision for government. SA Federal Labor representatives have been silent. Senator Penny Wong, leader of the opposition in the Senate, normally very articulate, has nothing to say about the prospective loss of hundreds of highly skilled shipyard workers from our state. The, the government clearly knew which way the wind was blowing in the Labor camp. They secretly went uh, to the opposition and secured Labor's agreement to amendments to the motion that would gut the text, most importantly removing the calls on the federal government to retain all Collins class submarine full cycle dockings in South Australia. The secrecy was broken when, the, uh, when West Australian Coalition Senator and Minister Matthias Cormann with the introduction of a last minute, no, last second amendment to remove the call for support for the retention of Collins class submarines in South Australia. South Australian Liberal senators had nothing to say. They clearly have no influence. Liberal senators in the parliament today who remain silent, who betrayed South Australia today, were Minister Simon Birmingham, Minister Anne Rustin, Senator David Fawcett, Senator, Senator Alex Antic. But let everyone understand things clearly, it wasn't just the coalition. The government was able to amend the motion and remove the call for the Collins class sustainment to remain in South Australia because they had Labor support, including that of uh, SA Labor senators. La SA Labor senators missing in action today who sat silently while the shift of 700 workers to WA was being floated included Senator Penny Wong, Senator Don Farrell, Senator Mario Smith, who incidentally voted against South Australia in the last similar motion, Senator Alex Gallagher. And to the Greens, Senator Hansard Young did not stand up for, for SA. Now I understand noting her politics if she was voting against defence spending, but she wasn't. She just voted against defence spending money, be, well, defence money being spent in South Australia. It seems it's okay for her to have defence money spent in WA. Only two South Australian senators voted for SA today, and that was Senator Griff and myself. The rest put their party ahead of their constituents. They put their personal interests before their constituents' interests. Shame. Nine SA senators either voted against the retention of the Collins class submarines in South Australia, notably uh, Senator uh, Anne Rustin, who sat behind Senator Cormann uh, as a silent ass assassin of SA interests, else uh, others abs absented themselves uh, from the Senate chamber, effectively voting in favour by default—Labor, Liberals and Greens. 
Moving Collins class full cycle dockings from Adelaide to Perth will cost well over a billion dollars. That billion dollars will lead to no improvements in submarine capability. On the contrary, it will result in a huge loss of corporate knowledge from Australia's premier submarine sustainment organisation. It will inject significant changes and risks into submarine sustainment at a time when the life of the Collins class will have to be significantly ex extended owing to the mismanagement and delays in the procurement of the new attack class submarines. Shifting full cycle dockings to WA will indeed increase cost, reduce submarine availability and damage national security. How could there be, this be justified uh, in normal circumstances beats me? How such expense could be justified a billion dollars worth of taxpayers' money in the budgetary circumstances we face post-COVID-19 uh, it's truly gobsmacking. Prior to COVID, uh, this uh, did not make fiscal sense. After COVID, it's crazy. I have always supported sensible decisions and sensible legislation put forward by the government. But if this shift goes ahead, I'll have to recalibrate my assessment of the government's ability to be sensible. And that means I'll have to look much closer at their actions, their motives and their legislation. Now is not the time to take the wrong decision on a key defence capability and very significant part of the industrial capability of my home state, that of South Australia. Thank you, Mr President. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 am.